Destiny of Souls, New Case Studies of Life Between Lives by Michael Newton, Ph.D. Narrated by Peter Burkrot. Copyright 2000 by Michael Newton, Ph.D. This unabridged audiobook was published by arrangement with Llewellyn Worldwide Limited and was produced in the year 2011 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Introduction Who are we? Why are we here? Where are we going? I endeavored to answer these age-old questions with my first book, Journey of Souls, published in 1994 by Llewellyn. Many people told me the book provided a spiritual awakening of their inner selves because they had never before been able to read in such detail about what life is like in the spirit world. They also said the information validated deep-seated feelings about their soul living on after physical death and the purpose of returning to Earth. Once the book was in print and later translated into other languages, I received inquiries from readers around the world asking me if there was going to be a second book. For a long while, I resisted these suggestions. All my years of original research had been difficult to collect, organize, and finally write as a comprehensive study of our immortal life. I felt I had done enough. In the introduction to Journey of Souls, I explained my background as a traditional hypnotherapist and how skeptical I had been about the use of hypnosis for metaphysical regression. In 1947, at age 15, I placed my first subject in hypnosis, so I was definitely old school and not a new ager. Thus, when I unintentionally opened the gateway to the spirit world with a client, I was stunned. It seemed to me that most past-life regressionists thought our life between lives was just a hazy limbo that only served as a bridge from one past life to the next. It was soon evident I had to find out for myself the steps necessary to reach and unlock a subject's memory of their existence in this mysterious place. After more years of quiet research, I was finally able to construct a working model of spirit world structure and realized how therapeutic this process could be for a client. I also found that it did not matter if a person was an atheist, deeply religious, or believed in any philosophical persuasion in between. Once they were in the proper, superconscious state of hypnosis, all were consistent in their reports. It was for this reason that I became what I have come to call a spiritual regressionist. This is a hypnotherapist specializing in life after death. I wrote Journey of Souls to give the public a foundation of information presented in a tight, orderly progression of events of what it is like to die and cross over, who meets us, where we go, and what we do as souls in the spirit world before choosing our next body for reincarnation. This format was designed as a travelogue through time, using actual case histories from clients who told me of their past experiences between former lives. Thus, Journey of Souls was not another past-life book about reincarnation, but rather broke new ground in metaphysical research, which had been virtually unexplored by the use of hypnosis. During the decade of the 1980s, while I was formulating a working model of the world between lives, I closed my practice to all other types of hypnotherapy. I became obsessed with unraveling the secrets of the spirit world as I built up a high volume of cases. This made me more comfortable with the validity and reliability of my earlier findings. While these years of specialized research into the spirit world rolled on, I worked practically in seclusion with only my clients knowing about this work and only as it pertained to them and their friends. I even stayed out of metaphysical bookstores because I wanted absolute freedom from outside bias. Today, I still believe my self-imposed isolation and not speaking out publicly was the right decision. When I left Los Angeles to retire in the Sierra Nevada mountains and write Journey of Souls, I expected to slip into quiet anonymity. This proved to be a delusion. Most of the material presented in the book had never been published before, 
and I began receiving a great deal of mail through my publisher. I owe Llewellyn a debt of gratitude for having the insight and courage to introduce my research to the public. Soon after publication, I was sent out on road trips to give lectures and engage in radio and TV interviews. People wanted more details of the spirit world and continued to ask if I had additional research material. I had to answer yes. Actually, I still had a wide variety of unreported information that I assumed would be too much for the public to accept from an unknown author. Despite the fact people found Journey of Souls very inspirational, I resisted the idea of writing a sequel. I decided on a compromise. With the printing of the fifth edition, an index was added to Journey of Souls, along with a new cover and some added paragraphs to meet requests for greater clarification about specific issues. This was not enough. The volume of mail I was receiving each week continued to increase dramatically with queries about life after death. People now began to seek me out, and I decided to practice again on a limited basis. I noticed a higher percentage of more developed souls. Clients must wait a long time to see me due to my semi-retirement and greatly reduced client load. As a result, I have fewer young souls in psychological crises and more cases with clients who are able to be patient. These people wish to unlock the meaning behind certain issues by tapping into their spiritual memories in order to fine-tune specific goals in life. Many are healers and teachers themselves who feel comfortable entrusting me with added information about their soul life between lives. In turn, I hope I have helped them on their paths. During all this time, the public perception remained that I had not let go of all my secrets. Eventually, my mind began to turn on how I should approach a second book. The effect of all I have described has brought about the birth of Destiny of Souls. I consider my first book to have been a pilgrimage through the spirit world on a great river of eternity. The voyage began at the mouth of the river with the moment of physical death and ended at the place where we return into a new body. I had gone upriver toward the source as far as I was able in Journey of Souls. This has not changed. Although the memory of making this trip countless times is in the mind of every person, no one who is still incarnating seems to have the capacity to take me further. Destiny of Souls is intended to convey travelers on a second expedition along the river with side trips up major tributaries for more detailed exploration. During our travels together on this second trip, I want to uncover more of the hidden aspects of the route to give people a greater perspective of the whole. I have designed this book by topical categories rather than by progressive time and location. Thus, I have overlapped the time frames of normal soul movement between spiritual locations to fully analyze these experiences. I have also tried to offer listeners a look at the same elements of soul life from different case perspectives. Destiny of Souls is intended to expand our understanding of the incredible sense of order and planning which exists for the benefit of human beings. At the same time, it is my intention that this second tour into the wonders of the spirit world be fresh and enjoyable for the unseasoned traveler as well. For first-time listeners of my work, the opening chapter will give a condensed overview of what I have discovered about our life between lives. I hope this summary will add to your understanding of what follows, and perhaps encourage you to eventually listen to my foundational book. So, as we begin this second journey together, I want to thank all of you who have given me so much support for the hard work necessary to unlock the spiritual doorways of the mind. These associations, combined with the indulgence of many guides, particularly my own, have given me the energy to continue the task. I feel truly blessed to have been chosen as one of the messengers for this significant work. 1. The Spirit World At the moment of death, our soul rises out of its host body. If the soul is older and has experience from many former lives, it knows immediately it has been set free and is going home. These advanced souls need no one to greet them. 
However, most souls I work with are met by guides just outside Earth's astral plane. A young soul or a child who has died may be a little disoriented until someone comes closer to ground level for them. There are souls who choose to remain at the scene of their death for a while. Most wish to leave at once. Time has no meaning in the spirit world. Discarnates who choose to comfort someone who is grieving or have other reasons to stay near the place of their death for a while experience no sense of time loss. This becomes now time for the soul as opposed to linear time. As they move further away from Earth, souls experience an increasingly brilliant light around them. Some will briefly see a grayish darkness and will sense passing through a tunnel or portal. The differences between these two phenomena depend upon the exit speed of the soul, which in turn relates to their experience. The pulling sensation from our guides may be gentle or forceful, depending upon the soul's maturity and capacity for rapid change. In the early stages of their exit, all souls encounter a wispy cloudiness around them that soon becomes clear, enabling them to look off into a vast distance. This is the moment when the average soul sees a ghostly form of energy coming toward them. This figure may be a loving soulmate or two, but more often than not, it is our guide. In circumstances where we are met by a spouse or friend who has passed on before us, our guide is also close by, so they can take over the transition process. In all my years of research, I have never had a single subject who was met by a major religious figure, such as Jesus or Buddha. Still, the loving essence of the great teachers from Earth is within the personal guides who are assigned to us. By the time souls become reoriented to the place they call home, their earthliness has changed. They are no longer quite human in the way we think of a human being, with a particular emotional, temperamental, and physical makeup. For instance, they don't grieve about their recent physical death in the way their loved ones will. It is our souls that make us human on earth, but without our bodies we are no longer homo sapiens. The soul has such majesty that it is beyond description. I tend to think of souls as intelligent light forms of energy. Right after death, souls suddenly feel different because they are no longer encumbered by a temporary host body with a brain and central nervous system. Some take longer to adjust than others. The energy of the soul is able to divide into identical parts, similar to a hologram. It may live parallel lives in other bodies, although this is much less common than we read about. However, because of the dual capability of all souls, part of our light energy always remains behind in the spirit world. Thus, it is possible to see your mother upon returning from a life, even though she may have died thirty earth years before and reincarnated again. Orientation periods with our guides, which take place before joining our cluster group, vary between souls and between different lives for the same soul. This is a quiet time for counseling, with the opportunity to vent any frustrations we have about the life just ended. Orientation is intended to be an initial debriefing session, with gentle probing by perceptive, caring teacher guides. The meeting may be long or short, depending upon the circumstances of what we did or did not accomplish with regard to our life contract. Special karmic issues are also reviewed, although they will be discussed later in minute detail within our soul cluster group. The returning energy of some souls will not be sent back into their soul group right away. These are the souls who were contaminated by their physical bodies and became involved with evil acts. There is a difference between wrongdoing with no premeditated desire to hurt someone and intentional evil. The degrees of harm to others from mischief to malevolence are carefully evaluated. Those souls who have been associated with evil are taken to special centers, which some clients call intensive care units. Here, I am told, their energy is remodeled to make it whole again. Depending upon the nature of their transgressions, these souls could be rather quickly returned to earth. They might well choose to serve as the victims of others' evil acts in the next life. Still, if their actions were prolonged and especially cruel over a number of lives, this would denote a pattern of wrongful behavior. 
Such souls could spend a long while in solitary spiritual existence, possibly over a thousand earth years. A guiding principle in the spirit world is that wrongdoing, intentional or unintentional, on the part of all souls, will need to be redressed in some form in a future life. This is not considered punishment or even penance as much as an opportunity for karmic growth. There is no hell for souls, except perhaps on earth. Some lives are so difficult that the soul arrives home very tired, despite the energy rejuvenation process initiated by our guides who combine their energy with ours at the gateway we may still have a depleted energy flow. In these cases, more rest and solitude may be called for rather than celebrations. Indeed, many souls who desire rest receive it before reunification with their groups. Our soul groups may be boisterous or subdued, but they are respectful of what we have gone through during an incarnation. All groups welcome back their friends in their own way, with deep love and camaraderie. Homecoming is a joyous interlude, especially following a physical life where there might not have been much karmic contact with our intimate soulmates. Most of my subjects tell me they are welcomed back with hugs, laughter, and much humor, which I find to be a hallmark of life in the spirit world. The really effusive groups, who have planned elaborate celebrations for the returning soul, may suspend all their other activities. One subject of mine had this to say about his homecoming welcome. After my last life, my group organized one hell of a party with music, wine, dancing, and singing. They arranged everything to look like a classical Roman festival with marble halls, togas, and all the exotic furnishings prevalent in our many lives together in the ancient world. Melissa, a primary soulmate, was waiting for me right up front recreating the age that I remember her best and looking as radiant as ever. Soul groups range between three and twenty-five members, with the average having about fifteen. There are times when souls from nearby cluster groups may want to connect with each other. Often, this activity involves older souls who have made many friends from other groups with whom they have been associated over hundreds of past lives. Some ten million viewers in the U.S., saw the TV show Sightings, produced by Paramount in 1995, which aired a segment about my work. Those who watched this show about life after death may remember one of my clients, by the name of Colleen, who spoke about a session we had together. She described returning to the spirit world after a former life to find a spectacular 17th century full-dress ball in progress. My subject saw over a hundred people who came to celebrate her return. A time and place she had loved was lavishly reproduced so Colleen could begin the process of renewal in style. Thus, homecoming can take place in two types of settings. A few souls might briefly meet a returning soul at the gateway and then leave in favor of a guide who takes them through some preliminary orientation. More commonly, the welcoming committee waits until the soul actually returns to their spirit group. This group may be isolated in a classroom, gathered around the steps of a temple, sitting in a garden, or the returning soul could encounter many groups in a study hall atmosphere. Souls who pass by other clusters on the way to their own birth often remark that other souls with whom they have been associated in past lives will look up and acknowledge their return with a smile or wave. How a subject views their group cluster setting is based upon the soul's state of advancement, although memories of a schoolroom atmosphere are always very clear. In the spirit world, educational placement depends upon the level of soul development. Simply because a soul has been incarnating on earth since the Stone Age is no guarantee of high attainment. In my lectures, I often remark about a client who took 4,000 years of past lives finally to conquer jealousy. I can report he is not a jealous person today, yet he has made little progress with fighting his own intolerance. It takes some students longer to get through certain lessons, just as in earthly classrooms. On the other hand, all highly advanced souls are old souls in terms of both knowledge and experience. In Journey of Souls, I broadly classified souls as beginner, intermediate, and advanced, 
and gave case examples of each, while explaining there are fine nuances of development among these categories. Generally, the composition of a group of souls is made up of beings at about the same level of advancement, although they have their individual strengths and shortcomings. These attributes give the group balance. Souls assist one another with the cognitive aspects of absorbing information from life experiences, as well as reviewing the way they handled the feelings and emotions of their host bodies directly related to those experiences. Every aspect of a life is dissected, even to the extent of reverse role-playing in the group, to bring greater awareness. By the time souls reach the intermediate levels, they begin to specialize in those major areas of interest where certain skills have been demonstrated. I will discuss these in more depth as we get further along in other chapters. One very meaningful aspect of my research has been the discovery of energy colors displayed by souls in the spirit world. These colors relate to a soul's state of advancement. This information, gathered slowly over many years, has been one indicator of progress during client assessments and also serves to identify other souls my subjects see around them while in a trance state. I found that typically... Pure white denotes a younger soul, and with advancement, soul energy becomes more dense, moving into orange, yellow, green, and finally the blue ranges. In addition to these center core auras, there are subtle mixtures of halo colors within every group that relate to the character aspects of each soul. For want of a better system, I have classified soul development as moving from a level one beginner through various learning stages to that of a master at level six. These greatly advanced souls are seen as having a deep indigo color. I have no doubt even higher levels exist, but my knowledge of them is restricted because I only receive reports from people who are still incarnating. Frankly, I am not fond of the term level to identify soul placement because this label clouds the diversity of development attained by souls at any particular stage. Despite these misgivings, it is my subject who use level to describe where they are on the ladder of learning. They are also quite modest about accomplishments. Regardless of my assessment, no client is inclined to state they are an advanced soul. Once out of hypnosis, with a fully conscious, self-gratifying mind in control, they are less reticent. While in a superconscious state during deep hypnosis, my subjects tell me that in the spirit world, no soul is looked down upon as having less value than any other soul. We are all in a process of transformation to something greater than our current state of enlightenment. Each of us is considered uniquely qualified to make some contribution toward the whole, no matter how hard we are struggling with our lessons. If this were not true, we would not have been created in the first place. In my discussions of colors of advancement, levels of development, classrooms, teachers, and students, it would be easy to assume the ambience of the spirit world as one of hierarchy. This conclusion would be quite wrong, according to all my clients. If anything, the spirit world is hierarchical in mental awareness. We tend to think of organizational authority on earth as represented by power struggles, turf wars, and the controlling use of a rigid set of rules within structure. There certainly is structure in the spirit world, but it exists within a sublime matrix of compassion, harmony, ethics, and morality, far beyond what we practice on earth. In my experience, the spirit world also has a far-reaching centralized personnel department for soul assignments. Yet there is a value system here of overwhelming kindness, tolerance, patience, and absolute love. When reporting to me about such things, my subjects are humbled by the process. I have an old college friend in Tucson who is an iconoclast and has resisted authority all his life, which is an attitude I can empathize with myself. My friend suspects the souls of my clients have been brainwashed into believing they have control over their destiny. He believes authority of any kind, even spiritual authority, cannot exist without corruption and the abuse of privilege. My research reveals too much order upstairs, which is not to his liking. Nevertheless, 
All my subjects believe they have had a multitude of choices in their past, and that this will continue into the future. Advancement through the taking of personal responsibility does not involve dominance or status ranking, but rather a recognition of potential. They see integrity and personal freedom everywhere in their life between lives. In the spirit world, we are not forced to reincarnate or participate in group projects. If souls want solitude, they can have it. If they don't want to advance in their assignments, this too is honored. One subject told me, I have skated through many easy lives, and I like it that way, because I haven't really wanted to work hard. Now that's going to change. My guide says, we are ready when you are. In fact, there is so much free will that if we are not ready to leave Earth's astral plane after death, for a variety of personal reasons, our guides will allow us to stay around until such time as we are prepared to go home. I hope this book will show that we have many choices, both in and out of the spirit world. What is very evident to me about these choices is the intense desire of most souls to prove themselves worthy of the trust placed in them. We are expected to make mistakes in this process. The effort of moving toward a greater goodness and a conjunction with the source that created us is the prime motivator of souls. Souls have feelings of humility at having been given the opportunity to incarnate in physical form. I have been asked many times if my subjects see the source of creation during their sessions. In my introduction, I said I could only go so far upriver toward the source because of the limitations of working with people who are still incarnating. Advanced subjects talk about the time of conjunction, when they will join the most sacred ones. In this sphere of dense purple light, there is an all-knowing presence. What all this means, I cannot say. But I do know a presence is felt when we go before our council of elders. Once or twice between lives, we visit this group of higher beings who are a step or two above our teacher guides. In my first book, I gave a couple of case examples of these meetings. With this book, I will go into greater detail about our visitations with these masters, who are as close as I can come to the Creator. This is because it is here where an even higher source of divine knowledge is experienced by the soul. My clients call this energy force the Presence. The Council is not a tribunal of judges, nor a courtroom where souls appear to be tried and sentenced for wrongdoing, although I must admit that once in a while, Someone will tell me they feel going in front of the council is like being sent to the principal's office in school. Members of the council want to talk to us about our mistakes and what we can do to correct negative behavior in the next life. This is the place where considerations for the right body in our next life begin. As the time approaches for rebirth, we go to a space where a number of bodies are reviewed that might meet our goals. We have a chance to look into the future here, and actually test out different bodies before making a choice. Souls voluntarily select less than perfect bodies and difficult lives to address karmic debts or to work on different aspects of a lesson they have had trouble with in the past. Most souls accept the bodies offered to them in the selection room, but a soul can reject what is offered and even delay reincarnating. Then, too, a soul might ask to go to a physical planet other than Earth for a while. If we accept the new assignment, we are often sent to a preparation class to remind us of certain signposts and clues in the life to come, especially at those moments when primary soulmates come into our lives. Finally, when the time comes for our return, we say a temporary goodbye to our friends and are escorted to the place of embarkation for the trip to Earth. Souls join their assigned hosts in the womb of the baby's mother, sometime after the third month of pregnancy, so they will have a sufficiently evolved brain to work with before term. As part of the fetal state, they are still able to think as immortal souls while they get used to brain circuitry in the alter ego of their host. After birth, an amnesiac memory block sets in, and souls meld their immortal character with the temporary human mind to produce a combination of traits for a new personality. I use a systematic approach to reach the soul mind by employing a series of exercises for people in the early stages of hypnotic regression. 
This procedure is designed to gradually sharpen my subjects' memories of their past and prepare them to analyze critically the images they will see of life in the spirit world. After the usual intake interview, I place the client in hypnosis very quickly. It is the deepening that is my secret. Over long periods of experimentation, I have come to realize that having a client in the normal alpha state of hypnosis is not adequate enough to reach the superconscious state of the soul mind. For this, I must take the subject into the deeper theta ranges of hypnosis. In terms of methodology, I may spend up to an hour with long visualizations of forest or seashore images. Then I take the subject into their childhood years. I ask detailed questions about such things as the furniture in their house at age 12, their favorite article of clothing at age 10, the toy they loved most at age 7, and their earliest memories as a child between ages 3 and 2. We do all this before I take the client down into their mother's womb for more questions, and then into the most immediate past life for a short review. By the time the client has passed through the death scene of that life and reached the gateway to the spirit world, my bridge is complete. Continual hypnosis, deepening over the first hour, enhances the subject's disengagement from their earthly environment. They have also been conditioned to respond in detail to an intensive question-and-answer interview of their spiritual life. This will take us another two hours. Subjects who come out of trance after mentally returning home have a look of awe on their faces that is far more profound than if they had just experienced a straight past-life regression. For example, a client told me, The spirit has a diversity and complex fluid quality beyond my ability adequately to interpret. Many former clients write me about how viewing their immortality changed their lives. Here is a sample of one letter. I have gained an indescribable sense of joy and freedom from learning my true identity. The amazing thing is that this knowledge was in my mind all the time. Seeing my non-judgmental master teachers left me in a glowing state. The insight that came to me was that the only thing of true importance in this material life is the way we live and how we treat other people. The circumstances of our life mean nothing compared to our compassion and acceptance of others. I now have a knowing rather than a feeling about why I am here and where I am going after death. I present my findings involving the 67 cases and numerous quotes in this book as a reporter and a messenger. Before I begin every lecture to the public, I explain to my audiences that what I have to say are my truths about our spiritual life. There are many doorways to the truth. My truths come from accumulation of great wisdom from multitudes of people who have graced my life as clients over many years. If I make statements that go against your preconceptions, faith, or personal philosophy, please take what fits well for you and discard the rest. 2. Death Grief and Comfort Denial and Acceptance Surviving the loss of a love is one of life's hardest trials. It is well known that the process of grief survival involves going through the initial shock, then coping with denial, anger, depression, and finally arriving at some sort of acceptance. Each one of these stages of emotional turmoil varies in length of time and intensity, from months up to years. Losing someone with whom we had a deep bond can bring such despair that it feels as though we are in a bottomless pit where escape is impossible because death seems so final. In Western society, the belief in the finality of death is an obstacle to healing. We have a dynamic culture where the possibility of our loss of personhood is unthinkable. The dynamics of death in a loving family is akin to a successful stage play that is thrown into disarray due to the loss of one of its stars. The supporting cast flounders around over the need for script changes. Dealing with this huge hole in the story left by the departed affects the future roles of the remaining players. There is a dichotomy here, because when souls are in the spirit world preparing for a new life, 
They laugh about being in rehearsals for their next big stage play on Earth. They know all roles are temporary. In our culture, we do not prepare properly for death during life because it is something we cannot fix or change. The apprehension about death begins to gnaw at us as we get older. It is always there, lurking in the shadows, regardless of our beliefs about what happens after death. In discussing life after death on my lecture tours, I was surprised to find that many people who held very traditional religious views seemed to be the most fearful of death. The fear for most of us comes from the unknown. Unless we have had a near-death experience or undergone a past-life regression where we remember what death felt like in a former life, death is a mystery. When we must face death, either as a participant or as an observer, it can be painful, sad, and frightening. The healthy don't want to talk about it, and frequently neither do the seriously ill. Thus, our culture views death as an abhorrence. In the 20th century, there were many changes in public attitudes about life after death. During the early decades of the century, most people held traditional views that they had only one life to live. In the last third of the 20th century in the U.S., it was estimated that some 40% believed in reincarnation. This change in attitude has made acceptance of death a little easier for those people who have become more spiritual and are pulling away from a belief in oblivion after life. One of the most meaningful aspects of my work in the spirit world is learning from the perspective of the departed soul what it feels like to die and how souls try to reach back and comfort those left behind. In this chapter, I hope to validate that what you sense deep inside after a loss is not just wishful thinking. The person you love is not really gone. Consider, too, what I said in the last chapter about soul duality. Part of your energy was left behind in the spirit world at the time of incarnation. When your love arrives back home again, you will already be there waiting with that portion of your energy which was left behind. This same energy is held in reserve for unification with the returning soul. One of the significant revelations of my research was to learn that soulmates are never truly apart from each other. The sections that follow illustrate certain methods used by souls to communicate with those they love. These techniques may begin right after physical death and can be very intense. Nevertheless, the departing soul is anxious to get moving on their way home, as the density of earth does drain energy. In death, suddenly the soul is released and given freedom. Yet, if we have the need, souls are able to contact us on a regular basis from the spirit world. Quiet contemplation and meditation should bring a greater receptivity to the departed and provide your consciousness with a heightened sense of awareness. No verbal messages from the other side are necessary. Just removing the blocks of self-doubt and opening your mind to even the possible presence of someone you love will assist the process of grief recovery. Therapeutic Techniques of Souls My opening case is that of an advanced soul named Tamano, who is in training to be a student guide. He said to me, I have been incarnating and dying on earth for thousands of years, and only in the last few centuries am I really getting the hang of how to alter negative thought patterns and calm people. This case begins at the point in our session where Tamano is describing the moments following his sudden death after a former life. Case 1 Subject my wife is not feeling my presence. I'm just not getting through to her at all right now. Dr. N. What is the matter? Subject. Too much grief. It is so overpowering. Alice is in such a state of shock over my being killed that she is too numb to feel my energy. Dr. N. Tamano, has this been a recurring problem for you after your former lives, or is it just Alice? Subject. Right after death, the people who love you are either very agitated or completely numb. In either situation, their minds can shut down. My task is to attempt a balancing of mind and body. 
Dr. N. Where is your soul at this moment? Subject. On the ceiling of our bedroom. Dr. N. What do you want her to do? Subject. Stop crying and focus her thoughts. She doesn't believe I could still be alive, so all her energy patterns are in a terrible tangled mass. It's so frustrating. I'm right next to her and she doesn't know it. Dr. N. Are you going to give up for the moment and leave for the spirit world because her mind is closed down? Subject. That would be the easy way for me, but not for her. I care for her too much to give up now. I won't go until she at least senses that someone is in this room with her. That is my first step. Then I will be able to do more. Dr. N. How long has it been since your death? Subject. A couple of days. The funeral is over, and that is when I settle down to try and comfort Alice. Dr. N. I suppose your own guide is waiting to escort you home? Subject. Laughs. I have informed my guide Aeon that she would have to wait for me a while, which was unnecessary. She knows all about this. Aeon was the one who taught me. This case demonstrates a common complaint I hear from newly released souls. Many are not as proficient or determined as Tamano. Even so, most souls who are anxious to depart for the spirit world will not leave Earth's astral plane until they take some sort of action to comfort those in distress who care about them. I have condensed this client's narrative of how he assisted Alice in her grief recovery in order to focus on the soothing effects of soul energy patterns on disrupted human energy. Dr. N. Tamano, I would appreciate your taking me through the techniques you use to help your wife Alice with her grief. Subject. Well, I'll start by telling you Alice has not lost me. Takes a deep breath. I begin by throwing out a shower of my energy as an umbrella from Alice's waist to her head. Dr. N. If I were a spirit standing next to you, what would this look like? Subject. Smiles. A cloud of cotton candy. Dr. N. What does this do? Subject. It gives Alice a blanket of mental warmth, which is calming. I must tell you, I'm not fully proficient with this cloaking yet, but I have placed a protective cloud of energy over Alice the past three days since my death to make her more receptive. Dr. N. Oh, I see. You have already begun your work with Alice. Okay, Tamano. What do you do now? Subject. I begin to filter certain aspects of myself through the cloud of energy around her until I can feel the point where there is the least amount of blockage. Pause. I find it on the left side of her head behind her ear. Dr. N. Does this spot have some significance? Subject. Alice used to love to have me kiss her ears. Memories of caressing points are meaningful. When I see the opening on the left side of her head, I convert my energy to a solid beam and train it on that place. Dr. N. Does your wife feel this right away? Subject. Alice is aware of a gentle touch in the beginning, but the awareness is fragmented by grief. Then I increase the power of my beam, sending her thoughts of love. Dr. N. Do you see this working? Subject. Happily. Yes. I detect new energy patterns that are no longer dark coming from Alice. There are shifts in her emotions. Her crying stops. She is looking around, sensing me. She smiles. Now I've got her. Dr. N. Are you finished? Subject. She is going to be all right. It's time for me to go. I'll watch over her, but I know she is going to make it through this. And that's good, because I'm going to be busy myself for a while. Dr. N. Does this mean you won't contact Alice further? Subject. Offended. Certainly not. I will remain in contact whenever she needs me. She is my love. The average soul is much less skillful than even the most junior of student guides. I will discuss these elements further in Chapter 4, under the sections of Energy Rehabilitation. Still, most souls I work with perform rather well from the spirit world on a physical body. 
Typically, they choose to work in concentrated areas, using the beam effect described by Tamano. These loving energy projections can be very potent, even from the inexperienced soul, to people who have sustained emotional and physical trauma. Eastern practices of yoga and meditation include the use of chakra body points in ways that resemble how souls partition the human body with healing energy. People who practice the art of chakra healing say that since we have an etheric body that exists in conjunction with the physical, healing must take into account both these elements. Chakra work includes unblocking our emotional and spiritual energy through various points of the body, from the spine, heart, throat, forehead, and so on, to open and harmonize the body. Ways Spirits Connect with the Living Somatic Touch I have taken the clinical terms of somatic bridging and therapeutic touch and combined them to describe the method by which discarnate souls use directed energy beams to touch various parts of an incarnated body. Healing is not limited to the chakra body points I spoke about earlier. Souls who are reaching back to comfort the living look for areas that are most receptive to their energy. We saw this in case one, behind the left ear. The energy pattern becomes therapeutic when bridges are established to connect the two minds of the sender and receiver in telepathic transmission. Bridging by thought transmissions to a body which is hurting is somatic when the methods are physiological. It involves the subtle touching of body organs while eliciting certain emotional reactions, which can include the use of the senses. Skillfully applied energy beams can evoke recognition by sight, sound, taste, and smell. The whole idea with recognition is to convince the person grieving that the individual they love is still alive. The purpose of somatic touch is to allow the grief-stricken person to come to terms with their loss by acquiring an awareness that absence is only a change of reality and not final. Hopefully, this will allow the bereaved to move on and complete their own life constructively. Souls are also quite capable of falling into habit patterns with somatic touch. The next case is an example of a 49-year-old man who had died of cancer. While the soul of this man does not demonstrate much skill, his intentions are good. Case 2. Dr. N. What technique do you use to reach out to your wife? Subject. Oh, my old standby, the center of the chest. Dr. N. Where exactly on the chest? Subject. I direct my energy beam right at the heart. If I'm a little off, it doesn't matter. Dr. N. And why is this method successful for you? Subject. I'm on the ceiling and she is bent over crying. My first shot causes her to straighten up. She sighs deeply and senses something and looks upward. Then I use my scatter technique. Dr. N. What is that? Subject. Smiles. Oh, you know, throwing energy in all directions from a central point on the ceiling. Usually one of those bolts reaches the right place. The head. Anywhere. Dr. N. But what determines the right place? Subject. That which is not blocked by negative energy, of course. Compare the difference between case two and the next client who carefully spreads her energy in a focused area as if she was applying icing on a cake. Case three. Dr. N. Please describe the manner in which you are going to help your husband with your energy. Subject. I'm going to work the base of the head just above the spine. God, Kevin is suffering so much. I just won't leave until he feels better. Dr. N. Why this particular spot? Subject. Because I know he enjoyed having the back of his neck rubbed by me. So it is an area where he is more receptive to my vibrational imprint. Then I play this area as if I was doing body massage. Which I am, actually. Dr. N. Play the area? Subject. My subject giggles and holds her hand out in front of her, opening up five fingers wide. Yes, I spread my energy and resonate myself by touch. Then I use both hands cupped around each side of Kevin's head for maximum effect. Dr. N. Does he know it is you? 
subject with a wicked smile. Oh, he realizes it must be me all right. No one else can do what I do to him, and it only takes me a minute. Dr. N., isn't he going to miss this after you return to the spirit world? Subject, I thought you knew about such things. I can come back whenever he really gets down in the dumps and yearns for me. Dr. N., just asking. I don't mean to be insensitive, but what if Kevin eventually meets another woman in this life? Subject, I'll be delighted if he finds happiness again. That is a testimony as to how good we were together. Our life with each other, every scene is never lost and can be recaptured and played again in the spirit world. Just about the time I think I am getting a complete grasp of soul capabilities and their limitations, a client will come along to dispel these faulty notions. For a long while, I told people that all souls seemed to have difficulties getting past the uncontrolled sobs of the grieving before they could go to work with healing energy. Here is a short quote from a level three whose tactical approach during the peak of the grief process proved me wrong. I am not delayed by people who are crying hard. My technique is to coordinate my vibrational resonance with the tonal variations of their vocal cords and then springboard to the brain. In this way, I can align my energy to effect a more rapid melding of my essence with their body. Quite soon, they stop crying without knowing why. Personification with Objects I have heard some fascinating stories about the use of familiar objects, such as with the man in my next case. Since husbands usually die ahead of their wives, I do hear more about energy techniques from their perspective. This does not mean male-oriented souls are more proficient with healing because they get more practice at comforting. The soul in case four has been just as effective in former lives as a woman who preceded her husband in death, as a husband in this life. Case 4. Dr. N. What do you do if your efforts right after death are not having the desired results anywhere on the body? Subject. When I found that my wife Helen was not receiving me by a direct approach, I finally resorted to working with a household familiar. Dr. N. You mean with an animal? A cat or dog? Subject. I have used them before, but no, not this time. I decided to pick out some object of value to me that my wife would know was very personal. I chose my ring. At this point, my subject explained to me that during this past life, he always wore a large ring of Indian design with a raised turquoise stone in the center. He and his wife often sat by the fire talking about their day. He had a habit of rubbing the stone while talking to Helen. His wife often kidded him about polishing the turquoise down to the metal base of the ring. Helen had once reminded him that she had noticed this nervous mannerism the night they met. Dr. N. I think I understand about the ring, so what did you do with it as a spirit? Subject. When I work with objects and people, I have to wait until the scene is very tranquil. Three weeks after my death, Helen lit a fire and was looking into it with tears in her eyes. I began by wrapping my energy within the fire itself, using the fire as a conduit of warmth and elasticity. Dr. N. Excuse my interruption, but what does elasticity mean? Subject. It took me centuries to learn this. Elastic energy is fluid. To make my soul energy fluid requires intense concentration and practice because it must be thin and fleecy. The fire serves as a catalyst in this maneuver. Dr. N., which is just the opposite from a strong, narrow beam of energy. Subject. Exactly. I can be very effective by rapidly shifting my energy from a fluid to a solid state and back again. The shifting is subtle, but it awakens the human mind. Note. Others have also told me this technique of energy shape-shifting tickles the human brain. Dr. N. Interesting. Please continue. Subject. Helen was connecting with the fire and thus with me. For a moment, the grief was less oppressive, and I moved straight into the top of her head. She felt my presence. Slightly. It was not enough. Then I began shifting my energy, as I told you, from hard to soft, in fork fashion. Dr. N., what do you do when you fork energy? Subject, I split it. 
While keeping a soft, fluid energy on Helen's head to maintain contact, I fork a hard beam at the box which holds my ring in a table drawer. My intent is to open up a smooth pathway from her mind to the ring. This is why I am using a hard, steady beam to direct her to the ring. Dr. N., what does Helen do next? Subject. With my guidance, she slowly gets up without knowing why. She moves as if sleepwalking to the table and hesitates. Then she opens the drawer. Since my ring is in the box, I continue to shift back and forth from her mind to the lid of the box. Helen opens it and takes out my ring, holding it in her left hand. With a deep sigh. Then I know I have her. Dr. N. Because. Subject. Because the ring still retains some of my energy. Don't you see? She is feeling my energy on both ends of the fork. This is a two-directional signal. Very effective. Dr. N. Oh, I do see. Then what do you do with Helen? Subject. Now I move into overdrive with a full-power bridge between myself standing on her right side and the ring on the left. She turns in my direction and smiles. Helen then kisses my ring and says, Thanks, darling. I know you are with me now. I'll try and be more brave. I want to encourage anyone who is in a terrible state of grief over the loss of a love to do what the gifted psychics do when they want to find missing persons. Take a piece of jewelry, an article of clothing, anything that belonged to the departed person, and hold it for a while in a mutually familiar place and quietly open your mind while blanking out all other irrelevant thoughts. Before leaving this section, I want to relate my favorite story about energy contact through objects from a discarnate being. My wife Peggy is an oncology nurse with a graduate degree in counseling, so she involves herself a great deal with grieving cancer patients and their families. Because she administers chemotherapy at a hospital, this puts her in touch with hospice personnel. A few of these women and my wife are close friends who meet regularly as a support group. One of the members of the group is a recent widow, whose husband, Clay, died of cancer. Clay loved big band dancing, and he and his wife would often go on road trips to where the best bands were playing. One night after Clay's death, his widow, my wife, and the rest of the support group were in a circle in the middle of this lady's living room floor, talking about my theories of how souls reach back to comfort the people they love. The widow exclaimed in frustration, Why hasn't Clay made himself known in a way that would comfort me? There was a moment of silence, and suddenly a music box on top of a bookshelf began to play Glenn Miller's song, In the Mood. From what I understand, there was a stunned silence followed by nervous laughter from the group. All the widow could say was, That music box hasn't been touched in two years. It didn't matter. I think she got Clay's message. Light energy has some properties of electromagnetic force and thus can work in mysterious ways with objects. Joanne and Jim are two former clients of mine whose marriage is a very close one. After their sessions, we got into a discussion of the use of energy beams by the living. Sheepishly, they told me they combine their energy on the California freeways to push cars out of the fast lane in front of them when they are in a hurry. When I asked if they tailgate, they said, No, we just direct a combined beam to the back of the driver's head and then fork the beam to the right, middle lane, and back again. They claim that over 50% of the time they are successful. I told Joanne and Jim, half seriously, that pushing cars out of their way was clearly a misuse of power, and they had better mend their ways. I think they both know that using their gift more constructively will be much better received upstairs, although it will be a hard habit to break. Dream Recognition One of the primary ways the newly departed soul uses to reach people who love them is through the dream state. The grief that has overwhelmed the conscious mind is temporarily pushed out of a frontal position in our thoughts when we are asleep. Even if we are in a fitful state of sleep, the unconscious mind is now more open for reception. Unfortunately, the person who is grieving will all too often wake up from a dream that could have contained a message and allow it to slip away from memory without writing anything down. 
Either the images and symbols they saw while asleep didn't mean anything at the time, or the dream sequence was chalked off as wishful thinking if, for example, the dreamers saw themselves with the deceased. Before proceeding further, I want to offer an assessment about the general nature of dreams. My professional experience with dreams stems from listening to subjects in hypnosis explain how, as discarnates, they use the dream state to reach the living. Spirits are very selective in their use of our dream sequences. I have come to the conclusion that most dreams are not profound. In reviewing various texts about dreaming, I find even specialists in the field believe many dreams during the night are simply jumbled up absurdities caused by our circuits being on overload throughout the day. If the mind is venting during certain sleep cycles, then the nerve transmissions across our synaptic clefts are letting off steam to relax the brain. I classify dreams in three ways, and one of them is the cleaning house state. At times in the night, many stray thoughts from the day are scrambled and swept out of the mind as gobbledygook. We can't make sense of it because there is none. On the other hand, we all know there is a more cognitive side to dreaming. I divide this state into two parts, problem-solving and spiritual, with only a fine line between them. There are people who have been given a premonition about some future event as an outgrowth of dreams. Our state of mind may be altered by dreams. One of the most stressful periods of our lives occurs during the period of mourning, when the affections of someone we love are taken away from us, we think forever. About the only relief we get from oppressive grief is during sleep. We go to bed with anguish and wake up with the pain still there. Yet there is enigma in between. Some mornings bring us a better idea of the initial steps to take toward coping with our loss. Problem-solving through dream sequences is a process of mental incubation which has been called procedural because images appear that teach us ways to move forward. Does this insight come from somewhere other than ourselves? If the dream spills over into the spirit mode, then the dream weavers have probably paid us a call as prompters to assist us through our emotional distress. Spiritual dreams involve our guides, teaching souls and soulmates who come as messengers to assist us with solutions. We do not need to be grieving to receive help in this way. Into this spiritual dream mixture we also have memory recall of our experiences on other physical and mental worlds, including the spirit world. How many of you have dreamed that you could fly or swim easily underwater? I have found with some clients that these mythic memories contain information about the lives they led as intelligent flying or water creatures on other planets. Frequently, these kinds of dream sequences provide us with metaphoric clues which open the door to comparisons of former lives with our current one. Our immortal soul character does not change much between host bodies, so these comparisons are not all that bizarre. Some of our greatest revelations come from the episodic dreams of events, places, and behavior patterns emanating from experiences before we acquired our present body. In Chapter 1, I briefly touched on the preparation class we attend in the spirit world before returning to a new life. This soul exercise is covered more thoroughly in my first book, but I mention it here because this experience is relevant to our dreams. The class is designated for recognition of future people and events. While we prepare to incarnate, a teacher reinforces the important aspects of our new life contract. Meeting and interacting with souls from our group and other clusters who are to share parts of our new life form an integral part of the class. Memories of this prep class might well be triggered in our dreams to light a lamp in the darkness of despair particularly when a primary soulmate is lost in life. Young said, Dreams embody suppressed wishes and fears, but may also give expression to inescapable truths, which are not illusions or wild fantasies. Sometimes these truths are couched in metaphoric puzzles and represented as archetypal images during our dreams. Dream symbols are culturally generalized, and dream glossaries are not immune to this prejudice. Each person should use their own intuition to delineate the meaning of a dream. The Australian Aborigines, a culture with over 10,000 years of unbroken history, 
believe that dream time is actually real time in terms of objective reality. A dream perception is often as real as an awake experience. To souls in the spirit world, time is always in the present, so regardless of how long they have been physically gone from your life, the person you love wants you to be aware that they are still in now reality. How does a loving spirit go about helping you gain insight and acceptance of these things in your dreams? Case 5 My subject in this case has just died of pneumonia in New York City in 1935. She was a young woman in her early 30s who came to New York after growing up in a small Midwestern town. Sylvia's death was sudden, and she wanted to provide some comfort to her widowed mother. Dr. N. Do you leave immediately for the spirit world after death? Subject. No, I do not. I must say goodbye to my mother, so I want to stay around Earth for a while until she gets the news. Dr. N. Is there anyone else you care to see before going to your mother? Subject. With hesitation, then in a husky voice. Yes. I have an old boyfriend. His name is Phil. I go to his house first. Dr. N. Gently. I see. Were you in love with Phil? Subject. Pause. Yes, but we never married. I just want to touch him once more. I don't really make contact with him because he is sound asleep and not dreaming. I can't stay long because I want to reach my mother before she hears the news about me. Dr. N., Aren't you being a little too rushed with Phil? Why don't you wait for a proper dream cycle and leave a message? Subject, firmly. Phil hasn't been a part of my life for years. I gave myself to him when we were both young. He hardly thinks about me anymore. And, well, to pick up on me through a dream, he could miss the message anyway. My leaving traces of my energy is enough for now because we will be together again in the spirit world. Dr. N., after leaving Phil, do you go to your mother? Subject, yes. I begin with more conventional thought communication while she is awake, but I am getting nowhere. She is so sad. My mother's grief at not being at my bedside is overpowering her. Dr. N., what methods have you tried so far? Subject, I project my thoughts with an orange-yellow light like the flame of a candle, and place my light around her head, sending loving thoughts. I'm not effective. She doesn't realize I am with her. I am going for a dream. Dr. N. All right, Sylvia. Take me through this slowly. Please start by telling me if you pick out one of your mother's dreams, or if you can create one of your own. Subject. I don't create dreams well yet. It is much easier for me to take one of hers, so I can enter the dream to effect a more natural contact and then participate. I want her to know it is clearly me in the dream. Dr. N. Fine. Now take me through this process with you. Subject. The first couple of dreams are unsuitable. One is a muddle of absurdity. Another is a past life fragment, but without me in it. Finally, she has a dream where she is walking alone in the fields around my house. You should know she has no grief in this dream. I am not dead yet. Dr. N., what good is this dream, Sylvia, if you are not in it? Subject, laughing at me. Listen, aren't you seeing? I'm going to smoothly place myself in the dream. Dr. N., you can alter the sequence of the dream to include yourself? Subject, sure. I enter the dream from the other end of the field by matching my energy patterns to my mother's thoughts. I project an image of myself as I was the last time she saw me. I come slowly across the field to let her get used to my presence. I wave and smile and then come to her. We hug each other, and now I send waves of rejuvenating energy into her sleeping body. Dr. N. And what will this do for your mother? Subject. This picture is raised to a higher level of consciousness for my mother. I want to ensure the dream will stay with her after she wakes up. Dr. N., how can you be sure she won't think this is all a projection of her desire for you and discount the dream as not being real? Subject. The influence of a vivid dream like this is very great. When my mother wakes up, her mind has a vivid impression of this landscape with me and suspects I am with her. 
In time, the memory is so real she is sure of it. Dr. N. Sylvia, does the image of the dream move from the unconscious to a conscious reality because of your energy transfer? Subject. Yes, it is a filtering process where I continue to send waves of energy into her over the next few days until she begins to accept my passing. I want her to believe I am still part of her and always will be. Turning back to Phil's sleep state, it was evident Sylvia did not intend to stay long to manifest her feelings within his unconscious mind. Dreams do not appear to occur in the deep delta stages of brainwave activity, where there is no rapid eye movement. REM sleep, also known as paradoxical sleep, is a much lighter and therefore more active dream state, occurring mostly in the early and late stages of sleep. In my next case, the dreamer will be reached between dreams, presumably because he is still in REM sleep. The dream weaver souls I have come in contact with all engage in dream implanting, with two prominent differences. 1. Dream alteration. Here, a skillful discarnate enters the mind of a sleeper and partially alters an existing dream already in progress. This technique I would call one of interlineation, where spirits place themselves as actors between the lines of an unfolding play, so the dreamer is not aware of script tampering with the sequences. This is what Sylvia was doing with her mother. She was waiting for the right sort of ongoing dream to enter and initiate a smooth fit. As difficult as this approach seems, it is evident to me the second procedure is more complex. 2. Dream Origination In these cases, the soul must create and fully implant a new dream from scratch and weave the tapestry of these images into a meaningful presentation to suit their purpose. Creating or altering scenes in the mind of a dreamer is intended to convey a message. I see this as an act of service and love. If the dream implantation is not performed skillfully to make the dream meaningful, the sleeper moves on and wakes up in the morning, remembering only disjointed fragments, or nothing at all about the dream. To illustrate the therapeutic use of dream origination, I will cite the case of a level 5 subject whose name was Bud in his last life. Bud was killed in a 1942 battle during World War II. The case involves a dreamer called Walt, who was Bud's surviving brother. Bud is adept at dream weaving, so after his battlefield death, he returned home to the spirit world and made preparations for an effective method to comfort Walt. This is one of those cases that gave me greater perspective of the subtle integration methods dream weaver souls are able to use with sleeping people. During this condensed case, my subject will describe the dream techniques taught to him by his guide. Axinar. Case 6. Dr. N. How do you plan to alleviate your brother's grief after returning to the spirit world? Subject. Axinar has been working with me on an effective strategy. It's very delicate because we are with Walt's duplicate. Dr. N. You mean that dual part of Walt's energy mass that remained behind during his incarnation to Earth? Subject. Yes, Walt and I are in the same soul group. I begin by connecting myself to his divided nature here to more closely communicate with Walt's light on Earth. Dr. N. Please explain this procedure. Subject. I float next to the cache where his remaining energy is anchored and meld with it briefly. This allows for a perfect recording of Walt's energy imprint. There is already a telepathic bonding between us, but I want to have a tighter vibrational alliance when I reach his bedside. Dr. N., why do you wish to carry an absolutely accurate print of Walt's energy pattern with you on your return to Earth? Subject, for a stronger connection to the dreams I will create. Dr. N., but why can't Walt's other half communicate with himself on Earth instead of you? Subject, sharply, this does not work well. It is nothing more than talking to oneself. There is no impact, especially during sleep. It's a washout. Dr. N. All right. Since Walt's exact energy print is with you, what happens when you go to his sleeping body? Subject. He is tossing and turning at night, 
and really suffering a lot over my being killed. Axanar trained me to work between dreams because he does these energy transfers so well himself. Dr. N. You work between dreams? Subject. Yes, so I can leave messages on either side of two different dreams and then link them for greater receptivity. Because I have Walt's exact energy imprint, I slip into his mind quite easily to deploy my energy. After my visit, a third dream about the first two unfolds as a delayed reaction, and Walt sees us together again in an out-of-body setting, which he won't recognize as the spirit world, but the activation of these inviting memories will sustain him. Note, some cultures, such as the Tibetan mystics, believe they do recognize the spirit world as an almost physical paradise to be a natural part of dreaming. Dr. N. What were the dreams you created? Subject. Walt was three years older, yet we played a lot together as boys. This changed when he was thirteen, not because we weren't still close as brothers. He just became attached to guys his own age, and I was excluded. One day, Walt and his friends were swinging on a rope tied over the branch of a big high tree above a pond near our farm. I was nearby watching. The other boys went first and were engaged in a water fight when Walt swung too high and hit his head hard on another branch and was almost knocked out as he fell into the water. They did not see him fall. I dove into the pond and held up his head, screaming for help. Later, on the bank, Walt looked up at me with a dazed expression and said, Thanks for saving me, buddy. I thought this act would admit me to their club, but a few weeks afterwards, Walt and his friends would not let me play a game of softball with them. I felt betrayed that Walt would not stand up for us. During the game, the ball was hit into some bushes and they couldn't locate it. That evening, I found their ball and hid it inside our barn. We were poor kids, and this ruined their game for a while until one of the boys got another ball on his birthday. Dr. N., Tell me the message you wanted to convey to Walt. Subject. To show two things. I wanted my brother to see me crying and holding his bleeding head in my lap on the bank of the pond and remember what we said to each other after he stopped choking. The second dream about the softball game ended when I added a trailer to the dream and took him to the barn where the softball was still hidden. I told Walt I forgave him for every slight in our lives together. I want him to know I am always with him and the devotion we have for each other can't die. He will know this when he returns to the old barn to look for the ball. Dr. N. Does Walt need to dream again about all this after your visit? Subject. Laughs. It's not necessary as long as he recalled the location of the ball after he woke. Walt did remember what I had implanted. Going back to our old barn and finding the ball made the message come together. This gave Walt some serenity about my death. Dream symbolism moves on many levels in the mind, some of which are abstract while others are emotional. The dreams of this case involving experiential imagery reinforced poignant memories of two brothers in a slice of recorded time. Future unification was pictured for Walt in a third, rather wispy dream of both souls happily together once again in the spirit world. It took me quite a long while before I found an advanced subject apprenticed to a dream master, a title I feel is appropriate for Axanar in Case 6. As with any spiritual technique, some souls show more inclination than others toward acquiring advanced skills. In Case 6, Bud not only originated a sequence of dreams in Walt's mind, but then engaged in the more complex technique of linking them into a central theme of love and support for his brother. Finally, Bud provided physical evidence that he was there through the use of a hidden baseball. I take nothing away from Sylvia in Case 5, because she was very effective entering her mother's dream to give her peace without disruption to the dreamer. It's just that Case 6 demonstrated more spiritual artistry. Transference Through Children When souls have difficulty reaching the mind of a troubled adult, they might resort to using children as conduits for their messages. Children are more receptive to spirits because they have not been conditioned to doubt or resist the supernatural. Frequently, the young person chosen as a conduit is a family member of the departed. This situation is helpful to the spirit who is trying to reach a surviving relative, especially in the same household. The next case is that of a man who died of a heart attack in his backyard at age 42. 
Case 7 Dr. N. What do you do to comfort your wife at the moment of death? Subject At first I try to hug Irene with my energy, but I don't have the hang of it yet. Subject is a level two. I can relate to her sorrow, but nothing I'm doing is working. I'm worried because I don't want to leave without saying goodbye. Dr. N. Just relax now and move slowly forward. I want you to explain to me how you work through this dilemma. Subject. I soon realize that I ought to be able to console Irene a little by reaching her through Sarah, our ten-year-old. Dr. N. Why do you think Sarah might be receptive to you? Subject. My daughter and I have a special bond. She also has great sorrow over my passing, but much of this is mixed with fear over what happened to me so suddenly. Sarah doesn't comprehend it all yet. There are too many neighbors crowding around trying to sustain my wife. No one is paying much attention to Sarah, sitting alone in our bedroom. Dr. N. Do you look upon this as an opportunity? Subject. Yes, I do. In fact, Sarah senses I am still alive, and so she is more open to accepting my vibrations as I move into the bedroom. Dr. N. Good. What happens next between you and your daughter? Subject. Takes a deep breath. I've got it. Sarah is holding a set of her mother's knitting needles. I send warmth through them into her hands and she feels this right away. Then I use the needles as a springboard to reach her spine at the base of the neck and work around to her chin. Subject stops and begins laughing. Dr. N. What is making you happy? Subject. Sarah is giggling because I'm tickling her chin like I did before she went to sleep every night. Dr. N. Now what do you do? Subject. The crowd is breaking up and leaving because I have been taken out to the street and placed into an ambulance. Irene comes alone into the bedroom and gets ready for a neighbor who will drive her to the hospital. She also wants to check on our daughter. Sarah looks up at my wife and says, Mommy, you don't have to leave. Daddy is here with me. I know because I can feel him tickling my chin. Dr. N. And then what does your wife do? Subject. Irene is tearful but not crying as hard as before because she doesn't want to scare Sarah. So she hugs our daughter. Dr. N. Irene does not want to indulge in what she believes to be Sarah's fantasy about your being with her? Subject. Not yet, but I'm ready for Irene now. As soon as my wife holds our daughter, I jump the gap between them, sending energy flowing over both. Irene feels me too, although not as much as Sarah. They sit down on the bed and hold on to each other with their eyes closed. For a while, all three of us are alone together. Dr. N., do you feel you have accomplished what you set out to do on this day? Subject, yes, it's enough. It is time for me to leave, and I pull back away from them and float out of the house. Then I am high over the countryside and sucked up into the sky. Soon I move into bright light, where my guide comes to meet me. Contact in Familiar Settings It may seem from the last case that once the departing soul has reached out and touched those who care about them, they go off to the spirit world without bothering to be near us again. There are people who don't feel a soul's presence right after death, but will in the future. Survivors who have reached the acceptance stage in their grief process would find solace in knowing those they have loved are still watching over them. Yet there are those who never pick up anything. Souls don't give up easily on us. Another way spirits touch people is through environmental settings associated with their memory. These contacts are effective to minds which may be closed to all other forms of spiritual communication. The following case illustrates this method. My subject, a woman called Nancy in her last life, died of a sudden stroke after 38 years of marriage to Charles. Her husband was stuck between the denial and anger stages of grief, and his emotions were so pent up that he could not accept help from their friends or seek outside professional counseling. As an engineer, his predominantly analytical mind rejected any spiritual approach to his loss as being unscientific. Nancy's soul had tried reaching her husband in several ways for months after the funeral. 
His stoic nature created such a wall around himself that Charles had not really cried since his wife's death. To overcome this obstacle, Nancy decided she could reach his inner mind through his sense of smell by connecting with an environmental setting familiar to both of them. The use of sense organs by souls complements communication with the subconscious mind. Nancy decided to use her garden, specifically a rose bush, to reach Charles. Case 8. Dr. N. Why do you think Charles is going to react to your presence through a garden? Subject. Because he knows I loved my garden. For him, my plants were a take-it-or-leave-it situation. He knew it gave me pleasure. But to Charles, gardening was just a lot of hard work. Frankly, he helped very little in our yard. He was too busy with his mechanical projects. Dr. N. He paid no attention, then, to your yard work? Subject. Not unless I drew his attention to something. I had a favorite white rose bush by our front door, and whenever I cut these flowers I would wave them in front of his nose and tell Charles that if this sweet scent did not affect him, then he had no romance in his soul. We used to laugh about this a lot because Charles was actually a tender lover, but outwardly you would never know it. To avoid the issue, he would tease me by saying gruffly, These are white roses. I like red. Dr. N. So how did you implement a plan with roses to let Charles know you are still alive and with him? Subject. My rose bush died from lack of attention after my death. In fact, my whole yard was in bad shape because Charles was not functioning well at all. One weekend he was walking around the garden in a daze and came near some roses belonging to our next-door neighbor. He caught the smell. This is what I was waiting for, and I moved quickly into his mind. He thought of me and looked at my dead rose bush. Dr. N., you created an image of your rose bush in his mind? Subject. Size. No, he would have missed that in the beginning. Charles understands tools. I started out by getting him to picture a shovel in his mind and digging. Then we made the transition to my rose bush and the garden center in town where it could be purchased. Charles pulled out his car keys. Dr. N., you got him to walk to the car and then drive over to this nursery? Subject. Grinning. It took persistence, but yes, I did. Dr. N., then what did you do? Subject. At the nursery, Charles wandered around for a bit until I was able to draw him to the roses. They were only red varieties, and that suited him. I was projecting a white color in his mind, so he asked a clerk why there were no white roses. He was told red was all they had left in stock. Charles overrode my thoughts and bought a big pot of red roses, telling the clerk to deliver them to our house, because he didn't want to get his car dirty. Dr. N., what do overriding thoughts mean to you? Subject. People under stress get impatient and fall back on established thought patterns. To Charles, the standard rose is red. That's his mindset. Since the store didn't have white roses at the moment, my husband would not deal with it further. Dr. N. So in a sense, Charles was blocking the conflicting images between his conscious thoughts and what you were projecting in his unconscious mind? Subject, yes. And also, my husband is very mentally tired from my death. Dr. N., wouldn't red roses suit your purpose just as well? Subject, flatly. No. It was then I switched my energy to Sabine, the woman I knew who ran the store. She was at my funeral and was aware I loved white roses. Dr. N., I don't think I know where this is going, Nancy. There were no white roses. Charles bought the red roses and then left for home. Wasn't this enough for you? Subject, laughing at me. You men! The white rose is me! The next morning, Sabine personally drove to my house and delivered a big pot of white roses. She told my husband that she got them from another nursery and that this is what I would have wanted. Then she left Charles standing bewildered in our driveway. He carried them over to the hole he had dug, where my old rose bush had been and stopped. 
The roses were in his face. He smelled their fragrance. But what was more important, the wash of white was combined with the scent. My subject pauses tearfully as she recreates this moment. Dr. N., in a low voice, You are making this all very clear. Please go on. Subject. Charles was feeling my presence at last. I now spread my energy around his torso to include the roses in a symmetrical envelopment. I wanted him to smell the white roses and my essence filtering through the energy field together. Dr. N., was this effective? Subject, softly. Finally, he knelt down next to the hole, pressing the roses to his face. Charles broke down and sobbed for a long time while I held him. When it was over, he knew I was with him still. While the spirits of husbands might use cars or sporting equipment, I find that wives often utilize garden settings to reach their mates. Another client told me about his wife applying the planting of an oak tree to make her connection. Before this widower saw me, he wrote, even if what happened to me was not from my wife, does it matter? The main thing is that in some way I am using the emotional energy generated by my feeling she was with me to tap into my inner resources, which previously were not available. I am no longer in an abyss without a glimmer of light. In talking with people about such experiences, which some call mystical, it is important to consider the possibility of a spiritual source. If we can feed into a highly charged state of emotion during our grief, we can both heal and learn more about our inner selves. Spirits may prefer to communicate with us in the form of ideas. Here is a quote from a letter I received from a former client about his departed wife, Gwen. I believe our session together assisted in his discovery of the best way to receive his wife's thoughts. I've learned we don't all have equal abilities as souls to communicate with each other. Sending and receiving messages is a skill that needs to be refined with practice. I finally recognized the imprint of Gwen's thoughts after getting nothing during my meditations. She was a literary person who used word thoughts rather than pictures to generate feeling in me. I had to learn to integrate word flashes from her into my own manner of speaking which she knows, in order to decipher what she was telling me. I see more clearly now how I can touch Gwen with my mind. Strangers as Messengers Case 9 Derek was a man in his sixties who came to see me from Canada to evaluate his life and try and resolve his greatest sadness. When he was a young man, he lost his beautiful four-year-old daughter, Julia. Her death was sudden, unexpected, and so devastating that he and his wife decided to have no more children. I placed Eric in deep hypnosis and took him to a scene following his last life, where he appeared in front of his counsel. We then discovered that one of his major current life lessons was learning to cope with tragedy. Derek had been deficient in this area during his past two lives by falling apart and making life more difficult for family members who depended upon him. He is doing much better in his current life. What was especially interesting for me about this case was a single incident that happened to Derek some twenty years after Julia's death. Derek had recently lost his wife to cancer and was in mourning. One day, feeling very despondent, he walked to a nearby amusement park. After a while, he sat down on a bench near a carousel. Listening to the music... Derek watched the children happily going around in circles on colorful wooden animals. He saw from a distance one little girl who looked like Julia, and tears flooded his eyes. Just then a young woman of about twenty appeared and asked if she could sit down next to him. It was a warm day. She was dressed in white muslin, holding a cold drink in her hand. Derek nodded but said nothing, while the woman enjoyed her drink and talked about growing up in England— and coming to Canada because she was particularly attracted to Vancouver. She introduced herself as Heather, and Derek noticed a glow of sunlight around her that gave the young woman a shining, angelic quality. Time seemed to be suspended for Derek as the conversation turned to family 
and what Heather was going to do with her new life in Canada. Derek found himself talking to her as a father, and the more they conversed, the more he felt he knew her. Finally, Heather stood up and placed her hand tenderly on Derek's shoulder. She smiled at him and said, I know you are worried about me. Please don't be. I'm all right, and it's going to be a wonderful life. We will see each other again some day, I know. Derek told me that as Heather walked away and gave him a final wave, he saw his daughter and felt at peace. During our session, Derek recognized that the reincarnated soul of Julia had come to him and provided the assurance he had not really lost her. When we suffer the absence of people we love, they may come to us in mysterious ways, often when our minds are detached in a shallow alpha state. Take these moments as messages from the other side and allow them to bring sustenance to you. Angels or Other Heavenly Hosts In recent years, there has been a resurgence in the popularity of angels. The Roman Catholic Church defines angels as spiritual, intelligent, non-corporeal beings who are servants and messengers of God. The position of the Christian Church is that these beings have never incarnated on earth. We think of angels as white-robed figures with wings and a halo. Theological images, which may have come down to us from the Middle Ages. Many clients initially think they see angels when I regress them into the spirit world, especially those with strong religious convictions. This reaction is similar to the devotional responses of some people who have had near-death experiences. However, regardless of prior religious conditioning, my subjects soon realize the etheric beings they are visualizing in hypnosis represent their guides and soul companions who have come to meet them. These spiritual beings are surrounded by white light and may appear in robes. In my work, guides are sometimes described as guardian angels, although our personal teachers are beings who have incarnated in physical form long before graduating to the level of guides. An intimate soulmate in discarnate form can also come to the gate to comfort us in times of need. I feel believing in angels emanates from an inner desire for personal protection on the part of many people. In making this observation, it is not my intention to set aside the faith of millions of religious people in angels. For many years, I lacked faith in anything beyond my own existence. I know the importance of believing in something greater than yourself. Our faith is what sustains us in life, and this applies to believing that there are superior beings who watch over us. My case presentations are intended to give weight to the concept of benevolent spirits in our lives. Our spiritual teachers have different styles and techniques, just as teachers on earth. Their immortal character has been matched to our own essence in a variety of ways. The next two abbreviated cases illustrate my contention that personal guides and soulmates, however they are represented, contact us from the other side if we require consolation. Case 10 The following statements come from Renee, a 40-year-old widow who lost her husband Harry three months before our appointment. I waited until after our session before asking her the series of questions that follow. My intent was to have Renee contrast the conscious versus superconscious imagery she had of her guide, Nyath. Dr. N. Before our session today, have you had any contact with the being you saw in hypnosis as Nyath? Subject. Yes, since Harry's death, Nyath has come to me during my dark hours. Dr. N., did Nyath appear to be the same to you before and after this hypnosis session? Subject. No, I didn't see her quite the same way. I thought she was an angel before, and now I see Nyath as my teacher. Dr. N. Were her face and demeanor different to you while you were under hypnosis, compared to what you saw when awake? Subject. Laughs. Today there were no wings or a halo. But bright light, that was the same. And her face and gentle manner were the same, too. I also see that in our spirit group she can be sharply instructive. Dr. N. 
more of a teacher and less of a grief counselor, you mean? Subject. Yes, perhaps that's it. Right after Harry's death, she was so sweet and understanding when she came to me. Rushing on. That doesn't mean she isn't nice in the spirit world, just more... exacting. Dr. N. Did you do anything to summon Nyath right after Harry's death? Subject. I was crying for help after the funeral. I found out that I needed to be alone and very still. To listen. Dr. N. Does this mean you heard Nyath rather than actually saw her? Subject. No. In the beginning, I saw her floating over my head in my bedroom. I had my arms wrapped around a pillow, pretending it was Harry, but I had stopped crying. She became fuzzy after I first saw her, and I realized then I had to listen carefully for her voice. In the days that followed, I heard Nyath more than I saw her, but I had to listen. Dr. N. Does that mean concentrate? Subject. Yes. Well, no. More allowing my mind to go free from my body. Dr. N. What happens when you don't listen properly, but you want her messages? Subject. Then she communicates with me through my feelings. Dr. N. In what way? Subject. Oh, I might be driving alone or out walking by myself, wondering about doing something, taking a certain action. She will make me feel good about it if I am supposed to do it, if it is right. Dr. N. And what if the action you are considering would be wrong for you, then what? Subject. Nyath will make me feel uneasy about doing it. I will know in my gut it is a wrong move. My next case excerpt involves a young man who died in a car crash in 1942, at age 36. He gives us another perspective on the mythology of angels, from a soul reaching back to earth. Case 11. Dr. N. Tell me what you did for your wife after the crash. Subject. I stayed around for three days with Betty to lessen her heaviness. I positioned myself over her head, so our energy fields crossed in such a way that I could soothe her by matching our vibrations. Dr. N. Did you employ any other techniques? Subject. Yes. I projected my likeness in front of her face. Dr. N. Was this effective? Subject. Playfully. Initially, she thought I was Jesus. The second day, she was confused, and the third day, Betty was convinced I was an angel. My wife is very religious. Dr. N. Are you bothered that she didn't recognize you because of her religious convictions? Subject. Not at all. Then, after some hesitation, Oh, I suppose it would please me if Betty realized it was me, but her feeling better is my main concern. Betty is convinced I am a heavenly deity, and that is okay because I do represent spiritual help for her. Dr. N. Would she feel even better knowing it was you? Subject. Look, Betty thinks I'm in heaven and can't help her. Her angel is able to do so because it's really me. So I'm in disguise. What's the difference as long as my goal to help her is accomplished? Dr. N. Well, since Betty has not connected you with your disguise, is there any other way you can communicate on a more personal level? Subject. Smiles. Through my best friend, Ted. He consoles her and gives her advice with day-to-day -day details. Later, I hover over the both of them, sending permissive messages. Subject then laughs. Dr. N. What do you find humorous? Subject. Ted is not married. He has been in love with Betty for a long time, but she doesn't realize it yet. Dr. N. Is this all right with you? Subject. Cheerfully, yet with nostalgia. Sure. I'm relieved he can do what I can't anymore for her. At least until she returns home to me. Finally, there are those angel-like spirits who regularly come to Earth between lives, simply to help people they don't know who are in distress. They may be healers in training, as was true with the client who said to me, 
My guide and I assisted a boy in India who was drowning and consumed by fear. His parents pulled him from the river and were trying to resuscitate him, but he was not responding well. I placed my hands on his head to quiet his fear, sent a spike of energy into his heart to bring warmth into his body, and superimposed his essence with mine for a moment to help him cough up the water and start breathing again. We were able to help a total of twenty-four people on that trip to Earth. Emotional Recovery of Souls and Survivors The last remarks from Case 11 about his wife Betty and those of Case 3 who talked about her husband Kevin touch upon the issue of later relationships by the survivor. Falling in love again after the death of a spouse sometimes causes feelings of guilt and even betrayal. In both these cases, we saw that the departing spouses only wanted their surviving mates to be happy and loved. However, just because spirits want this for us does not mean that we can easily compartmentalize our expressions of intimacy to past and present loves. People who have had long, happy first marriages and then lose a spouse make excellent candidates for a successful second marriage. This is a tribute to the first relationship. Having other relationships neither lessens nor dishonors our first love. It only validates that love, providing a state of healthy acceptance has been reached in between. I know placing aside feelings of guilt is easier said than done. I have received letters from widows and widowers asking me if their departed spouses could actually be watching them in the bedroom with someone else. In my summary of the spirit world, I indicated that souls lose most of their negative emotional baggage when they shed their bodies. Although it is true we may carry the imprint of some emotional trauma from a past life into the next one, this condition is in a state of abeyance until we return to a new body. Also, a great deal of negative energy is expelled during the early stages of our return to the spirit world, especially after deprogramming during orientation. When a soul once again returns to a pure energy state in the spirit world, it no longer feels hate, anger, envy, jealousy, and the like. It has come to earth to experience these sorts of emotions and learn from them. But after departing from earth, do souls feel any sadness for what they have left behind? Certainly souls carry nostalgia for the good times in all their past physical lives. This is tempered by a state of blissful omniscience and such a heightened sense of well-being that souls feel more alive than when they were on earth. Nevertheless, I have found two sorts of negative emotions that exist within souls, both of which involve a form of sadness. One of them I would call karmic guilt for making very poor choices, especially when others were hurt by these actions. I will treat these aspects later under karma. The other form of sadness for souls is not melancholy, dejection, or a mournful unhappiness in the way life has gone on without them since their departure. Rather, sadness in souls comes from a longing to reunite with the source of their existence. I believe all souls, regardless of their level of development, have this longing to seek perfection for the same reason. The motivating factor for those souls who come to earth is growth. Thus, the trace of sadness I discern in souls is the absence of elements in their immortal character that they must find to make their energy complete. And so, it is a soul's destiny to search for truth in their experiences in order to gain wisdom. It is important for the survivor to know that longing does not compromise a soul's feeling of empathy, sympathy, and compassion for those who grieve for them. Since the immortal character of the soul is no longer encumbered by individual temperament and the chemistry of its last body, it is at peace. Souls have much better things to do than interfere with people on earth. In rare cases, certain souls are so disturbed by an act of injustice against them in life that they won't leave Earth's astral plane after death until they gain some sort of resolution. I will discuss more of this phenomenon under the subject of ghosts. The spiritual conflict with these souls does not include sadness over you finding happiness with someone else, unless, of course, you did something like murder your lover to be with another. The one great advantage the departed soul has over a survivor 
is knowing it is still alive and will be seeing everyone who is meaningful to them again. The integrity of souls involves an all-consuming desire that those they love have the free choice to finish their lives in any way they want. If you wish a soul to come to you, it probably will. Otherwise, your privacy is respected. Besides, a part of your energy which you left behind in the spirit world is always there for them. Since souls lose so many negative emotions upon re-entering the spirit world, it follows that their positive affections also undergo alterations. For instance, souls feel great love, but this love places no conditions upon others for reciprocity because it is given freely. Souls display a universal coherence with each other that is so absolute it is incomprehensible on earth. This is one reason why souls appear to be both abstract and empathetic to us at the same time. I have heard of some cultural traditions which advise that survivors must let the deceased go and not try to communicate with them because souls have more important work to do. Indeed, souls do not want you to become dependent upon communication with them to the detriment of independent decision-making. Yet, many survivors require not only solace but also some sort of approval in the forming of a new relationship. I hope my next case will help dispel the idea that the departed are uninterested in your future. Your privacy is respected by the spirit of your love when you are content. Still, if a prospective course of action, particularly bonding with someone else, leaves you unsettled, they might try to make their opinions known. Because of the nature of soul duality, they are quite capable of performing many tasks at once. This includes a soul's quiet time in solitude, where they focus energy on people they have left behind. Souls do this to bring us greater peace, even when we are not calling on them for help. Case 12 George came to me in a state of some distress over feelings of guilt about a new love in his life. He had been a widower for two years, after a long and happy marriage to Francis. George wondered if she was looking down on him with displeasure over his developing relationship with Dorothy. I was told Dorothy and her deceased husband Frank had been close friends of George and Francis. Nonetheless, George felt his increased attraction to Dorothy might be considered an act of betrayal. I begin this case at the point in our session when George sees Francis after a former life together. Dr. N., now that you have entered the circle of your soulmates, who comes forward first? Subject cries out, Oh, God, it's Frances. It's her. I've missed you so much, dear. She is so beautiful. We have been together from the beginning. Dr. N., you see that you never really lost her in your current life, don't you? And that she will be waiting for you when it is your time to go? Subject Yes, I always felt it, but now I know. Note, George now breaks down and we are unable to continue for a while. During this time, I want my subject to get used to hugging his wife again and talking to her through his superconscious mind. He strongly believes that his guide and my own conspired to bring him to this juncture. I explain that the information he will gain should help him move on in his life with Dorothy. The catalyst for this awareness is evident when we start to identify other members of George's soul group. Dr. N. I want you now to identify the figures standing near Francis. Subject. Brightens. Oh, really? I can't believe... But of course, it makes sense now. Dr. N. What makes sense? Subject, it's Dorothy, and becomes very emotional, and Frank. They are standing together next to Francis, smiling at me. Don't you see? Dr. N., what should I see? Subject, that they have brought us closer together, Dorothy and me. Dr. N., explain why you think this is so. Subject, impatient with me. They are happy that we have found each other in an intimate way. Dorothy has grieved a long time herself over Frank, 
and the grief we both feel is being dispelled by having the company of each other. Dr. N., and you see that all four of you are in the same soul group? Subject, yes, but I had no idea this was true. Dr. N., how are Francis and Dorothy different as souls? Subject, Francis is a very strong teaching soul, while Dorothy is more artistic and creative. Gentle. Dorothy is a peaceful spirit and able to adapt more easily to existing conditions than the rest of us. Dr. N. Now that you have the approval of Francis and Frank, what will Dorothy gain from associating with you as your second wife in this life? Subject. Comfort. Understanding. Love. I can provide her with more protection because I am goal-oriented. I challenge things Dorothy takes for granted. She is very accepting. We have a good balance. Dr. N. Is Dorothy your primary soulmate? Subject. Emphatically. No, it's Francis. Dorothy usually matches with Frank in their lives. But we are all very close. Dr. N. Have you and Dorothy worked together before in other lives? Subject. Yes, but in different situations. She often takes the role of my sister, a niece, or a close friend. Dr. N. Why are you usually matched with Francis as a mate? Subject. Francis and I have been with each other from the beginning. We are so close because we have struggled together, helping each other. She was always able to make me laugh at my serious nature, at my foolishness. When I closed this segment of our session, I felt that George had gained much insight. He was overjoyed at learning that it was no accident he and Dorothy were drawn together. All four souls knew their current timelines in advance. I have had similar information come to me from clients who were not in the same soul group as their new love interest, but were connected as affiliated souls from nearby groups. I find most people know if the person they live with is not a significant soulmate. This does not mean they can't have good relationships with souls out of their group. I will quote the statement from a client who died before his wife in their previous life together. When I reach out to comfort my wife after my death, I do so as a friend and partner. We were not really in love. She was not an intimate soulmate for me, nor was I to her. I have a great deal of respect for her. We needed this relationship to work on those things which played to our individual strengths and weaknesses. So I don't say, I love you, into her mind, because she would know it isn't true. She might then confuse my spirit with her soulmate. Our life contract is done, and if she wishes, I want her to take another person into her heart. Reuniting with those we love. It is fitting that I close this chapter on death with a case illustrating what it is like for soulmates who reunite on the other side. The case involves a widow who meets her husband at the gateway following a long separation. Case 13. Dr. N. Who meets you right after death? Subject. It's him, Eric. Oh, at last, at last, my love. Dr. N., after calming my client, this man is your husband. Subject, yes, we are coming together right after I cross over, before I see our guide. Dr. N., tell me how everything unfolds, including the way feelings of endearment are transmitted between you and Eric. Subject, we start with the eyes from a little distance away, looking deep into each other. The knowing of everything flowing between our minds, of all that we have meant to each other. Our energy gets sucked up into a magnetic pool of indescribable joy, blending the two of us together. Dr. N., at this moment, have you both assumed the physical form you had in the last life? Subject, laughing. Yes, very rapidly we start with the first time we met, how we looked to each other, and move through the phases of body changes during our long marriage. It's not definitive because we don't settle on just one year of our life together. It's more 
swirling energy patterns right now. We even pick up on other bodies we had together in previous lives, too. Dr. N., were you usually female in those lives? Subject. Mostly, yes. Later, we will revert to a mixed gender pattern, because there were good times in our past lives when he was female and I was male. Pause. But it is just fun right now to be the people we were in our last life. Note. My client asks me to please not ask her any more questions for a few minutes. She and Eric embrace, and when she speaks to me again, it is to describe how their energy flowed together. Subject. It is an ecstasy of coalescing. Dr. N. This spiritual passion sounds almost erotic to me. Subject. Of course, but it is so much more. I can't really describe it, but the rapture we feel for each other comes from all our contact together in hundreds of lives, combined with memories of the blissful state we spend reunited between lives. Dr. N. And how does the blending of your energy with your husband make you feel afterward? Subject. Bursts out laughing. Like really wonderful sex, only better. Then more seriously. You must understand that I died as an 83-year-old sick woman. I was tired. It was a long life, and I was a cold stove that needed warming up. Dr. N. Cold stove? Subject, yes. I need energy rejuvenation. There is always a transfer of positive energy when we are met by our guides, or by someone we love. Eric sparks up my tired energy. He lights a fire inside me to make me whole again. Dr. N., when this meeting is over, what do the two of you do? Subject, our teacher comes to welcome me back, and I am escorted through the mist to our center. When a subject tells me that re-entering the spirit world has the effect of being made whole again, this requires qualification. We receive an infusion of new energy from soulmates and guides who may also transfer part of the energy we left behind back into us as well. However, as I said when discussing spiritual longing, complete wholeness will not take place until our work is done. Despite this, being restored to what we were before the life began is like feeling whole once again. A subject put it this way, Death is like waking up after a long sleep where you had just a muddled awareness, the release you feel is one that comes after crying, only here you are not crying. I have tried to show death from the perspective of the soul in order to ease the pain of those left behind. As Plato said, once free of the body, the soul is able to see truth clearly because it is more pure than before and recalls the pure ideas which it knew before. Survivors must learn to function again without the physical presence of the person they loved, by trusting the departed soul is still with them. Acceptance of loss comes one day at a time. Healing is a progression of mental steps that begins with having faith you are not truly alone. In order to complete the life contract you made in advance with the departed, it is necessary to rejoin the rest of humanity as an active participant. You will see your love again soon enough. I am hopeful my years of research into the life we lead as souls may assist survivors in recognizing that death only exchanges one reality for another in the long continuum of existence. 3. Earthly Spirits Astral Planes when my hypnosis subjects describe their ascent into the spirit world as rising through misty layers of translucent light, I am reminded of the astral planes we read about in Eastern texts. I must confess that I am not at all attracted to the rigid stair-step quality of exactly seven planes of existence, from low to high, which come from Eastern spiritual philosophy. This is due to the fact that my clients see no evidence of all these planes— it is a human failing to label concepts as a means of codification. In my descriptions about the spirit world, 
I am as guilty of this practice as everyone else. Perhaps it is best that we simply take those precepts which make spiritual sense to us and reject the rest, regardless of the age of certain ideas or who tells us they are true. The reason for my objections to a rigid formula of specific planes of existence, from earth to a godhead, is that these states are unnecessary inhibitors. All my research with subjects in a higher state of consciousness indicates to me that upon death we go directly from one astral plane around earth through the gateway into the spirit world. It does not matter if my subject is a young soul or a highly advanced older soul. Right after death they all tell me their soul passes through a dense atmosphere of light around the astral plane of earth. This light has patches of darkish gray, but no impenetrable black zones. Many describe a tunnel effect. All souls from earth then quickly move into the bright light of the spirit world. This is a single ethereal space without zones or barriers around it. In the spirit world itself, all the so-called spaces or places available to the reincarnating soul are congruent. For instance, the Akashic record traditions of Eastern thought don't appear to my subjects as being on some fourth causal plane separate from other functional areas. My subjects call these records life books, which are stored in symbolic libraries that are seen adjacent to other spiritual places. I acknowledge there is much beyond the spiritual experience of the reincarnating soul and therefore out of my range of inquiry. Perhaps the whole idea of cosmic planes is basically an attempt to conceptualize stages of ethereal awareness as opposed to movement prevented by barriers. Historically, specific demarcations of planes that enclose the underworld, designed for certain unworthy souls, have been more prevalent in human thinking. I will discuss this further in Chapter 6. When my subjects tell of traveling interdimensionally, I suppose one could interpret this as soul movement through planes. The term plane is not used nearly as much as the words levels, edges, borders, and divisions, except when a client refers to Earth. People in hypnosis report that within the astral plane surrounding Earth, alternate or coexistent realities are part of our physical world. Apparently, within these realities... Non-material beings can be seen by some people in our physical reality. I have been told of multitudes of interdimensional spheres that are used by souls for training and recreation from the spirit world. Spiritual boundaries can be as small as the glass-like divisions between cluster groups or as large as the zones between universes. I am told all spatial zones have vibrational properties that allow for soul passage only when their energy waves are attuned to the proper frequency. The more developed souls explain that absolute time as we know it does not seem to exist in these areas. Does the physical world of Earth have similar characteristics that are unseen by most of us? I had a thoughtful client who wrote me the following after his session. Working with you has made me realize that our reality is like a movie projector showing us images on a three-dimensional screen of sky, mountains, and seas. If a second projector, with its own imprint of alternating light frequencies and space-time sequences, was synchronized with the first, both realities could exist simultaneously, with material and non-material entities in the same zone. If what people in a trance state tell me about this system has validity, etheric beings would be capable of existing in different realities within the same astral plane surrounding Earth, indeed on Earth itself. The vibrational energy forces around Earth are in constant flux. It seems to me that if these magnetic fields change density, they would produce cyclic variations over centuries of human time. Therefore, we may be more or less receptive to viewing spirits on Earth in any given century. Perhaps the ancients really could see more than we do in the modern world. Nature Spirits On a national TV show, a woman reported that she had seen elves in her vineyard. She said that in the beginning she only heard them and was a little concerned about her sanity. In time, 
She was able to talk to them, and a few became visible to her. She described them as being about two feet high, with pointed ears and wearing baggy pants. Of course, many people in her area thought she was crazy when this news got out. The advice she received from these beings about what to use in her soil to increase the quantity and quality of grape production over that of the neighboring farms soon caused many of them to take her more seriously. When the story was released, this woman was invited to have her brainwaves tested. When her senses were stimulated, it was found that portions of her brain were capable of a much higher energy output than normal. I had a client who also claimed to have such abilities. She was an old soul, and in a deep trance state said, Fairy folk were here long before the rise of our civilizations, and have never left. Most of us do not see them today, as in ancient times, because they are so old, their density has become very light, while our earth bodies still have heavy energy. I questioned her further, and she added, while a rock has a 1D density, a tree would be a 2D, and our bodies are at the 3D level. Thus, the beings of nature would be invisible, with a transparency registering between 4D and 6D. When I think of the woman who saw elves in her vineyard, I see a picture in my mind. If we could look at Earth with X-ray vision, it might resemble a series of overlaid clear plastic topographical sheets, these vibrational energy layers vary in density and denote alternate realities to me. Certain gifted people might be able to see within these layers, but most of us are unable to do so. It is also my belief that much of our folklore comes from the memories souls have of their experiences on other physical and mental worlds. What they have to say about these experiences, while under hypnosis, conforms in some respects to the myths and legends of Earth. These soul associations include spirits in trees and plants, as well as connections to the elements of air, water, and fire. Folklore and soul memory will be explored further in later chapters. Ghosts Many researchers into the paranormal have written about ghosts. I do not consider myself proficient in this field, although I have had some exposure with souls as ghosts. At my lectures, I am often asked how benevolent spirit guides can allow these beings to wander around, lost, unhappy, and alone. My contribution to the study of ghosts will be to review what I feel are some misconceptions and to explain this phenomenon from the perspective of the ghost rather than from those who see them on earth. When I began to devote my hypnotherapy practice exclusively to the study of life between lives, it took years before a client came to me who had been a ghost for an appreciable amount of time after a former life. I don't consider short-timers ghosts in the traditional sense. For instance, I had a client who died young in a schoolhouse fire while saving the children. This teacher stayed around town for some months afterward, just checking on the kids and other people who were grieving at her untimely death. When I asked what prompted her to finally leave, she said, Oh, eventually I got bored. I have come to the conclusion that only a small fraction of souls have ever been ghosts, beyond the normal amount of time it takes for the new discarnate to adjust before leaving Earth. I don't believe we are being haunted by that many ghosts around the world. The cases which follow will demonstrate that our guides do not compel or coerce us to move into the spirit world if our unfinished business is so overpowering that we do not want to leave Earth's astral plane. I find this is especially true if the soul has a permissive guide. Some guides have much more of a hands-off approach. Then, too, our guides typically don't make personal appearances next to us at the moment of death at ground zero. For most souls, the pulling sensation right after death is gentle and only grows more deliberate as we leave Earth's astral plane. There is no question that higher beings are instantly aware of our death. Yet the wishes of the deceased are respected. Keep in mind that time means nothing in the spirit world. Discarnates don't have a linear clock in their heads, so staying behind for days, months, or years doesn't have the same relevance as with incarnates. 
a ghost who has haunted an English castle for four hundred years, and finally returns to the spirit world, may feel in spirit time this amounted to forty days, or even forty hours. Some people have the misconception that ghosts don't know they are dead, or how to escape their situation. Yes, in a sense they are trapped, but this is a condition of mental obstruction, rather than any material hindrance. Souls are not lost in some confined astral plane, and they do know they have made a transition out of life on Earth. The ghost's confusion lies in the obsessive attachment they have to places, people, and events where they can't let go. These actions of self-displacement are voluntary, but special guides called Redeemer Masters constantly watch for signs that the known disturbed spirits are ready to exit. We have the right to self-determination, even with our death experience. Spiritual guides will honor poor decision-making. From what I have been able to observe, ghosts are less mature spirits who have trouble freeing themselves from earthly contaminations. This is particularly true if their stay in limbo is for prolonged periods in earth years. The reasons for staying behind are varied. Perhaps the life ended in an unexpected manner, which caused a deviation from a major path. These souls may feel their free will has been thwarted in some way. Quite often there was a terrible trauma connected to the ghost's death. Perhaps they want to try and protect a person they care about from danger. In 1994, a young woman driving at night on a road not far from my house in the Sierra Nevada mountains tumbled down a steep embankment and was killed. No one had seen the accident or noticed the wreck fifty feet down the hill where for five days her three-year-old son clung to life. This accident attracted national attention when it was reported that a passing motorist saw a ghostly apparition of a nude young woman lying on the highway directly above the wreckage. This was a dramatic way for the ghost to be noticed, and it worked, because her child was found just in time to save his life. I find the underlying cause behind disturbed spirits to be a sudden change in their planned karmic direction that they perceive to be not only unexpected, but unjust. The most common cases of ghosts appear to involve souls who were murdered or wronged by another person in life. My next case begins as a typical ghost story, but then reveals how these matters are resolved constructively for the ghost. The Abandoned Soul Belinda came to see me because of an overwhelming sense of sadness she was unable to comprehend based upon her current life experience. During my intake interview, I learned she was 47 and had never been married. She moved to California from the East Coast after a stormy breakup with a man called Stuart some 20 years before. Belinda cared for Stuart, but she had broken off their engagement after making a decision to change her life and come west to pursue a new career. She asked Stuart to come with her, but he did not want to leave his job and his family. Stuart pleaded with Belinda to marry him and stay in the area where they had both grown up, but she refused. Belinda told me that Stuart was devastated by her leaving him, but he wouldn't follow her. Eventually, Stuart married someone else. Some years later, Belinda said she met Bert, and they had an intensely passionate relationship for a while, but eventually he left her for another woman. I wondered if this was the source of Belinda's unexplained sadness, but she told me no, she had been hurt, but that it was a good thing she hadn't married Bert. Belinda now realized that besides his being an unfaithful lover, she and Bert were temperamentally unsuited. Belinda added that, for some reason, long before her relationships with men began, she had these strange feelings of abandonment and loss. Case 14 it is my custom to move subjects into their most immediate past life before we enter the spirit world. This hypnosis technique allows for a more natural mental passage following a death scene. I asked Belinda to pick a critical scene to open our discussion about her former life. She chose one of great mental anguish. She said she was a young woman by the name of Elizabeth living on a large farm near Bath, England in the year 1897. Elizabeth was on her knees holding the coattails of her husband, Stanley, who was dragging her through the front doorway of their manor house. 
After five years of marriage, Stanley was leaving her. Dr. N. What is Stanley saying to you at this moment? Subject now begins to sob. He says, I'm sorry about this, but I need to get away from this farm and go out to see the rest of the world. Dr. N. How do you respond, Elizabeth? Subject. I am imploring, begging Stanley not to leave because I love him so much and that I will try harder to make him happy here. My arms are aching from holding his coat and being dragged down the hall to the front steps. Dr. N. What does your husband say? Subject, still crying. Stanley says, It's not you, really. I'm just sick of this place. I'll be back. Dr. N. Do you think he means it? Subject. Oh, I know a part of him loves me in some way, but his need to escape this life and all he has known since he was a boy is too overpowering. After this statement, my subject's body begins to shake uncontrollably. Dr. N., after soothing her a bit. Tell me what is happening now, Elizabeth. Subject. It's about over. I can't hold him any longer. My arms are not strong enough. They hurt. Subject rubs her arms. I fall down the rest of the steps in front of the servants. I don't care. Stanley gets on his horse and rides away, while I watch helplessly. Dr. N. Do you ever see him again? Subject. No. I only know he went to Africa. Dr. N. How do you maintain yourself, Elizabeth? Subject. He left me the estate, but I do not manage it well. I let most of the staff and workers go. In time, we have almost no livestock, and I am barely subsisting. But I cannot leave the farm. I must wait for him should he finally decide to come back to me. Dr. N. Elizabeth. I now want you to go to the last day of your life. Give me the year and the circumstances leading up to this day. Subject. It is 1919. Subject is 52. And I am dying of influenza. I haven't put up much resistance in the last few weeks because I have just been existing. My loneliness and sorrow, the struggle to keep the farm going, my heart is broken. I now take Elizabeth through her death scene and attempt to bring her into the light. It is no use because she remains grounded to the farm. I soon discover this rather young soul is about to become a ghost. Dr. N. Why are you resisting moving up away from Earth's astral plane? Subject. I won't go. I can't leave yet. Dr. N. Why not? Subject. I must wait longer at the farm for Stanley. Dr. N. But you have waited for twenty-two years already, and he has not returned. Subject. Yes, I know. Still, I just can't bring myself to go. Dr. N. What do you do now? Subject. I hover as a spirit. I talk to Elizabeth about her ghostly appearance and behavior around the farm. She does not zero in on Stanley's energy vibrations to locate him anywhere in the world, as an experienced soul would do. Further questioning indicates that Elizabeth has the idea that if she can scare away any potential buyers, the estate might remain in the family. Indeed, the property does sit idle with no new occupants, because everyone in the district knows it is haunted. Elizabeth tells me she flies around the manor house crying over her abandonment. Dr. N. How long do you wait for Stanley in Earth years? Subject. Uh, four years. Dr. N. Does this seem like a long time for you? What do you do? Subject. It is nothing. A few weeks. I cry and moan over my sadness. I can't help it. I know this scares people, especially when I knock things over. Dr. N. Why do you want to scare people who have done you no harm? Subject. To express my displeasure at what was done to me. Dr. N. Please explain to me how all this comes to an end. Subject. I am... called. Dr. N. Oh, 
you have asked for a release from this sad situation? Subject. Long pause. Well, not actually. Sort of. But he knows I am about ready. He comes and says to me, Don't you think this is enough? Dr. N., who says this to you, and what happens? Subject. The Redeemer of Lost Souls calls to me, and I move further away from Earth with him, and we talk while waiting. Dr. N., just a minute. Is this your spirit guide? Subject. Smiles for the first time. No, we are waiting for my guide. This spirit is Doni. He rescues souls like me. That's his job. Dr. N., what does Doni look like, and what does he say to you? Subject. Laughs. He looks like a little gnome with a wrinkled face and a top hat which is all beat up. His whiskers shake when he talks to me. He tells me if I want to stay longer I can, but wouldn't it be more fun to go home and see Stanley there? He is very comical and makes me laugh, but he is so gentle and wise. He takes me by the hand, and we move to a beautiful place to talk more. Dr. N., tell me about this place, and what happens to you next? Subject, well, this is a place for grieving souls like me, and it looks like a beautiful meadow with flowers. Doni tells me to be joyful, and he infuses my energy with love and happiness, and purifies my mind. He lets me play like a child again among the flowers, and tells me to chase the butterflies while he rests in the sun. Dr. N., it sounds wonderful. How long does all this go on? Subject, rather put off by my question. For as long as I want. Dr. N., during this time, does Donnie talk to you about Stanley and your behavior as a ghost? Subject, reacts with distaste. He absolutely does not do that. The Redeemer is not Titian. Subject's guide. Those questions will come later. This is my time to rest. Doni's old face is so full of kindness and love. He never scolds. He just encourages me to play. His job is to bring my soul back to health by helping me cleanse my mind. After Elizabeth's energy is rejuvenated, Doni escorts her to Titian and kisses her goodbye. Then the preliminary evaluations begin as with a normal orientation for someone returning to the spirit world. I was able to access this conference with Elizabeth Belinda and it was instructive. In the beginning, she stated that her life as an abandoned wife was wasted. Certainly, Elizabeth pined away much of her life in suffering without making adjustments or accepting change. Under Titian's guidance, she saw that this lesson was not wasted. Belinda today is a very independent and productive woman who has weathered many emotional storms. By now, I am sure the listener has figured out that Stanley is Stuart today. When I relate this part of the story to people, some say to me, Oh, good, she was able to turn the tables on that bastard with the same treatment to get revenge for what he did to her. This thinking shows how we misunderstand karmic lessons. The souls of Elizabeth and Stanley volunteered to assume their roles today as Belinda and Stuart. Stuart needed to feel the emotional pain of what he had wrought on Elizabeth. As Stanley, he had made a commitment of marriage in a culture and time when women were quite dependent upon their husbands. Because his action to leave her was swift and uncompromising, it was particularly brutal. This does not excuse Elizabeth, who took no responsibility for making changes in her life. Her suffering and non-acceptance of the situation was so extreme, she ultimately became a ghost. By assuming Stanley's role in her current life, the soul of Belinda had to learn what motivated Stanley's feeling of entrapment in an undesirable location. Belinda was not Stuart's wife when she left the East Coast, so the commitment was not quite the same as Stuart had with her in their former life when he was Stanley. Yet in this life they were lovers again, and Stuart felt forsaken by Belinda's desire to leave their town, friends, and family to seek adventure and opportunity elsewhere. Because she had the courage to do this alone, Belinda's soul now has acquired the insight that Stanley did not leave her out of a malicious desire to inflict emotional pain. Stanley wanted freedom, 
and so did Belinda. Belinda has carried the mental imprint of this past life into her life today. From a karmic standpoint, Belinda has a dose of residual sorrow as Elizabeth, which she was unable to comprehend until our session. Belinda told me she still thinks about Stuart, and he probably cannot forget her, since she was his first love. They are soulmates in the same group, and I think it is likely the two of them will assume a new role together in their next life, balancing what they have learned in the last two lives. For those of you who are curious why Belinda had to endure the brief, unrequited love affair with Bert, this was a test. Bert is another member of the same soul group, and he volunteered to trigger Belinda's soul memories of being Elizabeth to see if she had learned to stand up to the emotional pain of a broken heart. Bert's actions also served as a wake-up call for Belinda to realize in her current life how Stuart felt when she left him. The blade of karma cuts both ways. Spiritual Duality Some years ago, a magazine article recounted the travels of an American woman who was driving through the English countryside and felt inexplicably drawn to a small side road away from her intended destination. Soon she came to a deserted old manor house. The woman was told by the caretaker the house was haunted by a ghost who looked very much like her. Walking around the grounds, she felt an eerie connection to something. Presumably, she was there to help release herself. The two portions of her soul could have been drawn to each other in the same mysterious way that two people living parallel lives with one soul might be if there was a compelling purpose. In Chapter 1, I touched upon the duality of souls and how they are able to divide their energy to live more than one life at a time. A portion of the energy of most souls never leaves the spirit world during their incarnations. I'll discuss soul division further in the next chapter, but splitting soul energy is particularly relevant to the study of ghosts. In my last case, even though Elizabeth was in limbo for a while as a ghost, another part of her energy remained in the spirit world, working on lessons and interacting with other souls. That other portion may also incarnate again, and move on to a new life, which is what I believe happened with the woman who found the haunted house. I disagree with some ghost authorities who state that ghostly forms only represent an earthly shell without a soul's core of consciousness. There are life cycles when souls choose to take less energy than they should into a human body. However, even if they become ghosts, such souls are far more than an empty shell of energy. One would think that the balance of a ghost's energy remaining in the spirit world ought to be more helpful to their disturbed alter ego still hanging around Earth. From what I hear, most immature souls who cross over are unable to perform this transfer and integration of energy by themselves. The following excerpt is a report I received from the soulmate of a ghost. This ghost is a young level one soul who was my subject's first husband. Case 15. Dr. N. You have told me that your first husband, Bob, was a ghost after his last life. Please explain the circumstances here. Subject. Bob became a ghost because he was killed early in our marriage in that life. He was so overcome with despair and concern for me, he wouldn't leave. Dr. N. I see. Can you tell me approximately how much of his total energy he carried with him into that life? Subject nods her head in assent. Bob had only about a quarter of his energy, and it was not enough for him in this mental crisis. He misjudged. Stops. Dr. N., do you think that if Bob had taken more of his energy to allow for this contingency, he might not have become a ghost? Subject, oh, I can't answer that, but I think it would have made him stronger, more resistant to sorrow. Dr. N., then why did he take so little energy to Earth? Subject. Well, because he wanted to be more engaged with his work in the spirit world. Dr. N. I'm confused about why Bob's guide didn't just make him take more energy to Earth. Subject. Shakes her head negatively. No, no. We are not pushed around that way. We are free to make our choices. And Bob didn't have to become a ghost, you know. 
Bob was advised to take more, but he is stubborn and he was also considering another life at the same time. A parallel life. Dr. N. Let me make sure I understand. Bob underestimated his capacity to function more normally in a crisis, with a body having only 25% of his energy capacity? Subject, sadly. I'm afraid so. Dr. N. Even though in death that body was gone? Subject, it didn't matter. The effects were still with him, and he didn't have enough strength to combat the circumstances. Dr. N. How long did Bob stay a ghost before the rest of his energy was restored to him in the spirit world? Subject. Not long, about thirty years. He couldn't seem to help himself. Lack of experience. Part of his lesson. Then our teacher was called by... You know, those beings who patrol Earth watching over the disturbed ones. To go get the rest of him to come home. Dr. N. They have been called the redeemers of lost souls by some people. Subject. That's a good name for them. Only Bob's soul wasn't lost exactly. Only tormented. Souls in Seclusion My next case involves a more advanced subject who provided me with details about entities who are not ghosts but won't go home after death. As the case unfolds, we will see that there are two motivating factors that drive these types of souls into seclusion. Case 16. Dr. N. Are there people who die who are not ready to return to the spirit world? Subject. Yes, some souls who are released from their physical bodies don't want to leave Earth. Dr. N. I suppose they are all ghosts? Subject. No, but they can be if that is their desire. Most are not. They simply don't want to be in contact with anyone. Dr. N. And their spiritual energy does not go home right after death? Subject. That's right, except there is a part of their energy which never left the spirit world. Dr. N. So I have heard. But let me ask if you consider these secluded souls as short-timers, or do they stay in limbo for a long time in earth years? Subject. It varies. Some want to return as quickly as possible in a new body. These souls don't want to give up their physical form for any length of time. They are different from most of us who want to rest and go home to study. Many of this type have been real front-line warriors on Earth. They want to maintain a continuity with their physical life. Dr. N. Well, it is my understanding that our guides won't permit us to be in some kind of holding pattern near Earth and go right into a new life. Don't these souls know they must go through the normal process of returning back to their groups, receiving counseling, studying their lessons, and taking some part in the selection of a new body? Subject. Laughs. You're right. But the guides don't force those in extreme distress to return home until they see the benefits of doing so. Dr. N., Yes, but they won't give them a new body right away until after some sort of period of readjustment. Subject. Shrugs. Yes, that's true. Dr. N. Is it also true that other disturbed souls don't want to go back to Earth and won't go back where they belong in the spirit world either? Subject. That's right. Another type. Dr. N. But if both soul types don't prowl around Earth as discarnates, bothering people as ghosts, should I be calling them disturbed when all they want is to be left alone? Subject. They are divergent. Their actions are the result of something unfinished, traumatic, overwhelming. They are unwilling to let go, and this conduct is not usual. They won't talk to their teachers because of the extent of their unhappiness. Dr. N., why don't their guides just take charge and pull them up deeper into the spirit world, despite their resistance? Subject, if souls were forced to do what is right for them, they would learn nothing from getting into a funk and shutting themselves up from everyone. Dr. N., okay, but I still wonder why the souls who want to come back right away, with no stopovers in the spirit world, 
can't just be given a new body immediately. Subject. Can't you see that placing a disturbed soul into a new body would be totally unfair to a baby just starting life? These souls have a right to be in seclusion, but they will eventually make the decision to ask for assistance. They must come to the conclusion they can't progress alone. Being given a new body won't help them. Dr. N., where do the souls go who don't want to wander the earth as ghosts but won't go home? Subject, ruefully. It's any space they want to create for themselves. They design their own reality with memories of a physical life. Some souls live in nice places like a garden setting. Others, those who have harmed people, for instance, design terrible spaces for themselves, like a prison or a room with no windows. In these spaces they box themselves in so they can't experience much light or make contact with anyone. It is a self-imposed punishment. Dr. N. I have heard that disturbed souls, the ones associated with evil, are taken into seclusion in the spirit world. Subject. That's correct. But at least they are ready to face the music and have their energy healed properly, with love and care. Dr. N. Can you give me some indication of how our guides deal with all types of souls in self-imposed exile? Subject. They give them time to sweat it out. This is a challenge for teachers. They know these souls are concerned about their evaluations and the reactions from their soul groups. They are full of negative energy and not thinking clearly. It may take many reassurances by those who wish to help them before these souls agree to give up their self-imposed places of confinement. Dr. N. I assume there are as many techniques of persuasion as there are guides? Subject. Sure, depending upon the range of skill. Some teachers will not go near a disturbed student until that soul is so sick of being in seclusion they voluntarily call for help. This can take quite a while. Pause, then continues. Other teachers drop in often for chats. Dr. N. Eventually, will all these disturbed souls release themselves? Subject. Pause. Let's put it this way. Eventually, all will be released one way or another through different forms of encouragement, <laughs> laughs, or persuasion. Those of you who are familiar with my work know that I have strong convictions about the influence soul memory has on human thought. The isolation and solitude of souls expressed in Case 16 might well give one the impression of a Christian purgatory as a place of atonement. Could this religious concept have sprung from the fragmented soul memories of seclusion in the spirit world, only to be subverted on earth? There are similarities and great differences between my findings about soul seclusion and purgatory as defined by the Church. Christian doctrine has purgatory as a state of self-purification for those who must eliminate all traces of sin before proceeding on to heaven. I hear that some souls in seclusion undergo self-cleansing, while others may require energy restoration. However, we don't come out of seclusion totally purified, or there would be no need to reincarnate again. Also, soul confinement is not banishment. In recent years, the less conservative elements of the Christian Church do not stress hell as much as in the past. Nevertheless, the Church still rejects universalism, the belief that everyone goes to heaven. To them, souls who die in a state of unrepentant mortal sin bypass purgatory and descend into hell, where they suffer the punishments of eternal fire. To be eternally damned, according to the Church, is a separation from God as opposed to those who are blessed. The Christian churches simply do not accept the concept that everything is forgivable in the afterlife. In my experience, all souls are repentant because they hold themselves accountable for their choices. From all I have learned, soul energy cannot be destroyed or made non-functional, but it can be reshaped and purified of earthly contamination. Souls who demand to be left in solitude after death on earth are not self-destructing. 
Rather, some feel isolation is necessary out of concern for contaminating other souls with negative energy. There are also souls who don't feel contaminated, but they are not ready to be consoled by anyone. The important thing to keep in mind is that souls have the ownership of their energy, and most ask their guides to be taken to the centers of healing and rejuvenation in the spirit world. These are therapeutic areas away from their soul groups, where there is solitude and time for personal reflection. However, this is a form of directed therapy. The disturbed souls Case 16 talked about had not yet chosen to receive help. All my case histories indicate to me that after death, we have the right to refuse assistance from our spiritual masters for as long as we wish. I have been asked at lectures if the places of self-imposed exile are lower planes or lower worlds. I can't help but feel these ideas come from fear-based dogma. Perhaps it's a question of semantics. I think a better translation of this state is a self-imposed space, a vacuum of subjective reality designed by the soul who wants to be alone. Separated space, away from the soul's spiritual center, is one of its own making. I don't see these souls as being lost in some realm divided from the spirit world where others reside. The disjunction is mental. Souls of silence know they are immortal, but they feel impotent. Consider what they do in solitude without help. They relive their acts over and over again, playing back all the karmic implications of what they have done to others and what has been done to them in their last life. They may have harmed others or been harmed by them. Quite often I hear they feel victimized by events over which they had little control. They are sad and mad at the same time. They have no interaction with their soul groups. These souls suffer from self-recrimination and restricted insight. I must admit these conditions fall within some of the definitions of purgatory. Sartre said, We have an imaginary self of the world with tendencies and desires, and a real self. To this statement I would add that of William Blake. Perception of our true self may threaten mergence with that self. In their space, the souls of solitude have given up their imaginary self for a large dose of self-flagellation. Solitude and quiet self-analysis is an important and normal aspect of soul life within the spirit world. The difference here is that these disturbed souls are not yet ready to seek relief from their torment by asking for help, moving forward and making changes. It's a good thing that these souls make up only a small fraction of the population of souls crossing over each day. Discarnates Who Visit Earth There are entities who travel to Earth as tourists and have never incarnated on our planet. Some are quite advanced, while others are maladapts. The character of these beings has been described to me as friendly, helpful, and peaceful, or distant, aggravating, and even contentious. For thousands of years, I believe they have been considered in our folklore as beings with the capacity to create both fear and enchantment. Our mythology alludes to the differences between light beings who are airy and whimsical and darker beings who are heavy, with ugly temperaments. Some of these pre-Christian legends have spilled over into current religious beliefs of a light or dark tableau of grace or violence in the afterlife. Quite a number of my subjects have told me that between their lives on earth, they travel as discarnates to other worlds, both in and out of our dimension. Some explain that they see other non-physical entities on these trips. This is why it has been surprising to me that only occasionally do I receive small amounts of information from clients about encountering other light beings on Earth. My clients see them when they decide to visit Earth as discarnates themselves between lives. The reports are intriguing, as the next case illustrates. Case 17 Dr. N. Since you have described to me how much you enjoy traveling to both physical and mental worlds between your lives, I am curious what you know about other beings you might see when you come to Earth. Subject 
They float through our reality here on Earth, just as I do in other dimensions. Dr. N., do you know many souls who regularly incarnate on Earth that visit here like yourself? Subject. No, as a matter of fact, it's not all that common, but I like to come. Many of my friends enjoy a change in scenery between lives and stay away from Earth. When I come here, sometimes I see strange beings I don't know. Dr. N., what do they look like? Subject. Odd. Strange shapes, wispy or dense. Not human-looking. Dr. N., let's talk about this. You have told me of the ability souls have in the spirit world to project a human form. What do you and your friends look like as spirits on Earth? Subject. Oh, rather the same. But on a dense world such as Earth, we shift more on the physical side, to add flavor to what we once were here. Dr. N., you mean you are in more of a corporeal state? Subject. Um, yes, sort of. On worlds such as Earth, we are more defined around the edges, the way we outline a human body in a transparent fashion as soft, diffused light. In the spirit world, when we assume body features, say, of a former life, we glow all over with full-strength energy. Dr. N., can a non-physical being, even in a diffused state, be visible to living inhabitants? Subject, chuckles. Oh, yes. But only certain people can see us as apparitions, and then not always. Dr. N., why is that? Subject, it has to do with their level of receptivity, of perception, at certain moments when we are in their area. Dr. N., if you will, please put yourself in the position of a transparent light being on Earth and tell me what you do here. I want you to include any non-human spirits you see who have had no incarnation experiences on our planet. Subject, happily. As visitors, we soar through the mountains and valleys, the cities and small towns. For us, there is a vicarious picking up of the energy of Earth's struggles. It's always interesting to bump into different kinds of beings who are also on tour here. They know Earth's inhabitants are afraid of us, and most of these beings would like to dispel the fear. Yet, those of us from Earth no, we can't afford to get entangled with people's lives in any major way. Dr. N., meaning that some beings from other worlds have no such reservations? Subject, yes. Dr. N., I assume by entangled, you mean interfering in someone's karmic path? Subject, well, yes. Dr. N., but why not help people if you can? Subject, abruptly and maybe with some guilt. Look, we are not guides assigned to Earth. We are only visitors, as are the others we see here occasionally. It's a vacation trip for all of us. If we come across a condition going bad, we might take a moment to briefly turn ahead toward a better alternative path. We do get pleasure out of nudging people to act in their better interest rather than turning the wrong way. Dr. N., if you happen to be in the right place at the right time? Subject, right, to give a gentle push in a better direction at a crucial moment. Raises voice, no fixing of major trouble spots, you understand. Dr. N., then you would be considered as good spirits? Subject, laughs, <laughs> as opposed to what? Dr. N., in an attempt to draw this subject out. To bad spirits who interfere with life forms for the pleasure of doing harm. Subject, abruptly. Who told you this? There are no evil spirits, only inept ones, and those who are careless and indifferent. Dr. N. How about sad spirits, or ones who are disoriented, or playful spirits? Can't they cause harm? Subject, oh, yes, but it is not premeditated evil. 
pause, and then adds, Not all of us are in the same category, soaring around Earth on a lark. Dr. N. That's what I was getting at. I'm thinking of ghosts. Subject. These are spirits grounded here by their own volition. Dr. N. How about the spirits who are strangers to Earth? Subject. Pause. There are other spirits who travel interdimensionally, who we consider to be maladapts. They do not seem to have any sensitivity to Earth. They are not knowledgeable about human beings. Dr. N. Coaxing. And can they cause problems for the living? Subject. Edgy. Yes, sometimes. Although it might be unintentional. They are not bad or evil. Just clumsy, mischievous children. The younger light beings can get lost between and within dimensions. Their amusements distract them. We consider them as naughty youngsters. These pranksters think Earth is their playground, where they can engage in devilish behavior with susceptible, gullible people and scare the hell out of them. They have a hilarious time before they are caught by one of the rovers, tracker guides, sent to recapture these truants. Dr. N. Is this a common occurrence? Subject. Actually, I don't think so. They are like children who escape from the watchful eyes of parents once in a while. Dr. N. So you don't see malevolent spirits directed here by some demonic force? Subject. Promptly. No. Uh, sometimes we might run into a dark... Heavy entity who is disoriented by the Earth sphere. This place is dense, but they come from places even more dense. Anyway, they want to cling to us because they don't know what they're doing. We call them the heavies because of their lack of mobility. Dr. N., what about the spirits you spoke of who are just indifferent to people on Earth? Subject, deep sigh. Yeah, they can scare people. This is because some of them have a disruptive nature. They are not considerate. Dr. N. Bulls in a china shop? Subject. Yeah, no adaptation to local customs. Dr. N. And in these cases, with different types of spirits who might be aggravating to the people here, do you try to intervene in some way? Subject. Yes, if we come across them acting like rogues, we put a stop to it and try and push them away. This is very infrequent. Most out-of-worlders are serious and respectful. Pause. I want to stress that we are not philanthropists. This is our recreation time, and we want to be free of responsibility. Dr. N. Okay, then. Why would an inept spirit of any sort come to Earth for whatever reason and be allowed to cause trouble, even inadvertently, for the people living here. Do their guides lack good parenting skills? Subject, unruffled. Well, too much monitoring makes for dull children. If they were on a tight leash, how would they learn? They are not going to be allowed to destroy or do great harm. Dr. N. One last question. Do you think that all the kinds of spirits we have been talking about exist in large numbers swarming all over Earth? Subject. Not at all. Compared to Earth's population, only a tiny fraction. Judging by my own experience here, there are times when only a few are around, and I may not see them at all. It is not a constant thing. It's more cyclic. There is a mystery to that which is invisible to the living when only our senses tell us something is there. I wonder if spiritual travelers don't engender memories within us of recognition of what we once were and will be again. Demons or Devas I think it is fitting that I close this chapter with a summary of some misconceptions we have about the existence of evil spirits, good spirits, and spiritual influences on earth. If I step rather heavily on any pet theories of the listener, please understand that my statements come from the reports of many hypnosis subjects in my practice. These subjects do not see the devil or demonic spirits floating around earth. 
What they do feel when they are spirits is an abundance of negative human energy exuding the intense emotions of anger, hate, and fear. These disruptive thought patterns are attracted to the consciousness of other negative thinkers who collect and disseminate even more disharmony. All this dark energy in the air works to the detriment of positive wisdom on earth. The ancients thought demons were flying beings who occupied the regions between heaven and earth and were not particularly wicked. The early Christian church elevated demons to the status of evil rulers of darkness. As fallen angels, they were able to disguise themselves as messengers of God rather than Satan in order to deceive humans. I think it is fair to say that within the more liberal religious communities today, demons represent our own inner misguided passions that can get us into trouble. In all my years of working with souls, never once have I had a subject who was possessed by another spirit, unfriendly or otherwise. When I made this statement at one lecture, a man raised his hand and said, That is all very well, O great guru, but until you have placed everyone in the world under hypnosis, don't tell me about the absence of demonic forces. Of course, this is a valid argument against my hypothesis that such things as soul possession, evil demons, the devil, and hell don't exist. Nevertheless, I can come to no other conclusion when all of my subjects— even those who came to me with conscious beliefs in demonic forces reject the existence of such beings when they see themselves as spirits. Once in a while, a client comes to me convinced they have been possessed by an alien entity or some sort of malevolent spirit. I have had other clients who believe an evil curse has been placed upon them from some past life behavior. As my hypnosis regression session moves into the superconscious mind of these people, Typically, we find one of three conditions. One, almost always the fear proves to be absolutely groundless. Two, occasionally a friendly spirit, often a dead relative, has been trying to reach them. My distraught client has misinterpreted the intent of this spirit who only wished to bring comfort and love. There has been miscommunication between the sender and receiver. Souls have little trouble with telepathy between themselves, but this does not mean all souls are adept communicators with incarnated people. 3. Very rarely, a disturbed, inept spirit has made contact because of some unresolved karmic issues they have on earth. We saw this in case 14. Researchers into the paranormal have come up with three more reasons which ought to be added to my own as to why certain people believe they have been possessed by a demon. 4. Emotional and physical abuse as a child, which create feelings that the adult abuser represents an evil power who has total control. 5. Multiple personality disorder. 6. Periodic increases in the actions of electromagnetic fields around Earth, which are sufficient enough to disrupt brain activity in a disturbed individual. The possibility that people can be possessed by a satanic being comes right out of medieval belief systems. It is fear-based and the result of theological superstition that has ruined countless lives over the last thousand years. Much of this nonsense has dissipated in the last two hundred years, but it lingers with the fundamentalists. The exorcism of demons is still practiced by some religious groups. Frequently, I find that clients who come to me with concerns about possession have lives which seem to be out of their control and filled with a variety of personal obsessions and compulsions. People who hear voices commanding them to do bad things are likely to be schizophrenic. They are not possessed. Our physical world may have unhappy or mischievous spirits floating round, but they do not lock in and inhabit the minds of people. The spirit world is much too ordered to allow for such muddled soul activity. Being possessed by another being would not only abrogate our life contract, but destroy free will. These factors form the foundation of reincarnation and cannot be compromised. The idea that satanic entities exist as outside forces to confuse and subvert people is a myth perpetuated by those who seek to control the minds of others for their own ends.
evil exists internally, initiated within the confines of the deranged human mind. Life can be cruel, but it is of our making here on this planet. Assuming that we are born evil, or that some external force has occupied the mind of an evil person, makes malevolence easier for some people to accept. It is a way of rationalizing premeditated cruelty, preserving our humanity, and absolving ourselves of responsibility individually and collectively as a race. When we see cases of serial killers, or those of children who kill other children, we might label these people as either born killers or under outside demonic influences. This saves us the trouble of finding out why these murderers enjoy inflicting pain by acting out their own pain. There are no soul monsters. People are not born evil. Rather, they are corrupted by the society in which they live, where practicing evil satisfies the cravings of depraved personalities. This emanates from the human brain. Studies of the psychopath have shown that the excitement of inflicting pain on others without remorse satisfies an emptiness they feel within themselves. Practicing evil is a source of power, strength, and control for inadequate people. Hate takes away the reality of a hateful life. The warped minds of these executioners tell them, if life is not worth living for me, why not take it away from somebody else? Evil is not genetic. Although if a family has a history of violence and cruelty to their children, these acts are often passed on from one generation to the next as learned behavior. Violence and dysfunctional behavior from one adult member of a family is an internal emotional reaction that spills over to contaminate other younger members. This can lead to compulsive and destructive behavior from children of that family. How do these genetic and environmental disruptions to the body affect our soul. What I have found in my practice is that a soul's energy force may, during troubled times, dissociate from the body. There are those who feel they don't even belong to their bodies. If conditions are severe enough, these souls are prone to thoughts of suicide, but usually not taking the life of another. I will have more to say about this condition in upcoming chapters. Part of this turmoil stems from conflicts between the soul's immortal character meshed to the temperament of a host brain with all its genetic baggage. There may also be influences of abnormal brain chemistry and hormonal imbalances affecting the central nervous system that might contaminate the soul. Another element I find is that immature souls often have difficulties handling the poor mental circuitry of disturbed human beings. There is a counteraction of the soul self versus the human self. A push-me-pull-you force is struggling to present a single ego to the world and not doing very well in the process. These are internal, not external forces at work. A disturbed mind does not need an exorcist, but a competent mental health therapist. Souls don't represent all that is pure and good about a body, or they wouldn't be incarnating for personal development. Souls come to earth to work on their own shortcomings. In terms of self-discovery, a soul may choose to act in conjunction with, or in opposition to, its own character in the selection of a human body. As an example, a soul combating tendencies towards selfishness and indulgence might not mix well with a human ego whose emotional temperament is disposed to engaging in hostile acts for self-gratification. Quite often, Troubled people have suffered painful environmental trauma, such as physical and emotional abuse as children. They have either internalized themselves, creating a shell to hide behind their pain, or externalized by mentally moving outside their bodies on a regular basis. These defense mechanisms are a means of survival to preserve our sanity. When a client tells me they love to tune out and practice astral projection, because the out-of-body experience makes them feel more alive, I look for disturbances. Indeed, I may not find anything other than curiosity, but an obsession with being away from the body indicates a desire to escape from current reality. It is perhaps for this reason I am troubled by the walk-in theory as another escape mechanism. I believe the whole idea of walk-ins to be a false concept. 
According to the proponents of this theory, tens of thousands of souls now on this planet came directly into their physical body without going through the normal process of birth and childhood. We are told that these possessing souls are enlightened beings who are permitted to take over the adult body of a soul who wants to check out early because life has become too difficult. Therefore, the walk-in soul is actually performing a humanitarian act, according to devotees of this theory. I call this possession by permission. If this theory is true, then I must turn in my great guru white robe and gold medallion. Not once in all my years of working with subjects in regression have I ever had a walk-in soul. Also, these people have never heard of any other soul in the spirit world associated with such practices. In fact, they deny the existence of this act because it would abrogate a soul's life contract. To give another soul permission to come in and take over your karmic life plan defeats the whole purpose of your coming to earth in the first place. It is deluded reasoning to assume that the walk-in would wish to complete their own karmic cycle in a body originally selected and assigned to someone else. If I am a senior in a high school trigonometry class, would I leave my class and go down the hall to a freshman algebra class where a student is struggling with an exam and tell him I'll finish the exam for him so he can leave early? This is a lose-lose situation for both students, and what teacher would permit it? The whole walk-in theory is like suicide, although it is supposed to combat suicide by allowing the walk-out soul to escape responsibility for straightening out their life. The walk-out soul relinquishes ownership of its host body so a more advanced spirit who does not want to go to all the trouble of being in a child's body can take over. This is one of the major flaws of possession by permission. From everything I have learned about body assignments, it takes years for a soul to fully meld its energy vibrations with that of a host brain. The process begins when the baby is in a fetal state. All the essential elements of who we really are come from the soul assigned to a specific body from the beginning. Consider first the three eyes emanating from the soul, imagination, intuition, and insight. Then add such components as conscience and creativity. Do you think the adult human mind is not going to recognize the loss of its partner self to a new presence? Now that would drive a host body insane as opposed to healing it. I tell people not to worry about losing their soul. It's with us for the duration, because there are good reasons for having the particular body you occupy. Souls take their responsibility very seriously, even to the extent of being inside non-functional bodies. They are not materially trapped. For instance, a soul may inhabit a comatose host body for many years and not abandon it until death. These souls are able to roam freely across the land, visiting other souls who might be making brief trips away from their bodies during normal sleep states. This is especially true of souls in the bodies of babies. Souls are very respectful of their host body assignments, even if they are bored. They leave a small portion of their energy so they can return quickly if needed. Their wavelengths are like homing beacons who have fingerprinted their human partners. When a soul's energy does leave the human body, this does not provide an opportunity for some demonic being to rapidly move in and occupy a vacant mind. This is another superstition. Aside from the non-existence of such demonic beings in the first place, the mind is never completely vacant of a traveling soul's energy. A malevolent entity would be unable to squeeze in even if it did exist. Evidently, Residents of the spirit world are quite aware of our enthrallment with dark and nefarious specters who pose a danger to the soul. I have a most unusual and defining case which brought this to my attention. The ironic engagement of demonology employed in Case 18 by my subject's teacher toward his hapless student is outrageous and unconventional, but effective. This case illustrates how the almost brutal use of humor can be graphically applied in the spirit world to define our shortcomings on earth. Case 18 concerns the death experience of an evangelical preacher of the 1920s. 
This man had spent a lifetime seeing the devil in every nook and cranny of his town in the Deep South. During my review of this life with the client who carried these memories, I was told, My parishioners were shaken to their bones with my fiery sermons of the hell awaiting all sinful transgressors. I will begin this case with a scene as it unfolded, right after my subject reaches the gateway. Case 18 Dr. N. You say that, although things are not too clear, you are floating in bright light and someone is coming toward you? Subject. Yes, I am kind of disoriented. I haven't gotten used to things around here yet. Dr. N. That's fine. Just take your time and let the figure float toward you as you float toward it. Subject. Long pause. And then with a loud, horrified exclamation. Oh, God! No! Dr. N., startled by this outcry. What's going on? Subject. Subject's body begins to shake uncontrollably. Oh! Oh! Lord Almighty! It's the devil! I knew it! I've gone to hell! Dr. N., grasping subject by the shoulders. Now take a deep breath and try to relax as we go through this together. Then, softly... You are not in hell. Subject cuts in with a shrill tone of voice. Oh, yeah? Then why do I see the devil right in front of me? Dr. N. My subject's face is now covered in sweat, and I use a tissue to wipe some of it away while continuing to reassure. Try to calm yourself. There is some misinterpretation here, and we will find it soon. Subject. Paying no attention to me. The subject now begins to moan while rocking back and forth. Oh, it's over for me. I'm in hell. Dr. N. I break in now more forcefully. Tell me exactly what you see. Subject. Whispering at first and then loudly. Uh, being. Demonic. Reddish green face. Horns. Wild eyed. Fangs. The facial skin is like charred wood. Oh, sweet Jesus, why, me of all people who spoke so much in your name? Dr. N. What else do you see? Subject, with loathing. What else is there to see? Can't you understand I'm in front of the devil? Dr. N. Quickly. I meant the rest of the body. Look below the head and tell me what you see. Subject, with a violent shudder. Nothing. Just a wispy, ghost-like body. Dr. N., stay with me. Doesn't this seem unusual to you? That the devil would appear with no body? Move forward in time rapidly now and tell me what this figure does. Subject. My subject's body jerks up violently, and then with a great sigh of relief, he sags back into the chair. Oh! That bastard! I might have known. It's Scanlon. He is taking his mask off and smiling wickedly at me. Dr. N. Now I can relax. Who is Scanlon? Subject. My guide. This is his crude idea of a joke. Dr. N. What does Scanlon really look like now? Subject. Tall, aquiline features, gray hair. Full of mischief-making as usual. Laughs with bravado, but still not fully recovered. I should have known. He caught me unawares this time. Dr. N. Does Scanlon make a habit of this sort of thing? Why frighten you just as you were coming into the spirit world a little disoriented? Subject. Defensively. Listen, he is a great teacher. That's his way. He has got our whole group using masks, but he knows I don't like them much. Dr. N. Tell me why Scanlon used a devil's mask to scare you right after this life. Talk to him now. Note. I am quiet for a few moments while my subject mentally connects with Scanlon. Subject. After a period of silence. I had it coming. Oh, I know it. I spent a lifetime preaching about the devil. Scaring good people. Telling them they were going to hell if they didn't pay attention to me. 
Scanlon gave me a dose of my own medicine. Dr. N. And how do you feel now about his methods? Subject, chagrined. He made his point. Dr. N. I want to ask you a blunt question. Did you really believe what you told your parishioners about seeing demonic forces everywhere, or were you motivated by something else? Subject, intensely. No, no. I believed what I was saying about evil being everywhere and every person. I was not a hypocrite. Dr. N., are you sure it wasn't false piety? You did not pretend to feel and be what you were not? Subject, no, I believed it. My undoing was my method of preaching and the love of the power over others that this ability gave me. Yes, I admit that failing. I made life miserable for some of my flock, not seeing the essential goodness in people. I was always suspicious because of my obsession with evil, and this corrupted me. Dr. N., do you feel part of what you became was the result of the body you chose in this life? Subject, in a flat voice. Yes, I lacked restraint. I chose a body with a feisty mind and allowed myself to be swept away. I was too confrontational as a preacher. Dr. N., and do you know why your soul mind chose to enter into this partnership in the body of a preacher who constantly intimidated people? Subject, oh, I, shit. I let it happen because it felt good to be in control. I was afraid of not being taken seriously enough. Dr. N., you were worried about the loss of control? Subject, long pause. Yes, that I would be inadequate. Dr. N., by his use of a devil's mask, do you think Scanlon demeans what you stood for in the church? Subject, no, that's my teacher's way. I chose the body of a minister and he helped me with all this. I took a wrong turn. It was not the wrong path. My faith was not a bad thing, but I became misguided and I misguided others. Scanlon wants me to see what it feels like to scare people rather than reason with them. He wanted me to feel the same fear that I gave to others. Note, I now move my subject into a group setting to learn more about how Scanlon teaches his students through the use of masks. Dr. N. Who is the first person who comes to you? Subject, hesitates and is wary. It's an angel, soft glowing white. Wings? Then with recognition. Okay, I'm on to all of you. Enough. Dr. N. Who is this angel? Subject. My dear friend, Diane. She has removed her angel's mask and is laughing and hugging me. Dr. N. I'm a little confused. Souls can assume any shape or create any features they want. Why bother with masks? Subject. The mask is similar to a figure of speech. A symbol one can hold in the hand to put on and pull off for effect. Diane is offsetting Scanlon's huge joke by being a loving angel for me, while the others are laughing at what happened to me. Dr. N. What kind of individual is Diane? Subject. Very loving and full of humor. She likes practical jokes, as does most of my group. They all know I take things too seriously. I don't like the masks very much, so they tease me. Dr. N. During your lessons, are masks used as a means of teaching about right and wrong behavior? Subject. Yes, they are a means of acknowledgement of good or poor thinking, misconceptions. They identify aspects of our character which are positive and those which are undesirable, and we can role-play with each other. Dr. N. Did Scanlon originate the use of this sort of prop for your group lessons? Subject laughs. Yes, and what he does makes an impression. This was a strange case, and I'll admit Scanlon had me going for a few minutes when I thought this client was taking me to a place no other had before. The treatment this subject received at the gateway by the use of a devil mask is an anomaly. Moreover, 
I have never encountered a guide whose behavior had such extravagance and provocation. In the chapters ahead, we will see how drama plays an important part in soul group activity. The use of masks by Scanlon's group as a symbolic gesture to embody a belief system is rather unique in my experience. Masks do have a long tradition in our cultural life, where personification of divine and demonic power has been used to mock spirits which are feared and honor those spirits which are venerated. The devil mask has a history of tribal exorcism toward a harmful spirit. Case 18 is one where mythic spiritual practices were taken from earth by a soul group director to serve as a wake-up call for his students. 4. Spiritual Energy Restoration Soul Energy We cannot define the soul in a physical way, because to do so would establish limits on something that seems to have none. I see the soul as intelligent light energy. This energy appears to function as vibrational waves, similar to electromagnetic force, but without the limitations of charged particles of matter. Soul energy does not appear to be uniform. Like a fingerprint, each soul has a unique identity in its formation, composition, and vibrational distribution. I am able to discern soul properties of development by color tones, yet none of this defines what the soul is as an entity. From years of study on how the soul interacts within a variety of human minds over many incarnations, and what it subsequently does in the spirit world, I have come to know something of its yearnings for perfection. This does not tell me what the soul is, either. To fully understand soul energy, we would need to know all the aspects of its creation, and indeed the consciousness of its source. This is a perfection that I cannot know, despite all my efforts investigating the mysteries of life after death. I am left, then, with examining the actions of this profound energy substance and how it reacts to people and events and what it is striving to do in both physical and mental environments. If the soul's existence begins and is molded by pure thought, it is sustained by that thought as an immortal being. The soul's individual character enables it to influence its physical environment to give greater harmony and balance to life. Souls are an expression of beauty imagination, and creativity. The ancient Egyptians said that to begin to understand the soul, one must listen to the heart. I think they were right. Standard Treatment at the Gateway When we cross over and are met by our guides, I find the techniques they use at initial contact fall into two general categories. 1. Envelopment here, returning souls are completely cloaked by a large circular mass of their guide's powerful energy. As the soul and guide come together, the soul feels as though they both are encased in a bubble. This is the more common method, which my subjects describe as pure ecstasy. 2. The Focus Effect This alternate procedure of initial contact is administered a little differently. As the guide approaches, energy is applied to certain points at the edges of the soul's etheric body from any direction of the guide's choosing. We might be taken by the hand or held by the tops of our shoulders from a side position. Healing begins from a specific point of the etheric body in the form of a brushing caress, followed by deep penetration. The choice of procedures depends on the preference of the guide and the condition of our soul energy at the time. In both instances, there is an immediate infusion of potent, invigorating energy while we are projected forward. This is the introductory phase of the journey to our eventual spiritual destination. The more advanced souls, especially if they are undamaged, usually do not require assistance from a loving energy force. A review of the techniques employed by Case One on his wife Alice demonstrates elements of both the focus effect and envelopment on a living person by someone who is not yet a guide. Other cases in the last chapter indicate this is one way we begin our training in the use of healing energy before acquiring the status of a guide. 
During the exhilarating moments after initial contact, our guides might also expertly apply what I call energy permeation. This follow-up effect of energy transference has been described as being similar to the percolating of coffee. In case 8, a soul used an energy filtration process involving smell on her husband Charles. Healing emotional and physical injury, both in and out of the spirit world, emanates from a source of goodness. Positive energy flows to every part of the soul's being from the sender, whose own essence and wisdom is transmitted as well. My subjects are unable to explain the beauty and subtlety of this assimilation, except to say it resembles the flowing of rejuvenating electricity. Emergency Treatment at the Gateway When souls arrive at the gateway to the spirit world, with energy that is in a deteriorated state, some of our guides engage in emergency healing. This is both a physical and mental healing exercise that takes place before the soul moves any further into the spirit world. One of my clients died in an auto accident in his last life, where his leg was severed. He told me what occurred at the gateway as a result of this experience. When I reached the gateway, my guides saw the gaps in my energy aura and proceeded at once to push the damaged energy back into place. He molded it as clay to fill, reshape, and smooth out the rough edges and broken intervals to make me whole again. The etheric, or soul body, is an outline of our old physical body which souls take into the spirit world. Essentially, it is an imprint of a human form we have not shed yet, like the skin of a reptile. This is not a permanent condition, although we might naturally create it later as a colorful, luminescent shape of energy. We know damaged body imprints from a past life can influence the current physical form of some people unless properly deprogrammed, so why not the reverse? There are souls who shed their body form completely at the moment of death. However, many souls with physical and emotional scars from life carry the imprint of this damaged energy back home. In terms of afflictions and soul healing, I learn a lot from the students as well as the teachers in the spirit world. My next case was a rather unusual one for me, where a student guide was unable to handle damaged energy properly at the gate. My subject in this case had just come off a difficult life after being blown up in an artillery bombardment during a battle in World War I. Case 19 Dr. N. As you pass into the bright light following your death in the mud and rain of this battlefield, what do you see? Subject. A figure coming toward me dressed in a white robe. Dr. N., who is this figure? Subject. I see Kate. She is a new teacher recently assigned to our group. Dr. N., describe her appearance and what she is communicating to you as she comes closer. Subject. She has a young, rather plain face with a large forehead. Kate radiates peace. I can feel it. But there is a concern, too, and... Laughs. And she won't come close to me. Dr. N. Why not? Subject. My energy is in bad shape. She says to me, Zed, you should be healing yourself. Dr. N. Why doesn't she help in this endeavor, Zed? Subject. Laughs again loudly. <laughs> Kate does not want to get near all my scrambled negative energy from the war. And the killing. Dr. N. I have never heard of a guide shying away from such responsibility with disassembled energy, Zed. Is she afraid of contamination? Subject. Still laughing. Something like that. You have to understand Kate is still rather new at this sort of work. She is not happy with herself, I can see that. Dr. N. Describe what your energy looks like right now. Subject. My energy is a mess. It is in chunks, black blocks. Irregular, totally skewed out of alignment. Dr. N. Is this because you didn't escape from your body fast enough at the moment of death? Subject. 
For sure. My unit was taken by surprise. I normally cut loose, from the body, when I see death coming. Note. This case and many others have taught me that souls often leave their bodies seconds before a violent death. Dr. N. Well, can't Kate lend some assistance in rearranging your energy? Subject. She tries. A little. I guess it's too much for her at the moment. Dr. N. So, what do you do? Subject. I begin to take her suggestion and try to help myself. I'm not doing too well. It's so scrambled. Then a powerful stream of energy hits me like water from a fire hose, and it helps me begin to reshape myself and push out some of the negative crap from that battle. Dr. N. I have heard of a place where energy is showered upon newly returned damaged souls. Is that where you are now? Subject, laughing. I guess so. It's from my guide, Bella. I can see him now. He is a real pro at this kind of thing. He is standing behind Kate, helping her. Dr. N. Then what happens to you? Subject. Bella fades away and Kate comes close to me and puts her arms around me. And we start to talk as she leads me away. Dr. N. Deliberately provoking. Do you have any confidence in Kate, after she treated you like some sort of leper? Subject frowns at me severely. Oh, come on, that's a mite strong. It won't be long before she gets the hang of working with this kind of messed up energy. I like her a lot. She has many gifts. Right now, mechanics isn't one of them. Recovery Areas for the Less Damaged Soul Regardless of the specific energy treatment received by the soul at the gateway to the spirit world, most all returning souls will continue onto some sort of healing station before finally joining their groups. All but the most advanced souls crossing back into the spirit world are met by benevolent spirits who make contact with their positive energy and escort needy souls to quiet recovery areas. It is only the more highly developed souls with energy patterns that are still strong after their incarnations, who return directly to their regular activities. The more advanced souls appear to get over hardship more quickly than others after a life. One man told me, Most of the people I work with must stop and rest, but I don't need anything. I'm in too much of a hurry to get back and continue my program. Most recovery areas for the returning soul involve some kind of orientation back to the spirit world. It may be intense or moderate in scope, depending upon the condition of the soul. This usually includes a preliminary debriefing of the life just completed. Much more in-depth counseling will take place later with guides in group conferences and with our Council of Elders. I have written about these orientation procedures in Journey of Souls. The surroundings of recovery areas are identifiable earthly settings created out of our memories and what spiritual guides feel will promote healing. Orientation environments are not the same after each of our lives. One woman had the following to say, after dying in a German concentration camp in 1944. There are subtle differences in physical layout, depending upon the life one has just lived. Because I have just returned from a life filled with horror, cold, and bleakness, everything is very bright to lighten my sorrow. There is even a comfortable fire next to me, so I'll have the feeling of added warmth and cheerfulness. Upon returning to the spirit world, often my subjects describe themselves as being in a garden setting, while others might say they are in a crystalline enclosure. The garden presents a scene of beauty and serenity, but what does crystal represent? It is not just in the orientation rooms that I hear about crystals. Crystal caves, for example, appear in the minds of some people who are spending time alone in reflection, right after a life is over. Here is a typical statement about a crystal recovery center. My place of recovery is crystalline in composition because it helps me connect my thoughts. The crystal walls have multicolored stones which reflect prisms of light. The geometric angles of these crystals send out moving bands of light which crisscross around, 
and bring clarity to my thoughts. After talking to a number of clients out of trance and with others who are knowledgeable about crystals, I came to realize that crystals represent thought enhancement through a balancing of energy. As a shamanic tool, the crystal is supposed to assist in tuning our vibrational pattern into a universal energy force while releasing negative energy. Bringing forth wisdom from an expanded consciousness through healing is the primary reason for being in a place of spiritual recovery. The next example involves a garden setting. I had a client who had been working on humility for many lives. In earlier incarnations, usually as a man, this soul had been caught up with host bodies that had become haughty, arrogant, and even ruthless during my subject's occupancy. In a complete turnaround, this person's last life had been one of acceptance that bordered on passivity. Since this life was so out of character for my client, there was a feeling of failure when this soul reached the recovery area. I was then given this account. I am in a beautiful circular garden with willow trees and a pond with ducks in it. There is such tranquility here, and this scene softens the feelings of discouragement I have over my last performance. My guide, Makil, brings me to a marble bench under an arbor draped with vines and flowers. I am so down over my wasted life because I overcompensated at every turn, going from one extreme to another. Makil smiles and offers me refreshments. We drink nectar and eat fruit together and watch the ducks. While we do this, the aura of my old physical body moves further away from me. I begin to feel as though I am taking in his powerful energy as oxygen after a near drowning. Makil is a gracious host, and he knows I need nourishment because I am judging myself in such a critical manner. I am always harder on myself than he is. We talk about my overcorrections of past mistakes and what I wanted to do that didn't get done or was only partially completed. Makil offers encouragement that I still learned from this life, which will make the next one better. He explains the important thing was that I was not afraid to change. The whole garden atmosphere is so relaxing. I am already feeling better. From cases such as this, I have learned that our guides use the sense memory we had in our physical bodies to assist in our recovery. There are many ways to achieve this, such as the use of taste memory by Makil in the above case. I have also listened to descriptive scenes involving touch and smell. After receiving streams of bright white liquid energy, there have been subjects who describe additional treatments involving the sensations of sound and multicolored lights. After my cleansing shower, I move to an adjacent room to the place of rebalancing. While I float to the center of this enclosure, I see a vast array of spotlights overhead. I hear my name called. Banyan, are you ready? When I give my assent, sounds vibrate into me which resonate like tuning forks until the pitch is just right to make my energy bubble like frothy soap suds. It feels wonderful. Then the spotlights come on one at a time. In the beginning, I am scanned by an intense beam of healing green light. It casts a circle around me as if I were on a stage. This light is designed to pick up my level of displaced energy, to see what I have lost or damaged, and make corrections. I think this is more effective because my energy is bubbling from the sound vibrations. Then I receive a wash of gold light for strength and blue for awareness. Finally, my own pinkish-white color is restored by one of the spotlights. It is soothing and loving, and I'm sorry when this is over. Regenerating Severely Damaged Souls There are certain displaced souls who have become so contaminated by their host bodies that they require special handling. In life, they became destructive to others and themselves. This spectrum of behavior would primarily include souls who have been associated with evil acts that caused harm to other people through deliberate malice. There are souls who slowly become more contaminated from a series of lifetimes, 
while others are totally overcome by one body alone. In either case, these souls are taken to places of isolation, where their energy undergoes a more radical treatment plan than with the typical returning soul. Contamination of the soul can take many forms and involve different grades of severity during an incarnation. A difficult host body might cause the less experienced soul to return with damaged energy, where a more advanced being would survive the same situation relatively intact. The average soul's energy will become shadowed when it has lived within a host body obsessed by constant fear and rage. The question is, by how much? Our thoughts, feelings, moods, and attitudes are mediated by body chemicals which are released through signals of perceived threats and danger from the brain. Fight-or-flight mechanisms come from our primitive brain, not from the soul. The soul has a great capacity to control our biological and emotional reactions to life, but many souls are unable to regulate a dysfunctional brain. Souls display these scars when they leave a body that has deteriorated in this fashion. I have my own theory of madness. The soul comes into the fetus and begins its fusion with the human mind by the time the baby is born. If this child matures into an adult with organic brain syndromes, psychosis, or major affective disorders, abnormal behavior is the result. The struggling soul does not fully assimilate. When this soul can no longer control the aberrant behavior of its body, the two personas begin to separate into a dissociated personality. There may be many physical, emotional, and environmental factors that contribute to a person becoming a danger to themselves and others. Here, the combined self has been damaged. One of the red flags for souls who are losing their capacity to regulate deviant human beings is when they have had a series of lives in bodies demonstrating a lack of intimacy and displaying tendencies toward violence. This has a domino effect with a soul asking for the same sort of body to overcome the last one. Because we have free will, our guides are indulgent. A soul is not excused from responsibility for a disturbed human mind it is unable to regulate, because it is a part of that mind. The problem for slow learner souls is that they may have had a series of prior life struggles before occupying a body that escalated wrongdoing to a new level of evil. What happens to these disturbed souls when they return to the spirit world? I will begin with a quote from a client giving me an outsider's view of a place where severely damaged souls are taken. Some of my subjects call this area the City of Shadows. It is here where negative energy is erased. Since this is the place where so many souls are concentrated who have negative energy, it is dark to those of us outside. We can't go into this place where souls who have been associated with horror are undergoing alteration. And we would not want to go there anyway. It is a place of healing, but from a distance it has the appearance of a dark sea, while I am looking at it from a bright sandy beach. All the light around this area is brighter in contrast because positive energy defines the greater goodness of bright light. When you look at the darkness carefully, you see it is not totally black, but a mixture of deep green. We know this is an aspect of the combined forces of the healers working here. We also know that souls who are taken to this area are not exonerated. Eventually, in some way, they must redress the wrongs they perpetrated on others. This they must do to restore full positive energy to themselves. Subjects who are familiar with damaged souls explain to me that not all of the more terrible memories of bad deeds are erased. It is known that if the soul did not retain some memory of an evil life, it would not be accountable. This knowledge by the soul is relevant for future decisions. Nevertheless, the resurrection of the soul in the spirit world is merciful. The soul mind does not fully retain all the lurid details of harming others in former host bodies after treatment. If this were not true, the guilt and association with such lives would be so overpowering to the soul they might refuse to reincarnate again to redress these wrongs. These souls would lack the confidence to ever dig themselves out of pits of despair. 
I understand there are souls whose acts in host bodies were so heinous they are not permitted to return to earth. Souls are strengthened by regeneration with the expectation they can keep future potentially malevolent bodies in check. Of course, once in our new body, the amnesiac blocks of certain past life mistakes prevent us from being so inhibited we would not progress. There are differences in the regeneration process between moderately and severely damaged souls. After listening to a number of explanations about kinds of energy treatments, I have come to this conclusion. The more radical approach of energy cleansing is one of remodeling energy, while the less drastic method is reshaping. This is an oversimplification, because there is much I don't know about these esoteric techniques. The fine art of energy reconstruction is handled by non-reincarnating masters who are not in my office answering questions. I work with the trainees. Case 20 will provide some insight into the mechanics of energy reshaping, while Case 21 will address remodeling. Case 20 My subject in this case is a practitioner of chiropractic and homeopathic medicine, who currently specializes in repolarizing the out-of-balance energy patterns of patients. This client has been a healer for thousands of years on earth, and is called Selim in the spirit world. Dr. N. Selim, you have told me about your advanced healing group in the spirit world, and how the five of you are in specific energy training. I would like to know more about your work. Would you begin by telling me what your advanced study group is called, and what you do? Subject. We are in training to be regenerators. We work to reshape, to reorganize, displaced energy in the place of the holding ground. Dr. N., is this place a designated area for souls whose energy has been disrupted? Subject. Yes, the ones in bad condition. Those who will not be returning to their groups right away. They will stay in the holding ground. Dr. N., do you make this determination at the gateway to the spirit world? Subject. No, I do not. I have not yet reached that status. This decision is made by their guides, who will call upon the masters who are training me. Dr. N. Then tell me, Selim, when do you enter the picture after a severely damaged soul crosses back to the spirit world? Subject. I am called by my instructor when it is felt I can assist in this energy healing. Then I move to the holding ground. Dr. N., please explain to me why you use the term holding ground and what this place is like. Subject. The damaged soul is held here until their regeneration is complete, so they are healthy again. This sphere is designed as a beehive structure, covered with cells, each soul has its own place to reside during the healing. Dr. N. This sounds very much like the descriptions I have heard about the incubation of new souls after their creation and before they are assigned to groups. Subject. That's true. These are spaces where energy is nurtured. Dr. N. So are these beehive spaces all in the same place and used for the same purpose, both for regeneration and creation? Subject. No, they are not. I work in the place of damaged souls. Newly created souls are not damaged. I can tell you nothing about those places. Dr. N. That's fine, Selim. I appreciate learning about those areas where you do have knowledge and experience. Why do you think you were assigned this sort of work? Subject. With pride. Because of my long history and so many lives working with wounded people. When I asked if I could specialize as a regenerator, my wish was granted and I was assigned to a training class. Dr. N. And so, when a severely wounded soul is returned to the holding ground, are you a soul who could be called to assist? Subject shakes his head negatively. Not necessarily. I am only requested to go to the regeneration areas to work with energy that has been moderately damaged. I am a beginner. There is so much I don't know. Dr. N. 
Well, I have a great deal of respect for what you do know, Selim. Before I ask you about your level of work, can you explain why a damaged soul would be sent to the holding ground? Subject. They were overcome by their last body. Many are souls who have been repeatedly suppressed in previous lives as well. These are the ones who become stuck in life after life, making no progress. Each body has contaminated them a little more. I work with these souls more than the ones who have had terrible energy damage, either from one or many lives. Dr. N. Do the souls whose energy has been gradually depleted ask for help, or are they forced to come to the holding ground? Subject, promptly. No one is forced. They cry for help because they have become totally ineffectual, repeating the same mistakes over and over again. Their teachers see they do not recover sufficiently between lives. They want regeneration. Dr. N. Does the same cry for help come from souls who have been severely damaged? Subject. Pause. Perhaps less so. It is possible that a life is so destructive it has damaged the identity of the soul. Dr. N. Such as being involved with cruel acts of violence. Subject. That would be one reason, yes. Dr. N. Salim, please give me as many details as you can about what happens when you are called to the holding ground to work on a case with severely depleted or altered energy. Subject. Before meeting the new arrival, one of the Restoration Masters outlines the meridians of energy we will be regenerating. We review what is known about the damaged soul. Dr. N. This sounds like you are surgeons, preparing for a procedure with x-rays before the operation. Subject, with delight. Yes, this gives me an idea of what to expect in three-dimensional imagery. I love the challenges involved with energy repair. Dr. N. Okay, take me through this process. Subject. From my perspective, there are three steps. We begin by examining all particles of damaged energy. Then these dark areas of blockage are removed, and what is left, the voids, are rewoven with an infusion of new purified light energy. It is overlaid and melded into the repaired energy for strengthening. Dr. N. And does reweaving energy mean reshaping to you, as opposed to something even more radical? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. Are you personally involved with all phases of this operation? Subject. No. I am being trained in the first step of assessment, and can assist a little with the second step, where the modifications are not as complex. Dr. N. Before you actually begin to work, what do you see when a soul's energy has been severely damaged? Subject. Damaged energy looks like a cooked egg where the white light has solidified and hardened. We must soften this and fill the black voids. Dr. N. Let's talk a moment about this blackened energy. Subject interrupts. I should have added that the damaged energy can also create lesions. These fissures are voids themselves, caused by radical physical or emotional damage. Dr. N. What are the effects of disrupted energy on the incarnated soul? Subject. Pause. Where the energy is mottled, not distributed evenly. This is due to long-term energy deterioration. Dr. N. You talked about rearranging and repairing old energy with new purified energy for healing. How is this done? Subject. By intense charge beams. It is delicate work because you must keep your own vibrational tuning in matched sequences with that generated by the soul. Dr. N. Oh, so this becomes personal. A master's own energy is used as a conduit? Subject. Yes, but there are other sources of new purified energy that I don't use or know much about because of my lack of experience. Dr. N. Salim, you have told me how warped energy is softened and allowed to flow back onto the right spaces. 
but introducing new purified energy concerns me. With all that reconfiguration, aren't you changing the immortal identity of these souls? Subject, no, we have altered to strengthen what is there, to bring the soul close to its original form. We don't want this to happen again. We don't want them back. Dr. N., is there some way you can test your repair work after it is completed? Subject, yes, we can place a field of simulated negative energy around the regenerated soul, as a liquid, to see if this can filter through the structure of our repairs. As I said, we don't want them back. Dr. N., one last question, Selim. When you are finished, what happens to the regenerated soul? Subject, it varies. All of them stay with us a while. There is healing with sound, vibrational music, light, color. And when these souls are released, much care is taken with their next incarnations and the selections of bodies. Size If the soul has been in a body that damaged others in former lives, well, we have fortified these souls to go back and begin again. My next case is an example of severe remodeling. Case 21 involves a particular class of soul I call the hybrid soul. In Chapter 8, Case 61 is another representative of this type of soul. I believe the hybrid souls are especially prone to self-destruction on Earth because they have incarnated on alien worlds before coming here fairly recently. There are hybrid souls who have great difficulty adapting to our planet. If I find this to be true, it is probable their first incarnation here was within the last few thousand years. The others have already adapted or left Earth for good. Less than a quarter of all my clients are able to recall memories of visiting other worlds between lives. This activity by itself does not make them hybrids. An even smaller percentage of my cases have memories of actually incarnating on alien worlds before they came to Earth. These are the hybrid souls. The hybrid is usually an older soul, who, for a number of reasons, has decided to complete their physical lives on our planet. Their old worlds may no longer be habitable, or they may have lived on a gentle world where life was just too easy, and they want a difficult challenge with a world like Earth that has not yet reached its potential. Regardless of the circumstances for a soul leaving a world, I have found these former incarnations typically involve life forms which were slightly above, about equal, or slightly below the intelligence capabilities of the human brain. This is by design. Hybrid souls who have formerly incarnated on planets with civilizations possessing a much higher technology than Earth, such as those with space travel abilities, are smarter because they are an older race. Also, I have noticed that when I do have a hybrid soul as a client with former experience on a telepathic world, they tend to have greater psychic abilities than normal. Sometimes, a hybrid client will confuse their early incarnations on other physical worlds with being on Earth until we sort out that their first world only resembled a place on Earth. Visions of once living on the island nation of Atlantis is a good example. Without discounting the possibility that Atlantis once existed on Earth thousands of years ago, I believe the source of many earthly myths come from our soul memories of former existences on other worlds. I think hybrid soul is an appropriate term for those souls among us of mixed incarnation origins. Such souls have developed from being in hosts that are genetically different than humans. I have seen gifted people in this life who started their development on another world. Nevertheless, there is a dark side to this experience, as a level five subject in training to be a restoration master will explain. Case 21 Dr. N. Since you work with the severely damaged souls, can you give me a little more information about your duties? Subject I'm in a special section working with those souls who have become lost in a morass of evil. Dr. N. After learning this subject works only with those souls from Earth who have incarnated on other worlds before they came to Earth. 
In this section, are these the hybrid souls I have heard about? Subject. Yes, in a restoration area where we deal with those who have become atrocity souls. Dr. N. What a terrible name to call a soul. Subject. I'm sorry you are bothered by this, but what else would you call a being associated with acts of evil that are so serious they are unsalvageable in their present state? Dr. N. I know, but the human body had a lot to do with Subject, cutting me off. We don't consider that to be an excuse. Dr. N. Okay, then please continue with the nature of your work. Subject, I am a second stage restorer. Dr. N. What does that mean? Subject, when these souls lose their bodies, they are met by their guides and perhaps one close friend. That first stage does not last long and then the souls who have been involved with horrible acts are brought here to us. Dr. N., why doesn't the first stage last as long as with other souls? Subject, we don't want them to begin to forget the impact of their deeds, the harm and pain they caused on earth. The second stage separates them from the uncontaminated souls. Dr. N., this sounds like you are running a leper colony. Subject, abruptly. I am not amused by that remark. Dr. N., after apologizing. You are not saying that all souls who commit evil acts are hybrid souls, as you define them. Subject, of course not. That's my section. But you should understand some real monsters on earth are hybrids. Dr. N., I thought the spirit world was a place of order with masters of superior knowledge. If these hybrid souls are contaminated abnormalities in human form, souls with the inability to adjust to the emotional makeup of the human body, why were they sent here? This indicates to me the spirit world is not infallible. Subject. A vast majority are fine, and they make great contributions to human society. You would have us deny all souls the opportunity to come to Earth because some turn out badly? Dr. N. No, of course not. Let's move on. What do you do with these souls? Subject. Others, way above me, examine their contaminated energy in light of just how the world of their earlier experience impacted on their human body. They want to know if this was an isolated case or if other souls from that planet have problems on Earth. If that is true, other souls from that world might not be permitted to come to Earth again. Dr. N., please tell me more about your section. Subject. My area is not devoted to souls who have committed one serious act of wrongdoing. We work with habitually cruel lifestyles. These souls are then given a choice. We will do our best to clean up their energy by rehabilitation, and if we think they are salvageable, they are offered a choice to come back to Earth in roles where they will receive the same type of pain they caused, only multiplied. Dr. N., could a salvageable soul be one who committed terrible atrocities in life but showed great remorse? Subject. Probably. Dr. N., I thought karmic justice was not punitive. Subject. It's not. The offer represents an opportunity for stabilization and redemption. It usually will take more than one life to endure an equal measure of the same kind of pain they cause to many people. That's why I said multiplied. Dr. N. Even so, I suppose most souls take this option? Subject. You are mistaken. Most are too fearful that they will fall again into the same patterns. They also lack the courage to be victims in a number of future lives. Dr. N. If they won't come back to Earth, then what do you do? Subject. These souls will then go the way of those souls we consider to be unsalvageable. We will then disseminate their energy. Dr. N. 
Is this a form of remodeling energy or what? Subject. Ah, yes, we call it the breaking up of energy. That's what dissemination means. Certainly it is remodeled. We break up their energy into particles. Dr. N. I thought energy could not be destroyed. Aren't you destroying the identity of these contaminated souls? Subject. The energy is not destroyed. It is changed and converted. We might mix one particle of the old energy with nine particles of new fresh energy provided for our use. The dilution will make that which is contaminated ineffectual, but a small part of the original identity remains intact. Dr. N. So the negative badness energy is mixed with overdoses of new goodness energy to render the contaminated soul harmless? Subject laughs. Not necessarily goodness, but rather freshness. Dr. N. Why would any soul resist dissemination? Subject. Even those souls who accept these procedures for their own benefit recover and eventually lead productive lives on earth and elsewhere. There are souls who will not stand for any loss of identity. Dr. N. Then what happens to these souls who refuse your help? Subject. Many will just go into limbo, to a place of solitude. I don't know what will eventually happen to them. As I have said before, soul contamination does not only come from the physical body. Certainly, the energy damage described in the last two cases indicates that souls themselves are impure beings who also contribute to their own distress. Before continuing, I want to make a statement about karmic choices here that is important for all of us to keep in mind. When we see people who are victims of great adversity in life, this does not necessarily mean they were perpetrators of evil or wrongdoing of any kind in a former life. A soul with no such past associations might choose to suffer through a particular aspect of emotional pain to learn greater compassion and empathy for others by volunteering in advance for a life of travail. There are cases when a soul's energy damage is moderate, requiring special attention, but not to the degree where a restoration master is needed. The following quote is a report from a client about a gifted healing soul who works at a recovery station. I think of her as a combat nurse managing a field hospital, and my client agrees. Oh, it's Numi. I'm so glad. I haven't seen her in about three or four lives but her deprogramming and restoration energy techniques are just superlative. There are five others being attended to in this place whom I don't know. Numi comes over and clasps me to her. She gets inside me and blends my tired energy with her own. I feel the infusion of her stimulating vibrations, and she performs a tiny bit of reshaping. It is as if I am receiving a gentle reaffirmation of that which created my own energy. Soon I am ready to leave, and Numi gives me a beautiful smile goodbye till next time. Souls of Solitude In the last chapter, I explained how certain dysfunctional souls who have just experienced physical death leave their bodies and go into seclusion for a time. They are not ghosts, but they don't accept death, and they don't want to go home. The low percentage of souls in my practice within this category are at an impasse with themselves. Their major symptom is one of avoidance. Eventually, they are coaxed by empathetic guides to return to the heart of the spirit world. I called them the souls of silence. I also mentioned that it is considered a part of normal activity for healthy souls in the spirit world to engage in periods of quiet time away from others. Besides reflecting upon their goals, souls may use this interval to reach out and touch people they left behind on earth. However, there is another category of silent soul whom I see as a soul in solitude as opposed to a soul in seclusion. It may seem as if I am splitting hairs here, but there are major differences. 
Souls who wish solitude are healthy souls who have been through the recovery process, and yet they still strongly feel the effects of negative energy contamination. Here is a case in point. After every life, I go to a place of sanctuary for quiet reflection. I review what I want to save and integrate from the last body and what should be discarded. Right now, I am saving courage and getting rid of my inability to sustain personal commitment. For me, this is a place of sorting. What I decide to keep becomes part of my character. The rest is thrown off. Only a certain type of soul engages in this activity for a prolonged period. Often, they are more advanced souls who are more reflective if they are alone. This type of soul might be a natural leader who is drained of energy by defending other people. One such soul of this class is Achim, who is a soul devoted to causes for the betterment of others, often at his own expense. Case 22 In this subject's past life, he fought against the final subjugation of Morocco by the French military and was captured in 1934. As a resistance fighter, my client was taken from the Atlas Mountains into the Sahara Desert and tortured for information he did not give. After being staked to the ground, he was left to die a slow death in the hot sun. Dr. N. Ahem, please explain to me why you require such a long period of solitude after your life in Morocco. Subject. I am a protector soul, and my energy has still not recovered from the effects of this life. Dr. N. What is a protector soul? Subject. We try to protect those people whose innate goodness and intense desire to better the lives of large numbers of people on earth must be preserved. Dr. N. Who did you protect in Morocco? Subject. The leader of the resistance movement against French colonization. He was more effective in helping our people fight for freedom because of my years of sacrifice. Dr. N. This sounds demanding. Do you usually work with political and social movements in your lives? Subject. Yes, and in war. We are warriors for good causes. Dr. N. What attributes do protector souls have as a group? Subject. We are noted for our enduring perseverance and calmness under fire, while assisting others who are worthy. Dr. N. If you challenge those who would seek to harm the people you want to protect, who decides if they are worthy? It seems to me this is a very subjective thing. Subject. True. And this is why we spend time analyzing in advance where we can best be utilized to help people. Our work can be offensive or defensive in nature, but we do not engage in any aggressive action lacking principle. Dr. N., all right, let's talk about your energy drain after these endeavors. Why hasn't the shower of healing or some other restoration center returned you to normal? Subject laughs. <laughs> you call it a shower. I call this the car wash. It's an undulating tube which rubs you all over with positive energy, like the brushes of a car wash. I just took a few of my young students through it from the last life and they feel great. Dr. N. So why didn't the car wash help you? Subject. More serious. It was not nearly enough. Although the negative impurities are essentially gone. No, the core of my being has been affected by the cruelty of that life and the torture I endured. Dr. N. What do you do? Subject. I send the students away and go to the place of sanctuary where I can fully connect with myself. Dr. N. Please tell me all you can about this place and what you do there. Subject. It is a darkened enclosure. Some call it a slumber chamber where there are others resting 
but we do not really see each other. I sense there are about twenty of us now. We feel so washed out we have no desire to relate to anyone for a while. The keepers attend to us. Dr. N. Keepers. Who are they? Subject. The keepers of neutrality are skilled at non-interference. Their talent lies in ministering to us with absolutely no intervention into our thoughts. They are the custodians of the slumber chambers. Note. Apparently, the keepers of neutrality are a subspecialty within the ranks of restoration masters. They have other names, but neutrality means they facilitate healing indirectly without any communication. My clients say these beings are devoted to absolute quietude for souls in their care. Dr. N. What do these passive custodians look like? Subject, tersely. They are not passive. The picture I can give you is one of monks moving about a sanctuary. The keepers have cloaks and a hood over their faces, so they present no identity to us. Their thoughts are closed, but they are very watchful. Dr. N. So they simply watch over you while you rest? Subject. No, no, you still don't understand. They possess great skill in ministering to us. Their concern is the proper regulation and infusion of the energy which we have stored in the spirit world before going into a physical life. Dr. N. I have heard a great deal about this attribute of the soul to divide itself. Why can't you just go to your own spiritual area and take the rest of your energy and meld with it? Or why not have a team of restoration masters regenerate your contaminated energy? Subject. Takes a deep breath. I'll try to explain it. For us, all that is unnecessary. It is the effects of the impurities which we want healed by a slow, even return of our own purified, rested energy. The keepers assist us in the restoring of our own energy. Dr. N. Rather like getting a blood transfusion from your own blood bank? Subject. Yes, exactly. Now you are beginning to comprehend. We don't want it in a rush. We don't need major restoration either. We receive slow energy infusions of our own energy over a prolonged period for greater elasticity. We want the strength we had before a rough life and more from having gone through the physical experience. Dr. N., what's a prolonged period of time in earth years for your recovery in this sanctuary? Subject. Oh, that's hard to say. Twenty-five to fifty years? We would always like it to be longer because the keepers use their own vibrational frequencies to massage our energy, which is fantastic. They are very private beings, though, who don't want to be seen or spoken to, but they know we are grateful for their care. They also know when it is time for us to rejoin our friends and get back to work. Laughs. Then we are pushed out. It was from cases such as these that I learned one of the best ways to repair damaged energy is to receive it back slowly. Many souls of solitude are quite advanced and don't require restoration in the normal recovery areas. These vigorous souls can be too overconfident. Achem admitted that he only took about 50% of his energy to Morocco and should have charged up more before departing into that life. The next section will address planetary healers who work in physical environments. Since these souls are generally still incarnating, my subjects do not consider them as masters. This would include the transformer souls mentioned in the next case. Planetary work is where our exposure to many specialties begins and is a basic training ground for developing souls. Energy Healing on Earth Healers of the Human Body 
When I learned about souls who were specializing in restoring damaged energy in the spirit world, I was curious how these souls might apply their unconscious spiritual knowledge when they were working in physical form. Some place great emphasis on this aspect of their skill development to help human beings. My next case is a woman who works with many energy modalities, including Reiki. However, until our hypnosis session, she had little idea of the source of her spiritual power to heal. Her spiritual name is Peruvian, and during our time together, she explained how and why energy adjustments are necessary for incarnates as well as discarnates. Case 23 Dr. N. Peruvian, I would like to know if your spiritual training in soul restoration is used by you in your earthly assignments. Subject. Subject evidenced some surprise as this information began to unfold in her mind after my question. Why, yes. I didn't realize how much until now. Only those of us who want to continue working in this way on Earth are called Transformers. Dr. N. What is the difference? How would you define a Transformer? Subject. Laughs in recognition. As Transformers, we do repair jobs on Earth. We are the cleanup crew, transforming bodies to good health. There are people on Earth who have gray spots of energy which cause them to get stuck. You see it when they make the same mistakes over and over in life. My job is to incarnate, find them, and try and remove these blocks so they make better decisions and gain confidence and self-value. We transform them to be more productive people. Dr. N. Peruvian, I would like to clarify the differences in spiritual training, if any, between restoring souls in the spirit world and transforming energy on a physical world. Subject. Long pause. Some parts of our training are the same, but transformers are sent to other worlds between lives to study, those of us who like working with physical forms. Dr. N. Describe the last training you had as a transformer before you came back to Earth. Subject. Struck by my question, there is a dreamy response. Oh. Two light beings came from another dimension to work with the six of us, Peruvian's independent study group. They showed us how to keep our vibrational energy into a tight, beamed focus, not scattered. I learned to pinpoint my energy to be more effective. Dr. N. Were these beings from a physical world? Subject in a soft tone. More like a gas sphere, where their intelligence exists in bubbles, but they were so good. We learned... Oh, we learned... Dr. N., gently, I'm sure. Let's return to the practical use of what you learned, now that you are more aware of the origins of your skills. Tell me how you apply this spiritual knowledge in your energy work today as a transformer soul on earth. Subject, a look of wonder. It's there now, in my mind. I see why it works. Stops. The focused beam. Dr. N, pressing. The focused beam. Subject, earnestly. We use it as a laser rather like a dentist would drill out a decayed tooth to pinpoint and clean up gray energy. This is the fast way. It is harder for me to use a slow procedure which is longer-lasting and even more effective. Dr. N. Okay, Peruvian. Remember, you are explaining to me how you use your spiritual training and earthly training in combination to heal energy. You have the memory right now of both aspects. Tell me about the slow method. Subject takes a deep breath. I close my eyes and kind of go into a semi-trance when I cup my hands near my patient's head. 
I see now that what I have learned in the spirit world helps me more than what I learned in my classes down here. I guess that doesn't matter, really. Dr. N., we receive power to help others from many sources. Please go on about your healing by the slow method with your patients on Earth. Subject. Well, I work with geometric shapes, such as spirals of energy, forming them in my mind to match the configuration of the particular trouble spot. Then I lay these energy structures around the gray areas. This sets up the areas to be repaired with my slow healing vibrations, like placing a hot pad on a sore muscle. Pause. You see, these souls were damaged on the way in, and this infirmity only grows worse as the body develops on Earth. Dr. N., surprised. Back up a minute. What do you mean damaged on the way in? I thought your work on Earth mostly involved contaminated energy from life's trials. Subject. That's only part of the problem. When souls enter the human body on Earth, they come into dense matter. Their host bodies, after all, contain primitive animal energy, which is thick. The soul has a natural sort of pure, refined energy, which does not easily blend with some human hosts. It takes experience to get used to all this. The younger souls especially can be damaged. They get knocked off their tracks early on and are... twisted. Dr. N. And you might project different energy configurations with different people who are your patients. Subject. Uh-huh. That is the job of the Transformer. Their damaged energy lines are so... squiggly. They must be rearranged to remove the toxic energy. These muddled souls are so unbalanced that a lot of our work must be directed at all the cells of the body where negative energy is trapping the free flow of the positive. When this is performed properly, the soul is more fully engaged with the human brain. Dr. N. This sounds very worthwhile indeed. Subject. It is gratifying although I still have a lot to learn, laughs. We call ourselves psychic sponges for refined energy. It is not surprising that Case 25 uses Reiki in her work on Earth. Reiki is an ancient art of healing by the hands. After evaluating and working on damaged energy, practitioners of this art close gaps in the human energy field with body alignments to bring symmetry. There are theories that damaged energy physical or mental, in the human body, causes gaps in our auras, through which a demonic negative force can enter. This is another of those fear-based myths that receives undeserved attention. I have been told by restoration specialists that this does not happen because there is no outside force of evil trying to take over your body. However, negative energy blockages in our energy field do cause a reduction in functional capacity. I am also disturbed by scientific articles debunking energy work with the hands, such as therapeutic touch, because I have seen the power of this kind of healing with the sick. It is often freely given by certain nurses in hospital settings out of a genuine concern to nurture and heal. Our bodies are composed of an energy field of particles that appears solid, but is fluid and acts as a vibrational conductor. One of my transformer souls had this to say about her therapeutic touch methods. The secret to healing is removing my conscious self so as to avoid inhibiting the free flow of energy between us. My objective is to merge with the energy flow of the patient, to bring out the highest good in that body. This is done with love as well as technique. If the receiving party is resistant and inhibits the free-flowing passageways of chi or life force, through their own mental negativism, they are perfectly capable of blocking the detection of their energy field by a healer. As we begin a new millennium, more people are becoming aware of the healing properties of meditation and guided imagery to build energy within themselves. There are many ways to reach the center of our inner wisdom by tapping into a higher energy source. 
massage, yoga, acupuncture, and biomagnetic healing are some of the techniques available to help balance our chi. Body energy and soul energy are adversely affected by vibrational resonances not in harmony with each other. Each person has their own fingerprint or natural rhythm. Body and soul must smoothly coexist for humans to be productive. If we take a holistic approach to body health, our creative self is better able to function with the human brain. Being in harmony with our outer and inner self positions us to more energetically engage in physical, spiritual, and environmental interrelationships. Healers of the Environment Before my research into the spirit world, I had no idea of the special gifts of environmental healers on our planet. I have learned the earth itself has its own vibrational rate, and there are people capable of tuning into this ecological energy. One of the cases that opened my eyes was a woman who works for the Forest Service in the Pacific Northwest. In her letter requesting a session, she explained, In the last few years, I have felt a tingling, sparking sensation in my hands whenever I am around heavy vegetation. It is not painful, but there is an urgency for something to be released during my work in the forests. Lately, I have dreams about lightning going out of my hands and my wanting to pull it back into a bottle to save it. These dreams seem to fulfill a need inside me, and upon awakening I feel happy. Am I going crazy? I am drawn to people who think they are going crazy because of unexplained phenomena in their lives. I know what this feels like personally. Many of my old traditional colleagues are convinced I have lost my marbles. Therefore, I was glad to take this woman as a client after she agreed to see a physician to make sure there was nothing causing neurological problems with her hands. I will pick up the dialogue of this case at the point where we are discussing her participation in an advanced independent studies group in the spirit world. Case 24 Dr. N. Why did the five of you come together in this study group? Subject because we work with energy the same way. It helps raise our consciousness, our abilities when we are together. Dr. N. Please explain this to me. Subject. Well, our situation right now is that individually we cannot sustain an energy flow of sufficient quality to last very long and have the necessary effect. Dr. N. So you accomplish what you wish to do collectively? Subject. Yes, to some degree. That's why we enjoy working together, so we can throw energy out in unison and bottle it up in concentrated reserves. Working alone, our energy is not as potent, not as refined. It goes in all directions. Dr. N. Is this why you are having these dreams and feeling these hand sensations right now in your life? Subject. Reflects. Yes, I see that it is a message for me. I must alter my life to include more energy work. Dr. N., you mean to store and use energy to heal people? Subject quickly responds to my wrong assumption. No, my study group works with energy differently. We are healers of plants, trees, and the land. That is why we pick lives as caretakers of the environment. Dr. N., did you choose your current vocation for a specific reason related to your skills? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. How about other members of your spirit world study group? Subject. With a big grin. Two of them work with me in the forest service. Dr. N. I would think, as planetary healers, you and your friends have your work cut out for you with all the environmental destruction going on around Earth. Subject, sadly. It's terrible, and we are so needed here. Dr. N., tell me, have you and the members of your study group been involved with using energy environmentally in many past lives on Earth? Subject, oh, yes, for a long time. 
Dr. N. Give me an example. Subject. In my last life, I was an Algonquin Indian with the name of Singing Tree. My job was to ensure our land would continue to supply us with food. I used to stand out in the forest for hours and hold out my hands. The tribe thought I was talking to the trees and the soil, but actually I was exchanging energy with the land. It's an extension of mind and body with some help from our guides. Dr. N. And how about today? Subject. Pause. When you create and support beauty and growth from the land, you also give power to others who live here. From your hands, you provide a means by which others are motivated with the beauty of what they see around them, as well as receiving sustenance from the environment. Sometimes I receive letters years later from clients who want to say they finally reached their goals in life. A person with environmental healing talents might write me to announce they have become a landscape architect, opened a garden nursery, or joined a protest group to stop the logging of old redwood trees. I enjoy these aspects of career counseling in my work that begin with the question, why am I here? When I became involved with delving into the mysteries of the spirit world, I thought people would mostly want to know about their spirit guides and soulmates. Instead, I found their primary interest was their purpose in life. Before leaving the subject of our environment on Earth and the manner in which people are able to tune into the energy vibrations of this planet, I should say a word about sacred sites. A number of researchers have reported on the fact that there are places in the world which give off intense pulses of magnetic energy. In the last chapter, I spoke about vibrational energy layers which vary in density around the Earth. Some sacred sites on Earth are well known to the public, such as the places of stone in Sedona, Arizona, Machu Picchu in Peru, and Ayers Rock in Australia, to name a few. People standing in these places feel a heightened awareness and physical well-being. Planetary magnetic fields do affect our physical and spiritual consciousness, and I find a curious similarity here with descriptions about the spirit world. My clients say the home ground of their cluster group is a space within a space, whose non-solid boundaries have a specific vibrational concentration of energy generated by that particular group. Perhaps certain human habitations on Earth, considered to be sacred by the ancients, contain vortexes of energy concentrations caused by what are called natural ley lines. The places where these magnetic grid lines converge are said to enhance unconscious thought and make it easier to open our mental passages into spiritual realms. Knowledge of vortex locations are very useful to planetary healers. In Chapter 8, under the section of Soul Explorers in Other Worlds, I will touch again on planetary vibrational grid patterns which affect intelligent life away from Earth. Soul Division and Reunification The capacity for souls to divide their energy essence influences many aspects of soul life. Perhaps soul extension would be a more accurate term than soul division. As I reported in the section under ghosts, all souls who come to earth leave a part of their energy behind in the spirit world, even those living parallel lives in more than one body. The percentages of energy souls leave behind may vary, but each particle of light is an exact duplicate of every other self and replicates the whole identity. This phenomenon is analogous to the way light images are split and duplicated in a hologram. Yet there are differences with a hologram. If only a small percentage of a soul's energy is left behind in the spirit world, that particle of self is more dormant because it is less concentrated. However, because this energy remains in a pure, uncontaminated state, it is still potent. When I made the discovery of our energy reserve in the spirit world, so much fell into place for me. The grandeur of this system of soul duality impacts many spiritual aspects of our life. For example, if someone you loved died 30 years ahead of you and has since reincarnated, 
you can still see them again upon your own return to the spirit world. The ability of a soul to unite with itself is a natural process of energy regeneration after physical death. A client emphatically told me, if we were to bring 100% of our energy into one body during an incarnation, we would blow the circuits of the brain. A full charge of all a soul's energy into one human body would totally subjugate the brain to the soul's power. Apparently, this could happen even with the less potent, undeveloped souls. I suppose this factor of soul occupation in a host body was evaluated in the early stages of human evolution by those spiritual grandmasters who chose Earth as a planetary school. Moreover, having all the soul's energy capacity in one body would negate the whole process of growth for the soul on Earth, because it would have no challenge coping with the brain. By strengthening a variety of parts of a soul's total energy in different incarnations, the whole is made stronger. Full awareness at 100% would have had another adverse effect. If we did not divide our energy, we would experience a higher level of spiritual memory retention in each human body. Amnesia forces us to go into the testing area of the laboratory of Earth without the answers for the tasks we were sent here to accomplish. Amnesia also relieves us of the baggage for past failures, so we may use new approaches with more confidence. The ghost in Case 15 indicated how it is possible for souls to miscalculate the percentage of energy concentration they bring into a life. One client called this our light quotient. In a strange fashion, I find my level 4 and 5 subjects shortchange themselves more than the less developed souls. This was demonstrated by the warrior soul in Case 22. Typically, a highly advanced soul will bring no more than 25% of its total capacity to Earth, where the average, less confident soul has 50-70%. to 70%. The energy of a more evolved soul is refined, elastic, and vigorous in smaller quantities. This is why the younger soul must bring more energy into their early incarnations. Thus, it is not the volume of energy which gives potency to the soul, but the quality of vibrational power representing a soul's experience and wisdom. How does this information help us understand the combined force of soul and human energy? Every soul has a specific energy field pattern which reflects an immortal blueprint of its character, regardless of the number of divided parts. When this spiritual ego is combined with a more structured personality of a physical brain, a higher density field is produced. The subtleties of this symbiosis are so intricate I have only scratched the surface. Both blueprints of energy react to each other in an infinite number of ways to become one to the outside world. This is why our physical well-being, senses, and emotions are so tied to the spiritual mind. Thought is closely associated with how these energy patterns are shaped and melded together, and each nourishes the other in our bodies. I frequently use the analogy of a hologram to describe soul division. Holographic images are exact duplicates. This analogy is helpful, but it does not tell the whole story. I have mentioned one variable in the process of soul division as involving the potency of energy concentration in each divided part. This element relates to the experience of the soul. Another variable is the density of material energy in each human body and the emotional makeup which drives that body. If the same soul joins two bodies at the same time and brings 40% of its energy into each body, there will be different manifestations of energy. Think of taking a photograph of the same scene in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. The changes in light refraction would create a different effect on the film. The energy of souls begins with a specific pattern, but once on Earth, these patterns are changed by local conditions. When we review our future life from the spirit world, we are given advice about the energy requirements of the body we will occupy. The decision of how much energy we should take is ours. Many souls want to leave as much behind as possible because they love their home and the activities going on there. 
Emotional and physical trauma drains our energy reserves. We can lose shards of positive energy to people whom we give it to voluntarily or by others who drain it out of us with their negativity. It takes energy to erect and maintain defense mechanisms to protect ourselves. A subject once said to me, When I share my light with those I think worthy of receiving it, I can recharge it faster because it was given freely. One of the best ways we revitalize our energy is through sleep. Once again, we can further divide the energy we brought with us and roam freely, while leaving a small percentage behind to alert the larger portion to return quickly if needed. As I mentioned earlier, this capacity is especially useful when the body is in a state of illness, unconsciousness, or in a coma. Since time is not a limiting factor for a freed soul, hours, days, or weeks away from the body are all rejuvenating. I might add that souls can also be recharged by loving spirits during a crisis. We interpret these energy boosts as profound revelations. A few hours rest from the human body can do wonders for a soul, as long as the remaining portion left behind is on cruise control and not coping with a complex dream analysis. That circumstance may cause us to wake up exhausted. Since living parallel lives is another option for soul division, what are the motivations and effects from this decision? Many people feel it is common for souls to live parallel lives. I have found this not to be true at all. The souls who choose to split into two or more bodies within the same general time frame on earth want to accelerate their learning. Thus, a soul might leave up to 10% of its energy behind and place the rest in two or three bodies. Because we have free will, our guides will allow for these experiments, but they advise against it. On the whole, since the energy drain is enormous, most souls who try parallel lives do so only a time or two before giving it up. Souls don't wish to lead parallel lives unless they are extraordinarily ambitious. Also, souls don't split their energy to incarnate as twins. Dividing your energy to be in a family with the same genetics, parental influence, environment, nationality, and so forth would be counterproductive. Such a lack of diversity would provide little motivation for living a parallel life. People are curious about the origins of two souls in the body of identical twins. I had two sisters in their late twenties as clients, born one minute apart, the souls of these women are intimately connected in the same spirit group. However, they are not strictly primary soulmates. Each has met and lives with their own male soulmate, with whom they are deeply in love. These two souls have lived for thousands of years as close friends, siblings, parents, and children of one another, but not as mates. They have never been twins before, and the reason for their doing so currently was twofold. They had unresolved trust issues in their past life relationship, but they said the major reason was, together, our combined energy field is doubled, which makes us more effective in reaching other minds. People asked me if a soul did not bring enough energy into its body during the fetal state, can it retrieve more later in life? I find that once the energy formula of a given percentage is chosen in advance by a soul, it stays. To permanently add more fresh energy from the spirit world during a life would likely disrupt the delicate balance initially established between the soul and a new human brain. Also, it seems improbable that an incarnated being could retrieve an ethereal substance from its discarnated self. However, with the help of their guides, some people have the ability to communicate or temporarily tap into their own energy reserve during a crisis. The process of souls reuniting with the rest of their energy becomes most evident for me when I regress my subjects through a former death experience. Unless there are complications from the last life, most souls reacquire the balance of their energy at one of the three primary spiritual stations, near the gateway, during orientation, or after returning to their soul group. The advanced souls usually disembark only at the final stop on their journey home.
The Three Stations Receiving our own energy at the gateway is not really a common occurrence. This is probably due to the initiation of recovery by a shower of healing near the gate. I do hear about it once in a while, though, as with the soul in my next quote, whose deceased husband brought a small remaining portion of her energy to the first stop. She explained the circumstances this way. My love could easily handle the little energy I saved. He brought this to me and spread it over me gently with his hands like a blanket as we were embracing. He knew how old and tired I was and he asked to come. Once contact is made, the rest of my energy comes into me as a magnet. I feel so expanded by it. The first thing I notice is that I can read his mind so much better telepathically and I sense so much more of what is around me. When our guides conclude that it would be an advantage to have more of our energy at the second station during orientation, this decision has different ramifications. Basically, the decision rests on the belief that our debriefing from a difficult life will be more productive. Then, too, we might not be returning to our spirit group for some reason right after orientation. Here is an example of soul reunification at this stop. I am in a plain room which looks futuristic, with smooth milk-white walls. There is a table and two chairs. This furniture has no edges. My guide, Everend, is concerned over my lack of responsiveness. She is about to perform what we call melting the physical form. She holds the rest of my energy in a beautiful, translucent vessel which radiates. Everand comes forward, pressing it into my hands. I feel the upsurge of my energy as an electrical charge. Then she moves close to me, stimulating my natural vibrational frequency to accept more easily what I left behind. As my core center is filled with my own essence, the outer shell of my physical body imprint is melted off. It is as if I were a dog shaking off water droplets from my fur after getting wet. The unwanted earthly particles are jarred loose, dissolved, and my energy now begins to sparkle again instead of being a dull light. The usual way most souls reunite with the balance of their energy is after returning to a cluster group. A subject put it this way. It is smoother for me to reunite with myself after I arrive at home base with my friends. Here the infusion of my rested energy can be assimilated at my own pace. When I am ready, I go get it myself. Case 25 This case excerpt is from a discussion I had with a soul called Apollon, who discussed her reunification upon arriving home in a more flamboyant way than the soul in the quote above. Apollon is a level two soul who has just returned to the spirit world from a hard life in Ireland as a poor woman who died in 1910. Although physically strong and self-reliant, Apollon was married to a domineering alcoholic husband and had to raise five children virtually alone. She suffered from a lack of personal freedom and self-expression. I see Apollon's welcoming home party as a reflection of a job well done after this difficult life. Dr. N. Tell me, Apollon, after you have finished with the initial greetings from your spirit group, does the time soon arrive when you unify with your own energy reserve? Subject, grinning. My guide, Canaris, enjoys making a ceremony out of unification. Dr. N., with the energy you left behind. Subject, yes. Canaris goes to an alcove in our enclosure, where my energy is stored in a glass urn waiting for me. It is under his care. Dr. N., I gather your energy reserve has not been too active since your absence? What percentage of the total did you leave behind? Subject. Only 15%. I needed a lot for my Irish life. This part was able to engage with my group 
and I could move around our area, but I didn't participate in recreational diversions. Dr. N. I understand. But is this weakened 15% a completely whole representation of your soul? Subject. Vehemently. Absolutely. Only a smaller version of me. Dr. N. And was this 15% of you able to keep up with group lessons and greet people while the other 85% was on Earth? Subject. Hmm. To an extent, yes. I continue to gain knowledge in both settings. Earth and the spirit world. Dr. N. Offhanded. I'm curious about something. If that 15% is still viable, why don't you just go get it yourself? What do you need Canaris for? Subject. Offended. That would spoil his ceremony. Canaris is the keeper of my flame, so to speak, while I am gone. Besides, what you suggest would be an infringement on his prerogatives to assist me with melding with my energy. He wants to make a ceremony of it. Dr. N., I'm sorry if I was too presumptuous, Apollon. Why don't you give me a visual picture of the ceremony? Subject, joyfully. Canaris goes to the alcove, and with the proud flourish of a nurturing father, brings it out while all my friends gather around and cheer about a job well done in Ireland. Dr. N., does this party include the soul who was your husband in the Irish life? Subject, Yes, yes, he is in the front row cheering the loudest. He is not really the same person out of his Irish body. Dr. N. All right, then what does Canaris do? Subject. Laughs. He takes my energy in the greenish glass urn out of the alcove. It is glowing, but he rubs it with his hands to make it shine brighter while enjoying our expressions of pleasure. Then he comes close and throws the cloud of light energy over me like a mantle of high office. He assists with my melding with his own powerful vibrations. Dr. N., at this moment, what does having all your energy feel like? Subject, softly. Joining with oneself resembles two globs of mercury coming together on a glass plate. They flow into each other naturally and instantly become homogeneous. I feel a resurgence of power and identity. The warmth of the merger gives me a sense of serenity and peace as well. I feel, well, my immortality. Dr. N. Rhetorically, to elicit a response. Isn't it a shame we don't take 100% of our energy to Earth? Subject. Reacts immediately. Are you serious? No human mind could retain much of itself under those conditions. But I need it a lot for the Irish life. Dr. N. What percentage do you have in your current body? Subject. Oh, around 60%, and it's plenty. Dr. N. I have been told of physical planets where souls go that allow for all of our energy and the retention of full memory. Subject. Sure, and many of these life forms allow for mental telepathy, too. Physical worlds like Earth, with the type of body we have, it's a stage of mental development. Right now, our evolutionary development sets up conditions which we must work through on our own. The limitations are good for us right now. Dr. N., Apollon, explain to me what you understand about how much energy you should take to Earth before every life. Subject, my energy level is monitored by Canaris and my counsel for each body, depending upon the physical and mental characteristics of that body. Certain bodies require more spiritual energy than others, and they know what conditions exist before we enter the life. Dr. N., well, you told me this Irish woman was physically strong, and I assume she had a strong will as well for you to have survived intact. Nevertheless, you took a lot of your energy to Ireland. Subject. Yes, she was stronger than I am today, but she needed my spiritual help, 
and I needed her strength to assert what influence I could to survive with some identity in a life of deprivation. We were not always in harmony. Dr. N., so when you are not in harmony with a body, it takes more personal soul energy? Subject, oh, yes. And if your environment is harsh, that too must be taken into consideration. I feel very much in sync with my current body, although I sometimes wish I had the stamina of the Irish body. There are many variables. That is the challenge. That's what is fun. Note, Today, Apollon has incarnated as an independent businesswoman who travels all over the world for an international financial consulting firm. She has had numerous offers of marriage, all of which she has refused. Occasionally, a client will tell me that after a former life, they preferred to wait longer than normal before unifying with their energy. This is illustrated by the following quote. Sometimes I like to wait until after my council meeting because I don't want the fresh energy to dilute the memories and feelings I had in the life just lived. If I did infuse myself by taking in reserve energy, that former life would be less real to me. I want my thoughts to be centered on answering questions about my work in that body with a clear, lucid memory of each event. I want to retain every emotional feeling I had of these events as they occurred so I can better describe why I took certain actions. My friends don't like to do this, but I can always recharge and rest later. 5. Soul Group Systems Soul Birthing I think it is appropriate to begin an exploration of soul life with the creation of that life. Very few of my subjects have the memory capacity to go back to their origins as particles of energy. Some details of a soul's early life come to me from the rank beginners. These young souls have a shorter life history both in and out of the spirit world, so they still have fresh memories. However, at best, my level one subjects have only fleeting memories about the genesis of self. The following quotes from two beginner souls are illustrations. My soul was created out of a great irregular cloudy mass. I was expelled as a tiny particle of energy from this intense, pulsating, bluish, yellow, and white light. The pulsations send out hailstorms of soul matter. Some fall back and are reabsorbed, but I continued outward and was being carried along in a stream with others like me. The next thing I knew, I was in a bright, enclosed area with very loving beings taking care of me. I remember being in a nursery of some sort where we were like unhatched eggs in a beehive. When I acquired more awareness, I learned I was in the nursery world of Euros. I don't know how I got there, I was like an egg in embryonic fluid waiting to be fertilized, and I sensed there were many other cells of young lights who were coming awake with me. There was a group of mothers, beautiful and loving, who pierced our membrane sacs and opened us. There were swirling currents of intense nurturing lights around us, and I could hear music. My awareness began with curiosity. Soon I was taken from Euros and joined other children in a different setting. The most revealing reports about soul nurseries come my way only infrequently from a very few highly advanced subjects. These are the specialists known as incubator mothers. The next case is a representative of this branch of service, who is an exceptional level five, called Sina. Case 26 This individual is a specialist with children, both in and out of the spirit world. Currently, she works through hospice with severely ill children. In her past life, she was a Polish woman who, although not Jewish, volunteered to enter a German internment camp in 1939. She did so ostensibly to wait on the officers and perform kitchen duties, which was a ruse. She wanted to be near the Jewish children entering the camp and to help them in any way possible. 
As a local resident of a nearby town, she could have left the camp at any time in the first year. Then it was too late and the soldiers would not allow her to leave. Eventually she died in the camp. This advanced soul might have survived longer if she had brought more than 30% of her energy to sustain herself during the hardships of this assignment. Such is the confidence of a level five. Dr. N. Sina, what has been your most significant experience between your lives? Subject, without hesitation. I go to the place of hatching, where souls are hatched. I am an incubator mother, a kind of midwife. Dr. N. Are you telling me you work in a soul nursery? Subject, brightly. Yes, we help the new ones emerge. We facilitate early maturation by being warm, gentle, and caring. We welcome them. Dr. N. Please explain the surroundings of the place to me. Subject. It's gas-like. A honeycomb of cells with swirling currents of energy above. There is intense light. Dr. N. When you say honeycomb... I wonder if you mean that the nursery has a beehive structure or what? Subject. Um, yes. Although the nursery itself is a vast emporium without seeming to be limited by outside dimensions, the new souls have their own incubator cells where they stay until their growth is sufficient to be moved away from the emporium. Dr. N. As an incubator mother, when do you first see the new souls? Subject. We are in the delivery suite, which is a part of the nursery at one end of the emporium. The newly arrived ones are conveyed as small masses of white energy, encased in a gold sack. They move slowly in a majestic, orchestrated line of progression toward us. Dr. N. From where? Subject. At our end of the emporium, under an archway, the entire wall is filled with a molten mass of high-intensity energy and vitality. It feels as if it's energized by an amazing love force rather than a discernible heat source. The mass pulsates and undulates in a beautiful flowing motion. Its color is like that on the inside of your eyelids if you were to look through closed eyes at the sun on a bright day. Dr. N., and from out of this mass you see souls emerge? Subject. From the mass, a swelling begins. Never exactly from the same site twice. The swelling increases and pushes outward, becoming a formless bulge. The separation is a wondrous moment. A new soul is born. It's totally alive with an energy and distinctness of its own. Note. Another one of my level fives made this statement about incubation. I see an egg-shaped mass with energy flowing out and back in. When it expands, new soul energy fragments are spawned. When the bulge contracts, I think it pulls back those souls which were not successfully spawned. For some reason, these fragments could not make it on to the next step of individuality. Dr. N., what do you see beyond the mass, Sina? Subject. Long pause. I see this beatific glow of orange-yellow. There is a violet darkness beyond, but not cold darkness. It is eternity. Dr. N. Can you tell me more about the line of progression of new souls moving toward you out of the mass? Subject. Out of the fiery orange-yellow, the progression is slow as each hatchling emerges from the energy mass. They are conveyed off to various points where mothering souls like myself are positioned. Dr. N. How many mothers do you see? Subject. I can see five nearby who, like me, are in training. Dr. N. What are the responsibilities of an incubator mother? Subject. We hover around the hatchlings so we can towel-dry them after opening their gold sacks. 
Their progression is slow because this allows us to embrace their tiny energy in a timeless, exquisite fashion. Dr. N., what does towel drying mean to you? Subject, we dry the new soul's wet energy, so to speak. I can't really explain all this well in human language. It's a form of hugging new white energy. Dr. N., so now you basically see white energy? Subject, yes, and as they come next to us, up close, I see more blue and violet glowing around them. Dr. N., why do you think this is so? Subject, pause, then softly. Oh, I see now. This is an umbilical, the genesis cord of energy which connects each one. Dr. N., from what you are saying, I get a picture of a long pearl necklace. The souls are the pearls connected in a line. Is this at all accurate? Subject, yes, rather like a string of pearls on a silvery conveyor belt. Dr. N., okay, now tell me, when you embrace each new soul, dry them out, does this give them life? Subject reacts quickly. Oh, no. Through us, not from us, comes a life force of all-knowing love and knowledge. What we pass on with our vibrations during the drying of new energy is the essence of a beginning, a hopefulness of future accomplishment. The mothers call it the love hug. This involves instilling thoughts of what they are and what they can become. When we enfold a new soul in a love hug, it infuses this being with our understanding and compassion. Dr. N., let me carry this vibrational hugging one step further. Does each new soul have an individual character at this point? Do you add or subtract from its given identity? Subject, no, this is in place upon arrival. Although the new soul does not yet know who they are, we bring nurturing. We are announcing to the hatchling that it is time to begin. By sparking its energy, we bring to the soul an awareness of its existence. This is the time of the awakening. Dr. N. Sina, please help me here. When I think of obstetric nurses in a hospital maternity ward holding and nurturing new human babies, they have no idea what kind of person a baby will turn out to be. Do you function in the same manner, not knowing about the immortal character of these new souls? Subject laughs. We function as nursery caregivers, but this is not a human maternity ward. At the moment we embrace the new ones, we know something of their identity. Their individual patterns become more evident as we unite our energy with them to give them sustenance. This allows us to better utilize our vibrations to activate, to ignite their awareness. All this is part of their beginning. Dr. N., as a trainee, how did you acquire this knowledge of the proper employment of vibrations with new souls? Subject, this is something new mothers have to learn. If it is not performed properly, the hatchling souls move on not feeling fully ready. Then one of the nursery masters must step in later. Dr. N., can you take me a little further here, Sina? During your love hug, when you first embrace these souls, do you and the mothers discern an organized selection process behind the assignment of a new soul's identity? For instance, could we have ten courageous type souls come through, followed by ten more cautious souls? Subject, that is so mechanistic. Each soul is unique in its totality of characteristics created by a perfection that I cannot begin to describe. What I can tell you is that no two souls are alike, none, ever. Note, I have heard from a few other subjects that one of the basic reasons each soul is different from the other is that after the source breaks off energy fragments to create a soul, what is left of the original mass becomes infinitesimally altered 
so it is not exactly the same as before. Thus, the source is like a divine mother who would never create twin children. Dr. N., pressing, wanting my subject to correct me. Do you think this is a totally random selection? There is no order of characteristics with matched similarities of any kind? You know this to be true? Subject, frustrated. How could I know this unless I was a creator? There are souls with similarities and those with none, all in the same batch. The combinations are mixed. As a mother, I can tweak each major trait that I sense, and this is why I can tell you no two have exactly the same combinations of character. Dr. N. Well, subject breaks in to continue. Subject. I have the sense that there is a powerful presence on the other side of the archway who is managing things. If there is a key to the energy patterns, we do not need to know of this. Note. These are the moments I wait for in my sessions where I try to push open the door to the ultimate source. The door never opens more than a crack. Dr. N., please tell me what you feel about this presence, about the energy mass which is bringing these new souls to you. Surely you and the other mothers must have thought about the origins of souls here, even though you cannot see it? Subject, in a whisper. I feel the Creator is close by, but may not actually be doing the work of production. Dr. N., gently, meaning the energy mass may not be the primary creator? Subject, uncomfortable. I think there are others who assist. I don't know. Dr. N., taking another tack. Is it not true, Sina, that there are imperfections to the new souls? If they were created perfect, there would be no reason for them to be created at all by a perfect creator. Subject, doubtfully. Everything here seems to be perfection. Dr. N., I temporarily move in another direction. Do you work only with souls coming to Earth? Subject, yes, but they could go to all kinds of places. Only a fraction come to Earth. There are many physical worlds similar to Earth. We call them pleasure worlds and suffering worlds. Dr. N. And do you know when a soul is right for Earth, based upon your incarnation experience? Subject. Yes, I do. I know that the souls who come to worlds such as Earth need to be strong and resilient because of the pain they have to endure along with the joy. Dr. N. That's my understanding, too. And when these souls become contaminated by the human body, particularly the young ones, this is because they are less than perfect. Might that be true? Subject. Well, I suppose, yes. Dr. N. Continuing. Which indicates to me that they must work to acquire more substance than they had originally in order to acquire full enlightenment. Would you accept that premise? Subject. Long pause, then with a sigh. I think perfection is there with the newly created. Maturity begins by the shattering of innocence with new souls, not because they are originally flawed. Overcoming obstacles makes them stronger, but the acquired imperfections will never be totally erased until all souls are joined together. When incarnation ends. Dr. N., isn't this going to be difficult with new souls being created all the time to take the place of those ending their incarnations on earth? Subject. This too will end when all people, all races, nationalities, unite as one. This is why we are sent to places such as earth to work. Dr. N. So when the training ends, will the universe we live in die as well? Subject. It may die before. It doesn't matter. There are others. Eternity never ends. It is the process which is meaningful because it allows us to savor the experience and express ourselves and to learn. Before continuing with the evolution of a soul's progress, 
I should list what differences I have learned about their existence once they are created. 1. There are energy fragments which appear to return to the energy mass that created them before they even reach the nursery. I do not know the reason for their being aborted. Others who do reach the nursery are unable to handle learning to be on an individual basis during early maturation. Later, they are associated with collective functions, and from what I can determine, never leave the spirit world. 2. There are energy fragments who have individual soul essences that are not inclined or have the necessary mental fabric to incarnate in physical form on any world. They are often found on mental worlds, and they also appear to move easily between dimensions. 3. There are energy fragments with individual soul essences who incarnate only on physical worlds. These souls may well receive training in the spirit world with mental spheres between lives. I do not find them as interdimensional travelers. 4. There are energy fragments who are souls with the ability and inclination to incarnate and function as individuals in all types of physical and mental environments. This does not necessarily give them more or less enlightenment than other soul types. However, their wide range of practical experience positions them for many specialization opportunities and assignments of responsibility. The grand scheme for the newborn soul starts slowly. Once they are released from the nursery, these souls do not enter into incarnations, nor are they even formed into soul groups right away. Here is one description of this transition period from the still fresh memory of a young level one soul with only a couple of incarnations under his belt. Before I was assigned to my soul group and began coming to earth, I remember being given the opportunity to experience a semi-physical world as a light form. It was more a mental world than physical because my surroundings were not completely solid and there was no biological life. I saw other young souls with me, and we could move easily around the ground as luminous bulbs with a semblance of the human form. We were not doing, just being, and getting the feel of what it would be like to be solid. Although the setting was more astral than temporal, we were learning to communicate with each other as beings living in a community. We had no responsibilities. There was a utopian atmosphere of tremendous love, security, and protection everywhere. I have since learned that nothing is static, and this, the beginning time, would be the easiest of our existence. Soon we would exist in a world where we would not be protected, in places where we would have memories of pain and loneliness, and pleasure too, and that these experiences are the teaching memories. Spiritual Settings While in trance, my subjects describe many visual images of the spirit world in earthly symbolisms. They may create structural images from their own planetary experiences or have these images created for them by guides seeking to raise their comfort level with familiar surroundings. After discussing this aspect of unconscious memory at lectures, I have had people say that Regardless of the consistency of these observations, they strain credibility. How could schoolrooms, libraries, and temples exist in the spirit world? I address these questions by explaining that past observational memory is metaphoric as a current perspective. Original scenes from all our lives never leave our memory as souls. In the spirit world, seeing a temple is not a literal record of stone blocks but rather a visualization of the meaning the temple has to that soul. Back on Earth, memories of past events in our soul life are reconstructions of circumstances and events based upon interpretations and conscious knowledge. All client memory retrieval is based upon observations of the soul mind processing information through a human mind. Regardless of the visual structures of spiritual settings, I always look to the functional aspects of what a subject is doing in them. Once the new souls leave their protective cocoons, they enter into community life. As they begin their incarnations, 
descriptions of the places and structures they see between lives take on the same flavor as that of older souls who go to earth. Sometimes these descriptions are not so earthly. I hear reports of cathedral-like structures of glass, great halls of crystals, geometric buildings with many angles and smooth domed enclosures without lines. Then, too, my subjects might say their surroundings have no structures, only fields of flowers and countryside scenes with forests and lakes. People in hypnosis display a sense of awe as they report floating toward their destinations in the spirit world. Many are so overcome they cannot adequately describe what they see. I hear many accounts about the sheer movement of souls in transition going from place to place. The following account is from a level four subject who uses geometric shapes to describe the properties of the various settings he sees. I do a lot of traveling around in the spirit world. The geometric shapes I see represent certain functions to me. Each structure has its own energy system. The pyramids are for solitude, meditation, and healing. The rectangular shapes are for past life reviews and study. The spheroids are used to examine future lives, and the cylinder portals are for traveling to other worlds to gain perspective. Sometimes I pass great hubs of soul activity, like an airport, with people being paged telepathically. The hubs are huge prismatic wheels with directional spoke lines which curve away from you. It's busy but well organized. Laughs. You can't rush in too fast, or you might overshoot the particular line you want out of these great hubs. These centers are ports of call, with host souls directing traffic and looking out for inquiries from travelers. Everything moves with a soft, comfortable floating motion, and there are beautiful harmonic tones upon which souls can vibrationally lock onto, keeping them on track to their destinations. There is a statement from the Upanishads of India about our senses being carried in memory after death. I believe this old philosophical text is correct in the assumption that the senses, emotions, and human ego are a path to infinite experience, which provides a physical consciousness to the immortal self. These sentiments were expressed by a client of mine in a cogent way. We can create anything we want in the spirit world to remind us of places and things we enjoyed on earth. Our physical simulations are almost perfect. To many, they are perfect. But without a body, well, to me, they have the flavor of imitations. I love oranges. I can create an orange here and even come close to reproducing its pithy, sweet taste. Still, it is not quite the same as biting into an orange on earth. This is one reason why I relish my physical reincarnations. Despite this client's comments, I have had subjects tell me they see the spirit world as true reality and earth as an illusion created to teach us. There may be no contradiction here. People from earth have keen taste buds. Oranges and human beings are therefore in harmony with each other in one existence. There are degrees of reality. Simply because our universe is a training ground does not make it unreal, only impermanent. What may be a temporary illusion in the span of human surroundings does not take away from the fact that an orange on earth, eaten by an earthling, does taste better than one created in the spirit world and eaten by a soul. By the same token, the reality of an interdimensional spirit world with its lack of absolutes allows the soul a magnitude of experience far beyond physical conceptions. When my subjects describe seeing their spiritual centers, it is a wondrous image for them. All cultural stereotypes, mixed with aspects of metaphoric symbolism recalled by the human mind, are in play to be sure, but these dramatic reenactments in a person's spiritual life are no less real. When the soul returns to earth with the shroud of forgetfulness, it must adjust to a new brain without conscious memory. The new baby has no past experiences yet. The reverse is true right after death. For the spiritual hypnotherapist, there are two forces operating in regression. On the one hand, we have the soul mind at work with its great storehouse 
of past life and spiritual life memories. On the other side, we also have the conscious memories of a current body engaged in descriptive imagery while the subject is in hypnosis. The conscious mind is not unconscious during hypnosis. If it were, the subject would be unable to speak to the facilitator coherently. Memory Before continuing with my analysis of what subjects in hypnosis see in the spirit world, I want to provide more information about divisions of memory recall and DNA. There are people who have the belief that all memories are carried by DNA. In this way, they derive comfort from what they consider to be a scientific position against reincarnation. Certainly, everyone has a perfect right not to believe in reincarnation for a number of personal reasons, religious and otherwise. But to say that all past life memory is actually genetic in origin, carried in our DNA cells from remote ancestors, is an argument that, for me, fails in several ways. Unconscious memories of past life trauma are capable of carrying a severely damaged physical imprint of that long-dead body into our new body. But this is not the result of DNA. These molecular codes are brand new and came with our current material body. Attitudes and beliefs from the soul mind do affect the biological mind. There are researchers who believe our eternal intelligence, involving energy imprints and memory patterns from past lives, may influence DNA. Indeed, there are countless other elements involving thought sequencing, which we bring into our host body from hundreds of former lives. This also includes our experiences in the spirit world, where we have no body. A sound argument against past life DNA memory is the volume of research we have accumulated about past lives. The former bodies we had in prior lives are almost never genetically related to our current family. I could have been a member of the Smith family, along with others in my soul group, in one life, and we might all choose to be part of the Jones family in the next life. However, we would not come back to the Smith family, as I will explain more fully in Chapter 7. The average subject has led past lives as Caucasians, Orientals, and Africans with no hereditary connections. Moreover, how can our memories of being on other worlds in other species come from human DNA cells created only on Earth? The answer is simple. So-called genetic memory is actually soul memory, emanating from the unconscious mind. I divide memory into three categories. 1. Conscious memory. This state of thought would apply to all memories retained by the brain in our biological body. It is manifested by a conscious ego self that is perceptive and adaptive to our physical planet. Conscious memory is influenced by sensory experiences and all our biological, primitive, instinctual drives, as well as emotional experiences. It can be faulty because there are defensive mechanisms related to what it receives and evaluates through impressions from the five senses. 2. Immortal memory Memories in this category appear to come through the subconscious mind. Subconscious thought is greatly influenced by body functions not subject to conscious control, such as heart rate and glandular functions. However, it can also be the selective storeroom of conscious memory. Immortal memory carries the memories of our origins in this life and other physical lives. It is a repository of much of our psyche because the subconscious mind forms the bridge between the conscious and superconscious mind. 3. Divine Memory These are the memories that emanate from our superconscious mind, which houses the soul. If conscience, intuition, and imagination are expressed through the subconscious mind, they are drawn from this higher source. Our eternal soul mind has evolved from superior conceptual thought energy beyond ourselves. Inspiration may seem to spring from immortal memory, but there is a higher intelligence outside our body-mind which forms a part of divine memory. The source of these divine thoughts is elusive. Sometimes we conceive of it as personal memory, 
when actually divine memory represents communication from beings in our immortal existence. Community Centers My next case illustrates the visual associations subjects in a superconscious state bring to descriptive memories of arriving back home. It involves an identification with classical Greece, which is not unusual. I have listened to visualizations so futuristic and surreal as to allow for few comparisons with Earth. People do say to me that words cannot adequately describe the images of what they see at this junction. Once I take a client past the gateway to spaces where they begin to make contact with other spirits, they become exhilarated. In case 27, a subject whose spiritual name is Ariani will associate a Greek temple with her experience after death from her most immediate past life. Perhaps this is not surprising, since so many of my subjects had incarnations during the time when ancient Greece brought the light of a high civilization into a dark world. In art, philosophy, and government, they left a legacy and a challenge for those who followed. This society sought to unite the rational with the spiritual mind, which is remembered by those clients who were part of this golden age. Ariane had her final life in ancient Greece during the 2nd century B.C., just before Rome began its occupation. Case 27 Dr. N. When you approach your spiritual center, Ariane, what do you see there? Subject A beautiful Greek temple with bright white marble columns. Dr. N. Are you creating this image of a temple yourself, or is someone else placing it in your mind for you? Subject It's really there in front of me. Just as I remember it. But someone else could be helping me. My guide? I'm not sure. Dr. N. Is this temple familiar to you? Subject, smiling. I know it so well. It represents the culmination of a series of meaningful lives that I was not to know again for a long time on earth. Dr. N. Why is that? What is it about this temple that means so much to you? Subject. It is a temple to Athena, goddess of wisdom. I was a priestess, with three others. Our job was to tend the flame of knowledge. The flame was on a flat, smooth rock in the center of the temple, with writing etched around it. Dr. N. What does the writing mean? Subject. Pause. Ah. Essentially, to seek truth above all things— and the way to seek truth is to look for harmony and beauty in that which surrounds us in life. Dr. N. Deliberately obtuse. Well, is that all you did? Just making sure the flame didn't go out? Subject, with some exasperation. No, this was a place of learning where a woman could participate. The flame symbolized a sacred flame in our hearts for knowing truth. We held the belief in the holiness of a single God with lesser deities representing parts of that central power. Dr. N., are you telling me that you and the other women had monotheistic beliefs? Subject, smiling. Yes, and our sect went beyond the temple. We were seen by the authorities as being pure in heart and not as an intellectual caste. Most of them did not realize what we were about. They saw Athena in one light while we saw her in another. To us, the flame meant that reason and feeling were not opposed to one another. To us, the temple placed the mind above superstition. We also believed in equality between the sexes. Dr. N., this kind of radical thinking could get you into a lot of trouble with a patriarchal establishment, I suppose. Subject. It did, eventually. Their tolerance eroded, and we had deceit and intrigue within our own ranks, and then betrayal. Our motives were mistrusted. We were disbanded by a sexist state which was losing power and felt our sect was contributing to corruption within the state. Dr. N., and after this series of lives in Greece, you wanted your temple with you in the spirit world? Subject. That's one way of putting it. To my friends and me, this life and a few earlier ones in Greece represented the high point of reason, wisdom, and spirituality. 
I had to wait a long time before openly being able to express these feelings again in a female body. Once I took Ariani into her temple, she saw a huge rectangular gallery without a ceiling, filled with approximately one thousand souls. These souls were a large secondary group whom she saw bunched into smaller clusters, called primary groups, made up of souls numbering from three to twenty-five. Her own cluster was midway back on the right side. As she made her way back, Ariani was accompanied by her guide. She then described how this entrance appears to a returning soul. This scene is one I hear repeated over and over again, involving large numbers of soul groups, regardless of the structural setting. In the superconscious minds of people, these gatherings could just as well be in an amphitheater, palace courtyard, or school auditorium as in a temple. Dr. N. Ariani, give me a sense of what it feels like to make your way through this crowd of souls to your cluster. Subject with excitement. It's uplifting and awesome at the same time. With my guide leading, we start to weave our way left and right between the clusters, some of whom are seated in a circle, and others are standing, talking. In the early stages, most people pay no attention to me, because we are strangers. Souls who are nearby my path might nod their heads in polite acknowledgement of my arrival. Then, about midway through, people who see me become more animated. A man who was my lover two lives ago stands up and gives me a kiss and asks how I am doing. More people in other clusters begin now to smile and wave at me. Some whom I have known in lives only slightly give me a thumbs-up greeting. Then, as I get to a group next to my own cluster, I see my parents. They stop what they are doing and drift over the short space between our two clusters to embrace me and whisper encouragement. Finally, I reach my own group, and everyone is welcoming me back. About half of all my clients see large groups of souls upon their return. The other half report that after their arrival, they see just their own cluster. The visual images of either large or small gatherings of souls can vary with the same soul after different lives. The primary group of souls with whom we are most closely bonded may also appear to these same subjects as people milling about in outdoor scenes of recreation, such as a countryside field of flowers. Regardless of an exterior or interior setting, when they first make contact with their groups, a majority of subjects see no other groups in the area. Instead, the welcoming souls are rather bunched together, with each soul coming forward in turn to the front position. Customarily, a group forms a semicircle around the newly arrived soul. Most of my subjects experience this circular form of greeting. A descriptive representation of this practice will be found in Chapter 7, with Case 47. Those subjects who report going directly into a classroom setting upon returning from a past life have a clear picture in their minds of hallways that connect a series of spaces for study. Unerringly, they seem to know in which space they belong. In these cases, cluster groups commonly stop their activities to welcome any new arrival. Only a very small percentage of my subjects say that their initial meeting with groups of souls involved just floating in air with nothing around. The absence of landscape scenes or physical structures does not last long, even in the minds of these people. Classrooms Any gathering of souls outside a classroom setting, including the large assembly halls, indicates it is a time of general socializing and recreation. This doesn't mean serious discussions are not taking place in these areas, only that soul activities are not directed as in study areas. Here is a typical description from a subject who is moving into a classroom setting. My guide takes me into a star-shaped structure, and I know this is my place of learning. There is a round, domed central chamber which is empty now. I see corridors going off in opposite directions, and we move down one of these halls where the classrooms are located. They are offset in such a way that no two classrooms face each other. This is so we will not bother another room of souls. My room is the third cubicle on the left. I never see more than six rooms to a hallway. 
Each room has an average of 8 to 15 souls working at desks. I know this sounds ridiculous, but that's what I see. As I pass down the hall with my guide, I notice in some rooms, souls are studying quietly by themselves, while others are working in groups of two to five. A different room has the students watching an instructor lecturing at a blackboard. When I enter my room, everyone stops what they are doing and gives me a big smile. Some wave and a few cheer as if they were expecting me. The ones nearest the doorway escort me to a seat and I get ready to participate in the lesson. The whole time I have been gone seems like a brief trip down to the corner grocery store to buy a carton of milk. Most of my subjects visualize the structures of their spiritual classrooms as being single-story, although there are exceptions, such as the next case, with an intermediate-level soul called Rudolph. Case 28 Dr. N. After your last station stop, Rudolph, describe to me what you see as you approach your destination, the place where you belong in the spirit world. Subject. As I come near my pod, there is a park-like atmosphere where the countryside is so quiet and peaceful. I see clusters of bubbles that are smooth and transparent, with souls inside. Dr. N., and do you recognize your own pod? Subject. Oh. Yes. Although my references take some getting used to again. I'm doing fine. I could have done this myself, but my guide Tahama, who appears as an American Indian, came to escort me on this trip because she knew I was tired after a long, hard life. Subject died at age 83 in 1937. She is so considerate. Dr. N. All right, describe your pod for me. Subject. I see my pod as a large bubble, which is a school building, divided into four floors. Inside the bubbles there are many bright, colorful points of soul energy. Dr. N. And all this is transparent from the outside to you? Subject. Semi-transparent. Milky. Dr. N. Okay. Now go inside and describe how you see these four floors and what they mean to you. Subject. The four floors are transparent and look like glass. Each level is connected by a stairway with a compartment for study at one end. On each floor there are groups undergoing instruction. I enter on the first floor where a beginning-level group of eighteen souls is listening to a visiting lecturer called Bayan. I know her. She is very aware of the pitfalls of young people. She is strong but tender. Dr. N. Do you know all the teachers in this school? Subject. Oh, sure, I'm one of them. Just starting, of course. Please don't think I'm bragging. I'm just a student teacher. But I'm very proud. Dr. N. As well you should be, Rudolph. Tell me, does each floor have one primary cluster group? Subject hesitates. Well, the first two do. There are twelve working on the second level. The upper floors have souls from other groups working on their individual specialties. Dr. N. Rudolph, is this the same thing as an independent studies program? Subject. That would be accurate. Dr. N. All right. What happens next to you? Subject. Tahama tells me where I need to be, reminding me that I belong on the third level, but to take as much time as I want. Then she leaves me. Dr. N. Why does she do that? Subject. Oh, you know. Our guides maintain a teacher-student relationship with us in this center. They try not to be real familiar with us, in a social way, because of their professional status. I don't mean for this to sound as though they act like some pompous professors on earth. This is different. The master teachers, such as my other guide, Raylon, keep a little distance from the students when not engaged in teaching, to give them space and allow for individual expression among themselves. They feel it is important for the students' growth not to be hovering around them all the time. Dr. N. 
That's most interesting. Please continue, Rudolph. Subject. Well, Tahama says she will see me later. To be honest, I'm not completely tuned into this place yet. It's just the way I am when I come back. It always takes me a while to acclimatize, so I'm going to relax and enjoy the children on the ground floor. Dr. N. Children? You call these first-level souls children? Subject. Laughing. Well, now, I'm sounding a bit pompous myself. It's just how we describe the beginners, who can be rather childlike in their development. This group is really just starting. They acknowledge me because I have been active with them. I know the ones who are repeating the same mistakes because of a lack of self-discipline. They are not making much effort to move up in development. I don't stay too long because I don't want them to be distracted from Bion's lesson. Dr. N. What is the teacher's attitude about the slow ones? Subject. Frankly, the teachers of the first level do get tired of certain students who almost refuse to progress, so they leave them alone a lot. Dr. N. Are you saying the teachers stop pushing those students who are difficult? Subject. You have to understand that teachers have infinite patience because time is meaningless. They are content to wait until the student is disgusted with treading water and offers to work harder. Dr. N. I see. Please continue with your tour of the school. Subject. I am looking up through the glass ceiling to the second level. That's where I'm headed next. These souls have a fleecy gauze appearance from here. I don't really need a stairway, but it represents a means of passage in my mind. As I climb to the second floor, I see the adolescents. They are like super-active teenagers, full of restless energy, sponges absorbing a lot of information fast and trying to act on that knowledge. They are learning to get a grip on themselves, but many don't know yet how to give back to others in effective ways. Dr. N., as a teacher, would you say that these souls are self-absorbed? Subject. Laughs. That's normal, along with a constant need for outer stimulation. More seriously, I am not yet qualified to teach on this level. Enid is in charge here, a disciplinarian with a big heart. Right now they are on a break. I find them fun to be around because they all pump me for information about the manner in which I have learned to accomplish things on Earth. Soon it's time for me to go to the third level. Dr. N., what would happen if one of these students followed you up into the third level? Subject, smiles. Once in a while, a curious one will wander into more advanced areas. It's similar to a third grader walking down the hall into a sixth grade class. The kid would be lost. They might get teased a little on earth, but someone would quietly take them back to their own classroom. It's the same here. Dr. N., well, I guess you are ready to take me up to the third level. May I have your impressions of this place? Subject, brightly. This is my area, and we are like young adults. Many of us are training to be teachers. The mental challenges here are more constant. Now we are working on resourcefulness, not just reacting to situations. We are learning to protect and inform, to keep our eyes open, and to see the spirit of others through the light in their eyes on our earthly rotations. Dr. N., do you recognize people you know? Subject, oh, I see Elan, husband in both past and current life, a primary soulmate. He appears to me as we were in our last life. Elan sparks up my tired energy with his love, like lighting a fire in a cold stove. I was a widow for a long time. Tearfully. We are sucked up into a pool of happiness together for a few moments. Dr. N., after a pause. Anyone else? Subject. Everybody. There is Esant, mother in current life, and Blay, a best girlfriend in her current life. Subject is suddenly distracted. I want to go up briefly to the fourth level, to see my daughter, Anna. 
also in current life. Dr. N. Tell me what you can about the fourth level. Subject. There are only three souls there, and from below they appear as shapeless shadows of goldish and silver blue. There is such warmth and love with these souls growing into full adulthood. They are becoming very wise in helping souls really make use of their human bodies. I sense they feel more touched by a divine essence. They are in tune with their existence. When they come back from a physical life, they don't need adjusting as I do. Dr. N. Where are the older adults, such as the senior guides, the elders, and others like them? Subject. They are not in this bubble, but we see them elsewhere. The Library of Life Books Many of my clients speak about being in research library settings soon after rejoining their soul groups. I have come to accept the idea that it is a standard learning imperative that we begin to study our past lives in depth right away. After I wrote about the place where our life records are stored in my first book, people asked if I was able to supply them with more details. The people who describe earthly structures in their spiritual home also include the library, and descriptions of this setting are quite consistent. On earth, a library represents a systematic collection of books arranged by subjects and names which provide information. The titles of spiritual life books have my clients' names on them. This may seem odd, but if I were working with an intelligent aquatic being from planet X who had never been to Earth and whose place of study was an ocean tide pool, I'm sure that is what this entity would report seeing in the spirit world. I have reported on spiritual classrooms and smaller adjacent cubicles where primary groups interact, including even smaller isolated rooms where souls can be completely alone for quiet study. There is nothing small about the library. Everyone tells me the location of the life books is seen as a huge study hall in a rectangular structure, with books lined along walls and many souls studying at desks who do not seem to know each other. Once inside this space, librarian guides are the archivist souls in charge of the books. They are quiet, almost monastic beings who assist both guides and students from many primary clusters in locating information. These spiritual libraries serve souls in different ways, depending upon their level of attainment. Souls may be assisted either by their own guides, the archivists, or both. Some of my clients go to the library alone upon returning to the spirit world, while others have guides who routinely accompany them into this space. A guide might get his students started and then leave the room. Many elements come into play here, including the complexity of the research and the timeline to be reviewed by the student's soul. When students are in these study halls, they sometimes work in pairs, but mostly they do their research alone after being assisted by the archivists in finding the proper life books. Eastern philosophy holds that every thought, word, and deed from every lifetime in our past, along with every event in which we participated, is recorded in the Akashic Record. Possibilities of future events can also be seen with the help of scribes. The word Akasha essentially means the essence of all universal memory that is recording every energy vibration of existence, rather like an audiovisual magnetic tape. I have discussed the connections of divine, immortal, and conscious memory. Our human conceptualization of spiritual libraries, timeless places where we study missed opportunities and our accountability for past actions, is an example of those memory connections. People of the East have conceived that the substance of all events past, present, and future is preserved by containment within energy particles and then recovered in a sacred spiritual setting through vibrational alignments. I feel the whole concept of personal spiritual records for each of us did not originate in India or anywhere else on Earth. It began with our spiritual minds already having knowledge of these records between lives. I find it unsettling that certain aspects of recovered memory about spiritual libraries can be subverted by human belief systems which are intended to frighten people. Within Eastern cultures, 
There are those who have been led to believe the life books are analogous to spiritual diaries that can be used as evidence against the soul. Visions of spiritual libraries are interpreted as scenes where cases are prepared as depositions against errant souls based upon their karmic records. A further step in this misguided belief system brings us to the dreaded tribunal for sentencing after testimony about the soul's shortcomings in the last life. Certain psychics claim they have privileged access to events of the future through Akashic records, and that by working exclusively with them, they can divert their followers from catastrophe. Human extravagance has no bounds when it comes to instilling fear. A prime example is the fear of terrible punishment for those who commit suicide. It is true that being kept out of heaven has been a deterrent to suicide, but it is the wrong approach. I have noticed in recent years that even the Catholic Church is not quite so adamant about suicide being a mortal sin, subject to the extremes of spiritual punishment. There is now a Vatican-approved catechism, which states that suicide is against natural law, but adds, by ways known to God alone, there is opportunity for salutary repentance. Salutary means conducive to some good purpose. My next case represents a subject who killed herself in her last life. She describes her examination of this act in a library setting. Repentance in the spirit world often begins here. Since I will be reviewing her suicide, this is a suitable point to briefly digress from the library and address some of the questions I have been asked about suicide and subsequent retribution in the spirit world. When I work with clients who have committed suicide in former lives, the first thing most exclaim right after the moment of death is, Oh my God, how could I have been so stupid? These are physically healthy people, not those who are suffering from a debilitating physical illness. Suicide by a person, young or old, whose physical state has reduced the quality of their life to almost nothing, is treated differently in the spirit world than those who had healthy bodies. While suicide cases are treated with kindness and understanding, people who kill themselves with a healthy body do have a reckoning. In my experience, souls feel no sense of failure or guilt when they have been involved with a mercy death. I shall give a realistic example of this sort of death with a brother and sister under the free will section in chapter 9. When there is unendurable physical suffering, we have the right to be released from the pain and indignity of being treated like helpless children connected to life support systems. In the spirit world, I find that no stigma is attached to a soul leaving a terribly broken body who is released by its own hand or from that of a compassionate caregiver. I have worked with quite a number of people who have attempted suicide in the years before they saw me, and I feel my working with them has provided a helpful perspective. Some were still in emotional turmoil when I met them, while others had pulled away from thoughts of self-destruction. One thing I have learned is that people who tell me they don't belong on earth need to be taken seriously. They may even be potential suicide cases. In my practice, these clients fall into one of three spiritual classifications. 1. Young, highly sensitive souls who began their incarnations on earth but have spent little time here. Certain souls in this category have had great difficulty adjusting to the human body. They feel their very existence to be threatened because it is so cruel. 2. Both young and older souls who incarnated on another planet before coming to Earth. If these souls lived on worlds less harsh than Earth, they may be overcome by the primitive emotions and high density of the human body. These are the hybrid souls I discussed in the last chapter. Essentially, they feel they are in an alien body. 3. Souls below level 3, who have been incarnating on Earth since their creation, but are not merging well with their current body. These souls accepted a life contract with a host body whose physical ego mind is radically different from their immortal soul. They cannot seem to find themselves in this particular lifetime. What happens to souls involved with suicide in healthy bodies? These souls tell me they feel somewhat diminished in the eyes of their guides and group peers because they broke their covenant in a former life. There is a loss of pride from a wasted opportunity. Life is a gift, 
and a great deal of thought has gone into allocating certain bodies for our use. We are the custodians of this body, and that carries a sacred trust. My clients call it a contract. Particularly when a young, healthy person commits suicide, our teachers consider this an act of gross immaturity and the abrogation of responsibility. Our spiritual masters have placed their trust in our courage to finish life with functional bodies in a normal fashion, no matter how difficult. They have infinite patience with us, but with repeated suicide offenders, their forgiveness takes on another tone. I worked with a young client who had tried to commit suicide a year before I saw him. During our hypnosis session, we found evidence of a pattern of self-destruction in former lives. Facing his master teachers at a council meeting following his last life, this client was told by an elder, Once again you are here early and we are disappointed. Have you not learned the same test grows more difficult with each new life you terminate? Your behavior is selfish for many reasons, not the least of which is the sorrow you caused to those left behind who loved you. How much longer will you continue to just throw away the perfectly good bodies we give you? Tell us when you are ready to stop engaging in self-pity and underestimating your capabilities. I don't think I have ever heard of a council member come down any harder on one of my subjects over the issue of suicide. Months later, this client wrote to me to say that whenever thoughts of committing suicide entered his head, he pushed them aside because of a desire to avoid having to face this elder again after killing himself. A little post-hypnotic suggestion on my part made recovering this scene in his conscious mind especially easy and serves as a deterrent. In suicide cases involving healthy bodies, one of two things generally happens to these souls. If they are not a repeat offender, the soul is frequently sent back to a new life rather quickly, at their own request, to make up for lost time. This could be within five years of their death on earth. The average soul is convinced it is important to get right back on the diving board after having taken a belly flop in a prior life. After all, we have natural survival instincts as human beings, and most spirits tenaciously fight to stay alive. For those who display a pattern of bailing out when things get rough, there are places of repentance for a good purpose. These places do not contain a pantheon of horrors in some dark lower spirit region reserved for sinners. Rather than being punished in some sort of bleak purgatory, these souls may volunteer to go to a beautiful planetary world with water, trees, and mountains, but no other life. They have no contact with other souls in these places of seclusion, except for sporadic visits by a guide to assist them in their reflections and self-evaluation. Places of isolation come in many varieties, and I must admit they seem terribly boring. Maybe that's the whole idea. While you are sitting out the next few games on the bench, your teammates continue with challenges in their new lives. Apparently, this medicine seems to work, because these souls come back to their groups feeling refreshed, but knowing they have missed out on a lot of action and opportunities for personal development with their friends. Nonetheless, there are souls who will never adjust to Earth. I hear some are reassigned to other worlds for their future incarnations. My next two cases represent the exposure of souls to spiritual libraries and the impact seeing their records has on them. In both cases, there is evidence of the use of altered reality, with some differences. The woman in case 29, a suicide case, will be shown a series of alternative choices she could have made in her past life, presented in four coexisting time sequences. The first timeline was the actual life itself. She will be more of an observer than a participant in these scenes. With case 30, however, we will see the employment of a single scene with an altered reality, where the soul will dramatically enter a scene from his past life to actually experience a different outcome. Both cases are designed to show the many paths in life involving choices. Our guides decide on the most effective means for self-discovery in the library. The design and scope of these investigations then comes under the jurisdiction of the archivists. Case 29 Amy had recently returned to the spirit world from a small farming village in England, where she killed herself in 1860 
at age 16. This soul would wait another hundred years before coming back due to her self-doubts about handling adversity. Amy drowned herself in a local pond because she was two months pregnant and unmarried. Her lover, Thomas, had been killed the week before in a fall off a thatched roof he was repairing. I learned the two were deeply in love and intended to marry. Amy told me during her past life review that she thought when Thomas was killed, her life was over. Amy said she did not want to bring disgrace upon her family from the gossip of local villagers. Tearfully, this client said, I knew they would call me a whore, and if I ran off to London, this is exactly what a poor girl with child would become. In suicide cases, the soul's guide might offer seclusion, aggressive energy regeneration, a quick return, or some combination of these things. When Amy crossed over after killing herself, her guide, Likiko, and the soul of Thomas were there to comfort her for a while. Soon she was alone with Lakiko in a beautiful garden setting. Amy sensed the disappointment in Lakiko's manner, and she expected to be scolded for her lack of courage. Angrily, she asked her guide why the life didn't go as planned in the beginning. She had not seen the possibility of suicide before her incarnation. Amy thought she was supposed to marry Thomas, have children, and live happily in her village to old age. Someone, she felt, had pulled the rug out from under her. Lakiko explained that Thomas's death was one of the alternatives in this life cycle, and that she had the freedom to make better choices than killing herself. Amy learned that for Thomas, his choice to go up on a high, steep, and dangerously slippery roof was a probable one, more probable because his soul mind had already considered this accident as a test for her. Later, I was to learn Thomas came very close to not accepting the roof job because of internal forces pulling him the other way. Apparently, everyone in this soul group saw that Amy's capacity for survival was greater than she gave herself credit for, although she had shown tenuous behavior in her earlier lives. Once on the other side, Amy thought the whole exercise was cruel and unnecessary. Lakika reminded Amy that she had a history of self-flagellation, and that if she was ever going to help others with their survival, she must get past this failing in herself. When Amy responded that she had little choice but to kill herself, given the circumstances of Victorian England, she found herself in the following library scene. Dr. N. Where are you now? Subject, somewhat disoriented. I'm in a place of study. It looks gothic. Stone walls. Long marble tables. Dr. N. Why do you think you are in this sort of building? Subject. Pause. In one of my lives I lived as a monk in Europe, in the twelfth century. I loved the old church cloister as a place for quiet study. But I know where I am now. It is the library of great books. The records. Dr. N. Many people call them life books. Is this the same thing? Subject. Yes, we all use them. Pause. Subject is distracted. There is a worrisome-looking old man in a white robe coming toward me, fluttering around me. Dr. N. What's he doing, Amy? Subject. Well, he's carrying a set of scrolls, rolls of charts. He is muttering and shaking his head at me. Dr. N., do you have any idea why? Subject. He is the librarian. He says to me, You are here early. Dr. N., what do you think he means? Subject. Pause. That I did not have compelling reasons for arriving back here early. Dr. N., compelling reasons. Subject. Breaking in. Oh, being in terrible pain, not able to function in life. Dr. N. I see. Tell me what this librarian does next. Subject. There is a huge open space where I see many souls at long desks with books everywhere, but I'm not going to that room now. The old man takes me to one of the small private rooms off to the side where we can talk without disturbing the others. Dr. N. 
How do you feel about this? Subject. Shakes head in resignation. I guess I need special treatment right now. The room is very plain with a single table and chair. The old man brings in a large book, and it is set up in front of me like a TV viewing screen. Dr. N. What are you supposed to do? Subject. Abruptly. Pay attention to him. He sets his scroll in front of me first and opens it. Then he points to a series of lines representing my life. Dr. N., please go slowly here and explain what these lines mean to you, Amy. Subject, they are lifelines. My lines. The thick, widely spaced lines represent the prominent experiences in our life and the age they will most likely occur. The thinner ones bisect the main lines and represent a variety of other... Circumstances. Dr. N. I have heard these less prominent lines are possibilities of action, as opposed to the probabilities. Is that what you are saying? Subject. Pause. That's right. Dr. N. What else can you tell me about the thick versus thin lines? Subject. Well, the thick line is like the trunk of a tree, and the smaller ones are the branches. I know the thick one was my main path. The old man is pointing at that line and scolding me a bit about taking a dead-end branch. Dr. N. You know, Amy, despite this archivist fussing about these lines, they do represent a series of your choices. From a karmic standpoint, all of us have taken a wrong fork in the road from time to time. Subject, heatedly. Yes, but this is serious. I did not just make a small mistake in his eyes. I know he cares about what I do. There is a pause, and then loudly. I want to hit him over the head with his damn scroll. I tell him, you go try my life for a while. Note. At this point, Amy tells me that the old man's face softens, and he leaves the room for a few minutes. She thinks he is giving her time to collect herself, but then he brings back another book. This book is open to a page where Amy can see the archivist as a young man being torn apart by lions in an ancient Roman arena for his religious convictions. He then puts this book aside and opens Amy's book. I ask her what she sees next. Subject. It comes alive in three-dimensional color. He shows me the first page with a universe of millions of galaxies, then the Milky Way, and our solar system, so I will remember where I came from. As if I could forget. Then more pages are turned. Dr. N. I like this perspective, Amy. Then what do you see? Subject. Ah, crystal prisms. Dark and light depending upon what thoughts are sent. Now I remember I have done this before. More lines. And pictures which I can move forward and backward in time with my mind. But the old man is helping me anyway. Note, I have been told these lines form vibrational sequences representing timeline alignments. Dr. N. How would you interpret the meaning of the lines? Subject. They form the patterns for the life pictures in the order you wish to look at, that you need to look at. Dr. N. I don't want to get ahead of you, Amy. Just tell me what the old man does with you now. Subject. Okay. He flips to a page, and I see myself on screen in the village I just left. It isn't really a picture. It's so real. It's alive. I'm there. Dr. N. Are you actually in the scene, or are you simply observing the scene? Subject. We can do both, but right now I am supposed to just watch the scenes. Dr. N. That's fine, Amy. Let's go through the scene as the old man is presenting it to you. Explain what is going on. Subject. Oh, we are going to look at other choices. After seeing what I actually did at the pond where I took my life, the next scene has me back at the pond on the bank. Pause. This time I don't wade in and drown myself. I walk back to the village. Laughs for the first time. I'm still pregnant. 
Dr. N, laughing with her. Okay, turn the page. Now what? Subject. I'm with my mother, Iris. I tell her I am carrying Thomas's baby. She is not as shocked as I thought she would be. She is angry, though. I get a lecture. Then she is crying with me and holding me. Subject now breaks down while tearfully continuing to talk. I tell her I am a good girl, but I was in love. Dr. N. Does Iris tell your father? Subject. That is one alternative on the screen. Dr. N. Follow that alternative path for me. Subject. Pause. We all move to another village, and everyone there is told I am a widow. Years later, I will marry an older man. These are very hard times. My father lost a lot when we moved, and we were even poorer than before. But we stay together as a family, and life eventually becomes good. Crying again. My little girl was beautiful. Dr. N., is that the only alternative course of action you study right now? Subject, with resignation. Oh, no. Now I look at another choice. I come back from the pond and admit I am pregnant. My parents scream at me and then fight with each other about who is to blame. I am told they do not want to give up our small farm they worked so hard for and leave the village because I am disgraced. They give me a little money to get to London so I can try to find work as a serving girl. Dr. N. And how does this work out? Subject, bitterly. Just what I expected. London would not have been good. I wind up in the streets sleeping with other men. Shudders. I die kind of young, and the baby is a foundling who eventually dies too. Horrible. Dr. N., well, at least you tried to survive in that alternative life. Are any other choices shown to you? Subject. I'm growing tired. The old man shows me one last choice. There are others, I think, but he will stop here because I ask him to. In this scene, my parents still believe I should go away from them. But we wait until a traveling peddler comes to our village. He agrees to take me in his cart after my father pays him something. We do not go to London, but rather to other villages in the district. I finally find work with a family. I tell them my husband was killed. The peddler gave me a brass ring to wear and backs up my story. I'm not sure they believe me. It doesn't matter. I settle in the town. I never marry, but my child grows up healthy. Dr. N., after you are finished turning these pages with the old man and have contemplated some of the alternatives to suicide, what are your conclusions? Subject, sadly. It was a waste to kill myself. I know it now. I think I knew it all along. Right after I died, I said to myself, God, that was a stupid thing to do. Now I'm going to have to do it all over again. When I went before my council, they asked if I would like to be retested soon. I said, let me think about it a while. After this session, my client discussed some of the choices she has had to make in her current life involving courage. As a teenager, she became pregnant and dealt with this difficulty through the help of a school counselor and finally her mother, who was Iris in her life as Amy. They encouraged her to stand up for herself regardless of the opinions of others. In our session together, my subject learned her soul has a tendency to prejudge serious events in her life in a negative manner. In many past lives, there was always a nagging thought that whatever decision she made in a crisis would be the wrong one. Although Amy was reluctant to return to Earth again, today she is a woman of much greater confidence. She spent the hundred years between lives reflecting on her suicide and decisions made in the centuries before this life. Amy is a musical soul, and she said at one point, Because I wasted the body assigned to me, I'm doing a kind of penance. During recreation, I can't go to the music room, which I love to do, because I need to be alone in the library. 
I use the screens to review my past actions involving choices where I have hurt myself and those around me. When a client uses the word screen to describe how they view events, the setting is relevant. Small conference rooms and the library appear to have tables with a variety of TV-sized books. These so-called books have three-dimensional illuminated viewing screens. One client echoed the thoughts of most subjects when she said, These records give the illusion of books with pages, but they are sheets of energy which vibrate and form live picture patterns of events. The size of these screens depends upon usage within a given setting. For instance, in the life selection rooms we use just before our next incarnation, the screens are much larger than seen in spiritual libraries and classrooms. Souls are given the option of entering these life-sized screens. The huge, shimmering screens usually encircle the soul, and they have been called the Ring of Destiny. I will discuss the ring further in Chapter 9. Despite the impressive size of the screens in future life selection rooms, souls spend far more time looking at scenes in the library. The function of the smaller library screens is for monitoring past and current time on Earth on a continuing basis. All screens, large or small, have been described to me as sheets of film which look like waterfalls that can be entered while part of our energy stays in the room. All cosmic viewing screens are multidimensional, with coordinates to record space-time avenues of occurrence. These are often referred to as timelines, and they can be manipulated by thought scanning. There may be other directors of this process not seen by the soul. Quite often, a subject will employ mechanical contrivances in their scanning descriptions, such as panels, levers, and dials. Apparently, these are all illusions created for souls who incarnate on Earth. Regardless of screen size, the length, width, and depth in each frame allows the soul to become part of a procession of cause and effect sequences. Can souls enter the smaller screens associated with books in the same way as with the larger screens found in the ring? While there are no restrictions for time travel study, most of my subjects appear to use the smaller screens more for observing past events in which they once participated. Souls take a portion of their energy, leaving the rest at the console, and enter the screens in one of two ways. One, as observers moving as unseen ghosts through scenes on Earth with no influence on events. I see this as working with virtual reality. Two, as participants, where they will assume roles in the action of the scene, even to the extent of altering reality from the original by recreations. Once reviewed, everything returns to what it was, since the constant reality of a past event on a physical world remains the same from the perspective of the soul who took part in the original event. As the dialogue progresses in my next case, it will be obvious that an unseen entity is recreating a past life scene but with alterations. These adjustments are intended to elicit empathy and teach the soul in Case 30. This case is an example of what some of my clients mean when they talk about entering worlds of altered time and causality through screens found in books, desk consoles, and viewing theaters. Although these space-time training exercises do not change the course of the original historical event on Earth, there may be other forces at work here. I concede the possibility that my subject's memories could demonstrate that they are moving through parallel universes which might nearly duplicate our own space-time. Yet, in spiritual classrooms and libraries, they do not see past events on Earth as being outside the reality of our universe. I do have the feeling that what a soul from Earth is able to see and explain to me is regulated by the resonances of their personal guides. When they reach the life selection room with larger theater-type screens to look solely at the future, their perspective about a constant reality changes more to a fluctuating reality. Events on any screen can be moved forward or backward. They can be placed into fast or slow motion or suspended for study. All possibilities of occurrences involving the viewer are then available for study as if they were using a movie projector. One can sense from Case 30 that a past event on our physical world 
has not been indelibly changed for this individual, even though his soul is existing in the eternal now time of the spirit world. Some would call these projections no time for souls, because the past can be blended with future possibilities in the next life from an always present spirit time. Case 30. This case involves a soul called Unther, who has just completed a life of aggressive behavior toward other people. His mentors decided to begin Unther's life review in the library with a scene from his childhood in a play yard. Dr. N. When you return to the spirit world, Unther, is there some highlight of your past life review that you particularly remember and would like to tell me about? Subject. After I have time to visit with my group for a while, my guide, Photanius, escorts me to the library for some private study, while my past life is still very fresh. Dr. N., is this the only time you will come here? Subject. Oh, no. We often come here by ourselves to study. It is also a way to prepare for the next life, too. I will study vocations and avocations for the new life in light of my objectives, to see if they fit. Dr. N., all right, let's move into the library. Please describe everything you see in the order that you see it. Subject. The room is in a large rectangular building. Everything is glowing, transparent white. The walls are lined with big, thick books. Dr. N. Has Photanius brought you here? Subject. Just in the beginning. Now I am with a woman with pure white hair who has met me. Her face is very reassuring. The first thing I notice when I enter are the long rows of tables that stretch off so far into the distance I can't see where they end. I see many people sitting at the long tables looking at the books in front of them. The people studying are not too close to one another. Dr. N. Why is that? Subject. Oh, not facing each other is a matter of courtesy and respect for privacy. Dr. N. Please go on. Subject. My librarian looks so scholarly. We call these people the scholastics. To others, they are archivists. She moves to a nearby wall section and pulls down a book. I know these are my records. In a faraway voice, they contain stories which have been told and those that are untold. Dr. N., with some levity. Do you have your library card? Subject laughs. No cards are required. Just mental attunement. Dr. N., do you have more than one life book assigned to you? Subject, yes, and this is the one I will use today. The books are stacked in order on the shelves. I know where mine are, and they glow when I look at them from a distance. Dr. N., could you go into the stacks yourself? Subject, hmm, no, but I think the older ones do. Dr. N., so at this moment... The librarian has brought you the book you are supposed to study. Subject. Yes. There are large pedestals positioned near the tables. The scholastic opens the page where I am to begin. Note. We are now at the stage when each case takes on a unique quality of personal engagement with the lifebook screens. The conscious mind may or may not be able to translate into human language what the superconscious mind fully sees in the library. Dr. N., then she is getting you started at the pedestal before you take this book to a table by yourself? Subject, yes. I am looking at a page with writing, gold lettering. Dr. N., can you read this writing for me? Subject, no, I can't translate it now, but it identifies that it is my book. Dr. N., can't you make out even one word? Look closely. Subject. Pause. I see the Greek pie symbol. Dr. N. Is this symbolic of a letter in the Greek alphabet, or does it have a mathematical significance for you? Subject. I think it has to do with ratios. How one thing relates to another to me. The writing is a language of motion and emotion. You feel the writing as... Musical vibrations. These symbols represent the causes and effects of a set of proportional relationships between similar and dissimilar circumstances in my lives. 
there is more, but I can't... Stops. Dr. N. Thank you for that. Now tell me, what are you going to do with this book? Subject. Before I carry it down to an empty space at one of the tables, we are going to do an exercise together. The writing symbols tell us where to turn the pages. But I can't tell you how. I don't know how to explain it. Dr. N. Don't worry about that. You are doing a fine job with explanations. Just tell me how the librarian helps you. Subject takes a deep breath. We turn to a page which shows me as a child playing in my schoolyard. Subject now begins to shake. This isn't going to be fun. I'm directed to the time when I was a mean, rotten kid. I am supposed to experience this again. Something they want me to see, a part of my energy, crawls into the page itself. Dr. N., encouraging. All right. Let the scene unfold and tell me all you can. Subject, squirming in his chair. After I crawl into the book, I am totally engaged with the scene in every respect, as if it was being replayed all over again. I'm in grade school. I am a tough kid who picks on the smaller, less aggressive boys, punching them and throwing rocks at everybody when the schoolyard monitors aren't looking. And then... Oh, no! Dr. N. What's happening? Subject. Alarmed. Oh! For God's sake! Now I am the smallest kid in the yard and I'm being punched by me. This is incredible. After a while, I am me again, being pelted by rocks from everyone else. Ow! This really hurts! Dr. N., after quieting the subject down and moving him totally back into the library. Were you in the same time frame as you were as a child, or in a form of altered reality? Subject. Pause. In the same time with altered reality. None of this happened in my early life, but it should have. So the time has been played back to me in a different way. We can relive an event to see if we can get it better. I felt the pain I inflicted upon others by my bullying. Dr. N. Unther, what have you learned from all this? Subject. Long pause. That I was an angry kid driven by fear of my dad. Those are the scenes I am going to do next. I am working on compassion and learning to control my rebellious nature as a soul. Dr. N., what is the significance of your life book and being in this whole library atmosphere? Subject, by studying my book, I am able to recognize mistakes and experience alternatives. Being in this quiet study area, watching all the other souls at the tables doing the same thing, well, it gives me a feeling of camaraderie with them and all we are going through together. Later in our session, we discovered that Unther needed self-discipline and to be more considerate of people. This had been a pattern of conduct over many lives. When I asked if it was possible to study future lives in the library, I received this answer. Yes, we can scan a variety of possibilities here on the timelines, but future events are very indeterminate, and this is not the space where I would make any decisions about what is to come. When I hear statements such as this, I do think of parallel universes where all possibilities and probabilities can be examined. In this scenario, the same event could occur from a slight to radically altered range on the same timeline in multiple spaces, and you would exist in many universes simultaneously. Yet the source of all space-time might well employ alternate realities without parallel universes. In later chapters, I will cite reports of multiple universes around us which are not duplicates of our universe. In the spirit world, souls watching the orchestrated screens seem to move from past to present to future and back simultaneously in the same space. When souls are in the library, I'm told certain event sequences of the future may look shadowy on some lines and almost disappear. On the other hand, 
in the classrooms with larger screens, and especially in the place of life selection, which has huge panel screens, the timelines are bolder. This allows for easier scanning and entry by the soul for future life study. Newer souls must acquire these skills by learning to blend their light waves with the lines on the screens. By concentrating their essence in this way, images come into focus that pertain to them. The timelines on the screens move back and forth, crossing one another as resonating waves of probability and possibility from the now time of the spirit world, where past and future are joined and all is knowable. Cases 29 and 30, as with all my cases, raise the question of what true reality is. Are classrooms and the library with viewing screens of past and future time real? Everything I know about our life after death is based upon the observations of people. The observer communicates to me in trance from their soul mind through the brain. It is the observer who defines the properties of matter and ethereal substances both on earth and in the spirit world. Consider the last case. Unther told me he cannot change his past by a second time around visitation. Yet after death, he returned to the playground of his childhood as an active participant. Once again, he was a boy, playing with other children, with all the sights, sounds, smells, and feelings connected to that event. Some of my clients say these are simulated events. But are they? Unther became part of the scene where he bullied children and then was attacked by them. He could feel the hurt and squirmed in my office chair from pain he had not received in the timeline of this boyhood. Who is to say an altered reality does not simultaneously exist for all events, where both origins and outcomes are interchangeable? The observer soul may work with many realities at a time in the spirit world while studying. All are placed in the soul's path to teach. We question whether our universe is all an illusion. If eternal thoughts of the soul are represented by intelligent light energy that is timeless and formless, it is not restricted by matter in our universe. Thus, if a cosmic consciousness controls what the observer mind sees on earth, the whole concept of cause and effect within given time intervals is a manipulated illusion designed to train us. Even if we believe that everything we think is real is an illusion, life is anything but meaningless. We know if we hold a rock in our hand, it is as real to us as an observer participant in a physical world. We must also keep in mind that a divine intelligence placed us in this environment to learn and grow for a greater good. None of us are here by accident, and neither are those events which affect us in our own reality at this moment in time. Colors of Spirits The Mixture of Colors in Soul Groups When people in trance mentally leave the spaces of energy rejuvenation, orientation, and the library to engage actively with other souls, their contrasting colors become more evident. One aspect of understanding the dynamics of cluster groups is the identification of each soul by color. In Journey of Souls, I described my findings about the energy colors of souls. What I want to do in this section is to try to correct some misconceptions people have regarding color recognition. I have charted the full spectrum range of core colors that identify the level of soul development as seen by subjects in deep hypnosis. More importantly, I have attempted to determine the subtle overlaps and mixes of energy colors within these levels. The basic core colors of white, yellow, and blue generated by souls are the major markers of their growing development. As their light waves take on deeper hues from light to dark during advancement, they become less scattered and have greater focus in their vibrational motion. The transition is slow, and there is much spilling over of color tints as souls develop. Because of this, it is restrictive to lay down hard, definitive rules about color transmission. We see the pure white tones reflected in beginner souls. It is a mark of innocence, and yet this color can be seen throughout the spectrum for all souls. The universal color of white will be explained further in the next case. 
White is often associated with the halo effect. Guides, for instance, may suddenly charge up their normally intense, steady light and surround themselves with a brilliant white halo. Souls returning to the spirit world often tell me that when they notice any soul coming toward them from a distance, they see white light. Souls whose core level of development are in the beginnings of levels 1, 3, and 6, as well as higher level souls, are usually seen with no overlapping of other color tints in the center of their energy mass. I don't see many clients exclusively displaying green or brownish green, the colors of an advanced level 4. This may indicate we need more healers on Earth. I have never had a subject whose energy is totally in the violet-purple range. The color ranges beyond level 5 are ascended masters who do not appear to be incarnating, so the little I know about them comes only from my subject's observations. There are individual variables within each soul cluster group in terms of their basic core color, because they are not all developing at the same rate. However, a soul's energy color may also be affected by another factor, which initially confused me. Besides the primary core colors indicating the stage of overall development, certain souls carry secondary colors. These have been called halo colors because they usually appear to the observer to be outside the core center of a soul's energy mass. Halo colors are undiluted by tints or shades of other colors, as can be the case with central core colors. The only exception here would be if the halo and core color were exactly the same. Reports from my subjects in distinguishing colors are made easier because this overlaying effect is not often seen. The halo colors represent attitudes, beliefs, and even unattained aspirations of the soul. Because they are learned in each life, the halo tints may fluctuate more quickly between lives than the core colors, which display a slower development of character. During a hypnosis session, these secondary halo colors are like flashing self-portraits the moment the observer sees them. Case 31, a highly advanced level 5, will describe this effect. This individual was among a group of clients who helped me decipher the color coding of halos. Case 31 Dr. N. If I were standing in front of you in the spirit world, holding up a full-length mirror, what colors would we see? Subject, you would see a light blue center with goldish white at the edges of my energy, my halo. Dr. N, and when you look at your master teacher, what does his energy look like? Subject, Clandor has a dark blue center working outward to a pale violet crowned with an edge halo of white. Dr. N, what do core energy and Halo energy mean to you? Subject. Clandor radiates the solid state of his learning experience at the center of his energy, while the violet trim is his advancing wisdom from that knowledge. The white transmits that wisdom. Dr. N. Eventually, what do you think Clandor's core center will be, and how will it appear? Subject. The deep violet of divine spirituality radiating from all positions in his energy mass. Dr. N. Can you define the difference between core and halo color variations in soul energy? Subject. The central core represents accomplishment. Dr. N. Such as the light blue in your own energy. This would be your present learning attainment. Subject. Yes. Dr. N. And the edges, the halos, your own goldish white. What can you say about that? Subject. Pause. Ah, my attributes. Well, I have always tried to watch out for other people in my lives. This is who I am. But it is also what I wish to become. Rather, I should say, I want to strive to grow stronger in this aspect. Dr. N. You are not a beginner soul, and yet you display some white in your energy. I'm curious about this bright white halo ring around so many souls with other colors to their energy. 
Subject. The vibrancy of white energy indicates we are able to meld our vibrations easily with all others, souls, for clear communication. Dr. N. I suppose this is why teacher guides often display bright white halos. But how does this white differ from the solid white light of a young soul? Subject. White represents the energy color base for all souls. It is the shading of white with other color mixtures which identify each soul. White is very receptive energy. The newer ones are receiving vibrations in great quantities, while teachers are sending information in large amounts to be absorbed as uncluttered truths. Dr. N. And the beginner soul has had so little experience, you don't visualize any other colors except white? Subject. That's correct. They are undeveloped. Although there is much I don't know about the entire matrix of soul energy color, I have learned that changes in color cores have become much less evident after level four. Over many years of research, I have kept a record of what people have told me about these secondary halo colors. The major colors each have their own range of attributes. Over 90% of my subjects agree on the qualities these colors represent in a soul. I have condensed what I have learned into three of the most commonly reported character traits for each color without regard to shade variations. Black is either tainted, damaged, or defiled negative soul energy, which is generally seen in the soul restoration centers. White. Purity. Clarity. Restlessness. Silver. Ethereal. Trust. Flexibility. Red. Passion. Intensity. Sensitivity. Orange. Exuberant. Impulsive. Openness. Yellow. Protective. Strength. Courage. Green. Healing. Nurturing. Compassion. Brown. Grounded. Tolerant. Industrious. Blue. Knowledge. Forgiveness. Revelation. Purple. Wisdom. Truth. Divinity. In the next chapter, there will be other spiritual references to the significance of colors. This pertains to the colored garments council members wear as perceived by the souls who come before them. In addition, I will show how the designs of certain emblems worn by these elders, some of which are gemstones, convey certain meanings through color. For example, in a particular level two soul group, displaying both core and halo colors, there are twelve members, including my primary subject, a level two male. Under hypnosis, this subject is looking at the eleven souls in his primary group who are members of his current family in this life, plus a best friend. His sister has a core color that is almost solid yellow because she is moving into level three. If she also had a strong protective side to her of yellow, instead of the blue knowledge that she actually has, it would have been harder for my subject to report that fact based on color alone because her halo and core color would have been nearly the same. Besides his sister, the subject's grandparents and son are slightly more advanced than other members, while his father and aunt are slightly less so. The grandfather and mother of this family are healers. Almost half the group have no secondary halo colors. It is not at all unusual for me to encounter groups with none. My subject's bright red halo, over an energy core mass of white and reddish pink, confirmed his fiery intense nature. His son in this life has similar behavioral traits. His wife is more contemplative, with an open, trustful nature. His daughter is non-judgmental and very spiritual. When I asked this subject to give me his thoughts about the red in his energy, here is what he had to say. Because of my intense nature, I have a problem with anger in my lives. I often choose bodies which are high-strung emotionally, because they match my character. I don't like passive bodies. My guide doesn't mind these choices because she says I will learn to control myself by relaxing the brain of these bodies. This sort of control is hard 
because of my own impulsive reactions and passion in difficult situations. It has taken many centuries of past lives, but I am getting better at self-discipline. In the past, I have too easily entered into aggression, and now this is slowly changing. I also have the help of my soulmate, current wife. It sometimes happens that I will encounter souls who are anomalies in the way their development progresses. This becomes evident to me when clients describe souls in their groups with core colors that seem to be out of place. A prime example is the white lights of younger souls. The following case involves a group of level 3 to 4 souls. I had just finished reviewing all the yellow blue members of this group when this subject disclosed there was a soul who was mostly white standing next to her. Case 32 Dr. N. What is a white light doing in your group of advanced souls? Subject Levani is in training with us because of her gifts. It was decided that although she is young, without much experience, she should not be held back. Dr. N. Isn't Levani rather lost in your group? How can she keep up? Subject She is being tested right now, and to be honest, Levani is a little overwhelmed. Dr. N. Why was she assigned to your group? Subject Our group is rather unusual because we have a high tolerance for working with inexperienced souls. Most groups of our type are so busy they would probably ignore her. I'm not saying they would be unkind, but after all she is still a child and looks to us like a child with her small wispy energy patterns. Dr. N. I suppose most advanced groups would not want this responsibility? Subject. Quite right. Developing groups are very absorbed with their own work. To a child, they can appear almost disdainful. Dr. N. Then explain to me why Lavani's guide permitted her to come over here with your people. Subject. Lavani has great talent. We are a group of quick learners, and our lives have been immensely difficult and fast-paced. My subject has only spent 1,600 years on Earth. Despite our rapid advancement, we have a reputation for being very modest, some say overly so. We are studying to be teachers of children, and Lavani is good for us, too. Dr. N. I am very puzzled by this. Has Lavani been cut off from association with her own group at this early stage of her existence? Subject. Oh, my, no! Where did you get that idea? She is with her own group most of the time. Laughs. And they do not know about her adventures with us. It is better that way. Dr. N. Why? Subject. Oh, they might tease her and ask too many questions. She is very attached to them, and we want Lavani to have a normal association with her own friends, even though we know she will be moving out of her group early because of her gifts. They are not yet motivated by the same desire. Dr. N. Well, if souls are telepathic and know everything about each other, I don't see how Lavani could hide all this from her friends. Subject. It is true the whites are not able to set up blocks as we do about certain private things. Lavani has been taught to do this. I told you she had potential. Pause, and then adds. Of course, Everyone respects the private thoughts of others. It is not uncommon to find that when souls such as Case 32 do incarnate, the younger souls they are working with ask to be their children in life. Lavani is the child of this subject today. The reverse may also be true, where it is the child who is the advanced soul, living with a parent having the younger soul. There are instances when I hear about a soul whose color is described as being in retrograde. Most of us in our existence have slipped backward after some lives, but when our color regresses to any great extent, it is due to a condition that is both serious and prolonged. Here is a statement from one client which carries a poignant message for all of us. It's a shame about Clarus. His green used to be so brilliant. He was a great healer who became corrupted by power. For Clarus, things were almost too easy. He was so talented. His downhill slide happened over a number of lives, 
involving many abuses. He loved the veneration and adulation so much, his vanity became a disguise from himself. Claris began losing his gifts, and we noticed his color fading and growing more muted. Finally, Claris became so ineffective, he was sent down for retraining. We all expect he will eventually come back. Colors of Visitors in Groups Once in a while, I hear that a color presentation from one or two souls in a group appears to be out of place with everybody else. I have learned this may signify temporary visits by a highly specialized guest or a soul from a nearby group. Once in a while, I hear about a visitation by an interdimensional traveler whose experience far exceeds that of the group. I have a condensed quote from an interesting report about such visitors. When we look at advanced beings who come to visit our group through other dimensions that are not familiar to us, it is like they have passed through a screen, which we call the lens of light, to reach us. They come once in a while at the invitation of our guide, Joshua, because they are friends of his. We see these souls as having the silver of flowing water as they pass in front of us. To us, the silver stream is a cloak of passage, the purity of a translucent interdimensional intelligence. They are elastic beings with the ability to pass through many physical and mental spheres and function well. They come to help push away the darkness of our ignorance. But these beautiful beings never stay long. I should add that these colorful characters who briefly appear in soul groups have a profound effect. In the previous case, when I asked my client to give a specific example of an insight gained from the teachings by these silvery beings, I was told, They widen our vision to see more probabilities in making choices by becoming astute at reading people. This skill develops critical thinking and allows for informed decisions based upon larger truths. Human versus Soul Color Auras There is another misconception about color I have encountered since Journey of Souls was published. Many people seek to find comparisons between my color classifications with souls and that of human auras. I believe these assumptions can lead to the wrong conclusions. Color and energy vibrations are closely linked in souls and are reflective of the non-material environment of the spirit world. Thus, in a physical environment, the frequency of the same soul energy is altered. The human body changes the color of these energy patterns further. When healers identify color auras around human beings, these colors are largely reflections of physical manifestations. Besides thoughts from a human brain, which are influenced by our emotional makeup, central nervous system, and chemical balances. All the vital organs of the body are involved in human auras. Even muscles and skin play a part in creating the physical energy around us. Certainly, there are correlations between the soul mind and our bodies, but physical and mental health are the prime determinants in human auras. I should state that I do not see human auras. All my information about them comes from specialists in this field and from my subjects. I am told that as we go through life, our temporary body fluctuates rapidly, and this affects the external color arrangements of our energy. It may take many centuries for soul colors to change. Eastern philosophy holds, and I agree, that we have a spirit body which exists in conjunction with the physical, and that this etheric body has its own energy outline. True healing must take into account both the physical and subtle body. When we meditate or practice yoga, we work to unblock our emotional and spiritual energy through various parts of the body. On occasion, when I am talking to a subject in trance, about the distribution of light energy from other souls in their group, I will be told about stronger energy patterns emanating from particular areas of what seems to be a human shape. Just as we may bring imprints from a former life into our current life, we can also take body imprints into the spirit world as silhouetted energy reminders of our physical incarnations. For a while, 
during my questioning in the next case, I wondered if this subject was letting her conscious memory about chakras seep into her unconscious explanations. Chakras are supposed to be vortex power sources that emanate from within us outward at seven major points on the human body. This subject felt that chakras were a spiritual expression of individuality through physical manifestations. Case 33 Dr. N. You have said that Roy is one of the members of your family in this life who is in your soul group. When you look at Roy's focal point of energy, what do you see? Subject I see a concentration of pinkish yellow coming from the middle of his body form, the place where the solar plexus would be. Dr. N. What body form? Why is Roy presenting a physical body to your group? Subject We show the features of the body we have occupied that pleased us in life. Dr. N. Well, what does an energy concentration from the stomach area mean to you? Subject Roy's strongest point of personal power in his lives is his gut, regardless of his body. He has nerves of steel. Laughs. <laughs> he has other appetites in this area, too. Dr. N. If Roy's metabolic energy rate shows that attribute, can you pinpoint a distribution of extra light energy coming from certain places of the body in other members of your group? Subject. Yes. Larry has his greatest development from his head. He has been a creative thinker in many lives. Dr. N. Anyone else? Subject. Yes, Natalie. Her power essence is developing faster from the heart area because of her compassion. Dr. N. How about yourself? Subject. Mine comes from the throat because of my communication skills through speech in some lives and singing in my current life. Dr. N. Do these energy points have anything to do with the projection of human color auras? Subject. As far as color, not generally. As far as strengths in energy concentration, yes. Spiritual Meditation Using Color The healing properties of multicolored lights for energy rebalancing in a recovery area were quoted in the last chapter from a soul called Banyan. People who have read my work about the spirit world have asked if this sort of information about color can be used for physical healing. Spiritual meditation as a means of getting in touch with our inner self is of great benefit in healing the body. There are many good self-help books on the market which explain the various forms of meditation. Since color transmission is the expression of a soul's energy and that of our guides, perhaps I ought to cite one example of meditation using color. The six-step meditative exercise I have chosen comes from a mixture of my own suggested visualizations and those of a courageous 54-year-old woman I worked with whose weight dropped to 69 pounds during her fight with ovarian cancer. She is now in remission after chemotherapy, and the speed of her recovery baffled doctors. A number of my clients generate a sense of spiritual empowerment by the use of meditation with colors. Those who have severe physical health problems tell me the best results come from meditating once a day for 30 minutes or twice a day for 15 to 20 minutes. Please know I do not offer these steps of meditation as a cure for physical ailments. The power of each person's mind and their ability to concentrate is different, just as is the nature of their illness. Nevertheless, I do feel one's immune system can be boosted by connecting with our higher self. 1. Begin by calming your mind. Forgive people for all the real and imagined wrongs that have hurt you. Spend five minutes cleansing where you visualize all negative thought energy, including fears about your illness, as a black color. Think of a vacuum cleaner moving from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, sucking up and pushing out of your body all the darkness from the pain and hurt of your disease. 2. Now, create a light blue halo above your head that represents your spirit guide, 
whom you call upon for help while sending out loving thoughts. Then spend another five minutes concentrating on your breathing while counting the breaths. Measure your breaths carefully while thinking comfort in and tightness out. You want to harmonize your breathing with the rhythm of the body. 3. At this point, start to think of your own higher consciousness as an expanding white gold balloon to help protect your body. Say in your mind, I want that part of me which is immortal to defend the mortal. Now begin your deepest concentration. You will pull the purity of white light from the balloon and send it as a power beam into your body organs. Since your white blood cells represent the strength of your immune system, visualize them as bubbles and move them around your body. Think of the white bubbles as attacking the black cancer cells and dissolving them with the power of light over darkness. 4. If you are receiving chemotherapy, support this treatment by sending out a lavender color as you would see from an infrared heat lamp to all parts of your body. This is the divine color of wisdom and spiritual power. 5. Now, send out the color green for healing these damaged cells from the effects of the cancer. You might blend this color with the blue of your spiritual guide intermittently during the most difficult periods. Pick your own shade and think of the green as a flowing liquid, mending your insides. 6. Your last step is to once again create the blue halo of light around your head to sustain mental strength and courage over a weakened body. Expand it around the external parts of your body as a shield. Feel the healing power of this light of love both inside and outside. Think of yourself in a state of suspension and close by repeating a mantra such as Heal, Heal, Heal. Meditation as a daily discipline is hard work which pays big dividends. There is no right way to meditate. Each person must find a program which links their intellectual and emotional systems in a framework that suits their needs. Deep meditation brings us into a divine consciousness and a temporary release of the soul from personality. With this liberation, one is able to transcend into a different, non-dimensional reality where everything in the focused mind is unified into a single whole. The woman with ovarian cancer was able to help her doctors by bringing total mental concentration to bear on healing her body. When the mind is in a pure centered state, we can find who we really are, that essence we may have lost somewhere along the road of life. Daily meditation is also beneficial as a means of connecting with the presence of loving spirits. Forms of Energy Color Besides the effects of color, Another external means of investigating souls in groups is to compare their shapes. These energy forms would include symmetry versus irregularity of shape, brightness or dimness of light configurations, and the qualities of motion, all of which provide spiritual signatures of the group members. When observing other souls, many people in a trance state are aware of a soul's vibrational resonance. After I review the nuances of color tone with a client, Together we will study the pulsation and vibrational rates of motion of their soul companions. In discussing the energy form of any soul, my first question is, how much energy was left behind in the spirit world before the current incarnation? This question has much to do with the activity or passivity of the soul and relates to brightness and dimness of energy. Despite the amounts of energy, however, all manner of energy generation is identified by character, capacity, and mood of the soul. These are variables that can change after a series of lives. During my pre-hypnosis intake interview with a new client, I inquire about the cast of characters in their current life. I make notes about all their relatives, friends, and past loves as well. This is because I will have a front row seat in the play that is about to unfold from their minds, and I want a theater program. 
My client will be the leading actor in this drama, with others in supporting roles. In the case excerpt which follows, it can be seen how quickly information is gained through questions involving both color and form about a supporting cast member within a client's soul group. During my intake interview with Leslie, my client, I learned of her sister-in-law named Rowena, who was a real thorn in her side. Leslie, whose spiritual name is Susius, described herself as someone who seeks security in her lives and tends to be around peaceful people. In her current life, this subject remarked, Rowena seems to enjoy confronting me and challenging all my convictions. What follows is the opening scene of Leslie's mental picture of her spirit group. Case 34 Subject Very upset Oh, I don't believe it. Rowena is here. Or rather, it's Shoth. That's Rowena. Dr. N. What's wrong with seeing the soul of Rowena in your spirit group? Subject Frowning with a tightening of the mouth. Well, Shoth is one of the disruptive ones. Dr. N. Disruptive in what way? Subject. Oh, compared to those of us who have smooth, unruffled energy vibrations. Dr. N. Susius, as you observe your sister-in-law, how is she different in terms of color and shape? Subject. Still verifying the recognition of Rowena. There she is, all right. Her orange energy is pulsating rapidly, the usual sharp, jagged edges. That's Shath. Sparks, that's what we call her. Dr. N. Does the form she presents to you indicate she is as antagonistic to you here in this spiritual setting as in your current life? Subject. Leslie is now adjusting to Rowena's presence, and her voice softens. No. Actually, she draws us out. She is good for our group. I can see that. Dr. N. I want to consider how her projections are different from your own energy and color and form. What can you tell me about yourself in the spirit world? Subject. Mine is soft white with rose variations. I am called bells by my friends because they see my energy as fluid droplets of steady rainwater which give off an echo of faint tinkling bells. Shath has a sharp clarity to her energy, and I see tints of gold. Her energy is bright and very overpowering. Dr. N. And what does all this mean to you and your group? Subject. We just can't be complacent around Sparks. She is so restless, a swirl of constant motion. There are always questions from her and challenges about our performance. She enjoys taking part in our lives, which shake our complacency. Dr. N. Do you think she is less abrasive in the spirit world than in her current body as Rowena? Subject. Laughs. You bet. She chose a high-strung body with a short fuse which amplifies everything. This time, current life, she came as my husband's sister. Shath can be so annoying. But now that I see who she really is, I know her motives come from love and wanting the best we have to give. Laughs again. We help her to slow down, too, because she has a tendency to jump into fires without looking. Dr. N. Is there anyone in your inner circle of friends whose energy is similar to Shath, to Rowena? Subject grins. Yes, that would be my best friend Megan's husband, Roger. His name here is Sierra. Dr. N. How does his energy appear to you? Subject. He sends out geometric, angular patterns that zigzag back and forth. They are sharp waves like his tongue, and from a distance his energy reverberates like crashing cymbals in an orchestra. Sierra is a daring, intrepid soul. Dr. N. Based on what you have been telling me about energy shapes, could Shath and Sierra, Rowena and Roger, have a compatible matchup in life? Subject bursts out laughing. You must be joking. They would kill each other. No, Rowena's husband is Sen, my brother Bill, a peaceful soul. Dr. N. 
Please describe his energy. Subject. He has a grounded energy which is greenish-brown. You know Vines is around when you hear a gentle swishing. Dr. N. Vines. I don't understand what that means. Subject. In our group, when you get a nickname, it sticks. Sen has vibrational waves which look like a vine, with the patterns forming braided strands, you know, as with long hair. Dr. N. Does this energy pattern identify Sen, your brother Bill, in some way? Subject. Sure. Complex but constant. Very dependable. It reflects his ability to weave a variety of elements together in lovely harmony. Vines and sparks blend beautifully, because Rowena never lets Bill get too complacent, and he gives her an anchor in life. Dr. N. Before I go on, I have noticed that the spirit names you have given for your soul group all start with the letter S. Does that mean anything? I'm not sure I am even spelling them correctly. Subject. Don't worry about that. It is the sound which gives off the intonations of their energy motion. That reflects who my friends really are. Dr. N. Sound. So, besides the color and form of your group's energy, their waves have sound linked to each of them as we might hear on Earth? Subject. Well, sort of. With us, it's energy resonance we identify with Earth although you could not hear these vibrations with a human ear. Dr. N. Could we go back to your best friend, Megan? You mentioned her, but I don't know her vibrational pattern color. Subject, with a warm smile. Her wispy, pale yellow energy is like flickering sunlight on a field of grain, smooth, even, and delicate. Dr. N. And her character as a soul? Subject, Absolute, unconditional compassion and love. Before going further with the issue of sound and the similarity of some spiritual names, I should explain the karmic link between my client Leslie and her best friend in this life, Megan. To me, it is an emotionally compelling story. During my intake with Case 34, Leslie explained to me that she was a professional singer and that occasionally her throat and larynx were especially tender. I regarded this as simply an occupational hazard, and thought no more about it until we reached the death scene in her past life. It was then necessary to deprogram a former body imprint directly related to Leslie's throat. In their past life, Megan was Leslie's younger sister. As a young girl, Megan had been forced by her father to marry a wealthy, brutal older man called Hogar, who beat and sexually abused her. After a short while, Leslie helped Megan escape from Hogar in order to run away with a young man who loved her, Roger. An enraged Hogar found Leslie that night and dragged her to a secluded place where he raped and beat her for hours to learn the whereabouts of her sister. Leslie told Hogar nothing until he began to strangle her for information. She then bought her sister more time to get away safely by giving Hogar the wrong directions. Hogar strangled Leslie to death and rushed away, but he never found Megan again. Later in our session, Leslie had this to say. Singing in this life is an expression of love because my voice was silenced over love in the last life. Sounds and Spiritual Names We have seen how color, form, movement, and sound are individual markers of souls in their groups. These four elements appear to be interrelated, although light energy, vibrational shapes, and their wave movement, as well as the resonance of sound, are not uniform among soul group members. However, there are resemblances with these elements between certain souls, and sound can be the one most obvious to the spiritual regressionist. There is a language to sound in the spirit world that goes beyond the systemization of spoken language. I am told laughing, humming, chanting, and singing exist, as do the sounds of wind and rain, but they are indescribable. 
Some subjects pronounced the names of souls within their group as if they were balancing musical chords in order to harmonize them with each other. Case 34 is an example of how the pronunciation of spiritual names within an inner circle of friends has an affinity of sound with the letter S. In Case 28, two spiritual teachers were called Bion and Relon. There seems to be rhythmic interplay between certain soul energies in a cluster group manifested in this way. Some hypnosis subjects have difficulty in producing spiritual names. These subjects say the names of souls in their minds consist of a vibrational resonance which is impossible to translate. It gets more complicated. One client stated, In my experience, our real soul names are something similar to emotions, but they are not the emotions of humans, so I can't reproduce our names by any sound. There is also vocal symbolism connected to names, which may have hidden meanings that a client is unable to decipher in human form. Nevertheless, for many clients who are struggling to remember a spiritual name, the use of phonics and a cadence of sound may serve them well. A subject might use vowel sounds to characterize members of their cluster group. I had a client who named three souls in his group as Ki, Lo, and Su. It is not at all uncommon for me to have cases, such as the last one, where group names emphasize one letter of the alphabet. For some reason, many spiritual guides have an A ending to their names. I do have subjects in trance who find it easier to spell spiritual names for me rather than try to pronounce them. Yet these same clients will state that the spelling doesn't mean as much to them as the sound. My probes of spiritual names can also elicit shortened versions of the actual name. One client said, In my spirit group, the nickname for our guide is Ned. Not satisfied with this, I persisted and eventually had this guide's full name down on paper. The result was, Nidaz Barian. I got the message. During the rest of this session, we stayed with Ned. Privacy is also a factor when I have a client who feels that giving me the name of the spirit guide would somehow compromise that relationship. I must respect their concerns and be patient. As the session progresses, this uneasiness might wear off. For instance, a client told me her guide was called Mary. Then she added, Mary is letting me call her by that name in front of you. I accepted this and we continued on for a while, when abruptly the guide's name became Mazukia. There are moments in a regression when it is not appropriate to push too hard for information. Finally, I should report that our own soul names can change a little as we evolve. I had one highly advanced subject tell me her name as a young soul was Vina, which had now changed to Kavina. I asked why, and Kavina replied that she was now a disciple of a senior guide called Karafina. When I inquired as to the significance of the similar phrasing of these names in the spirit world, I was told it was none of my concern. There are clients who have no reticence in closing down questions in a hurry if they feel I have stepped over the line of privacy. Soul Study Groups In my first book, I devoted whole chapters to examining beginner, intermediate, and advanced groups of souls and their guides. I also gave case examples of group energy training, where souls learn to create and shape physical matter, such as rocks, soil, plants, and lower life forms. It is not my intention to repeat myself on these topics, except when, by doing so, I can further the listener's knowledge of other aspects of life in soul collectives. In this section, I am going to examine the relationships between learners within soul study groups as opposed to the structural aspects of schoolhouses and classrooms reviewed earlier in this chapter. Spiritual learning centers are not necessarily visualized by my clients as having a classroom or library atmosphere. Quite often, these centers are described as simply the space of our home. Even so, the pictures of spiritual learning environments can change rapidly in the minds of clients discussing their instruction periods. When my research into our Life Between Lives was published, 
Some people were critical of my analogies of human schoolhouses and classrooms as spiritual models for the instruction of souls. One Colorado couple wrote me to say, We find your references to schools in the afterlife to be distasteful, and this is probably due to your own bias as a former educator. Others have told me that for them, schools were a long series of bad experiences with bureaucracy, authoritarianism, and personal humiliation at the hands of other students. They did not want to see anything resembling human classrooms on the other side. I know there are listeners who have had bitter memories of the time they spent in school. Sadly, schools on Earth, as with other institutions, contain shortcomings wrought by human beings. Teachers and students can be guilty of arrogance, petty tyranny, and indifference to the sensitivities of others. Wherever learning takes place, there is scrutiny. Nevertheless, many of us remember having caring teachers who gave us essential information while we formed lifelong friendships with fellow students as well. The functional aspects of acquiring spiritual knowledge are translated by the human mind into learning centers, and I am sure our guides have a hand in creating visualizations of earthly edifices for souls who come to our planet. People in hypnosis talk about the similarities of form and structure to Earth in some respects, but there are great differences in other aspects of their reports. My clients tell me about the overwhelming kindness, benevolence, and infinite patience of everyone in ethereal study areas. Even the analysis of each soul's performance by fellow students is conducted with total love, respect, and a mutual commitment to make things better in the next incarnation. Soul groups appreciate individualism. It is expected that you will stand out and make contributions. There are forceful souls and quiet souls, but no one dominates, just as no one is obtrusive. Individualism is appreciated because each soul is unique, with strengths and weaknesses that complement others in the group. We are assigned to certain soul groups for our differences as well as similarities. These differences in character are honored because souls who share their lives bring a rich personal wisdom to every lifetime experience. Souls love to tease and use humor in their groups, but always they show respect for one another, even with those who have been in bodies that have hurt them in life. More than forgiveness, souls exercise tolerance. They know that most negative personality traits connected to the ego of the body of the person who brought them sadness and heartache were buried when that body died. At the top of the discarded list of negative emotions are anger and fear. Souls volunteer both to teach and learn certain lessons, and karmic plans may not always work out in the way they were intended, given the variables of earthly environments. I remember after one of my lectures, a psychiatrist raised his hand and said, Your discussion about soul groups reminds me of tribalism. I responded that soul groups do appear to be tribal in their intense loyalty and mutual support for each other in a spiritual community. However, soul groups are not tribal in their relationships toward other groups. Earth societies have a nasty habit of mistrusting one another at best and demonstrating bitterness and cruelty at worst. Societies in the spirit world are inclined to be rigorous, moderate, or compliant in their interpersonal relationships, but I see no evidence of discrimination or alienation, either within or between soul groups. Unlike human beings, all spiritual beings are bonded together. At the same time, souls strictly observe the sanctity of other groups. When I was a part-time evening college teacher, I found that some of my students, including the adults in my classes, would confuse facts with their own value patterns. While struggling with conceptual problems, there were times when they argued from a false premise and even contradicted themselves. This, after all, is the nature of students. Eventually, they learned to extrapolate and synthesize ideas more effectively. From this background, my introduction to instruction in the spirit world gave me perspective. During the early years of my hypnosis research, I was astounded by the total lack of self-deception in spiritual classrooms. 
I saw that teacher guides seemed to be present everywhere, although not always in a manifested form. Our teachers come and go in spiritual study sessions, but never interfere with self-discovery. Although souls themselves are not yet omniscient by having infinite knowledge of all things, they have no doubts about karmic lessons and the parts they played in past life events. An axiom of the spirit world is that souls are always hardest on themselves in terms of performance. Within soul study groups, there is a wondrous clarity of rational thought. Self-delusion does not exist, but I must say that the motivation to work hard in every life is not uniform among all souls. I have had clients tell me, I'm going to skate for a while. This can mean slowing down their rate of incarnations, picking easy incarnations, or both. Although the soul's teachers and counsel may not be happy with this decision, it is respected. Even within the spirit world, some students choose not to give their best at all times. I believe they are a distinct minority of earthbound souls. To the Greeks, the word persona was synonymous with mask. This is an appropriate term for the way in which the soul utilizes a host body for any life. When we reincarnate into a new body, the soul's character is united with the temperament of its host to form one persona. The body is the outward manifestation of the soul, but it is not the total embodiment of our soul self. Souls who come to earth think of themselves as becoming masked actors on a world stage. In Shakespeare's Macbeth, the king prepares for death by telling us, Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. In some ways, this famous line describes how souls feel about their lives on earth, the difference being that, once the play has begun, most of us don't know we are in a play until it's over, due to a variety of amnesiac blocks. Thus, the analogy of a play, like that of a schoolroom, befits what my clients see in deep hypnotic trance states. I have had clients tell me that when they return to their soul groups, after a particularly hard life, there is clapping and shouts of bravo from their friends. The applause is for a job well done at the end of the last act of the play of life. One subject said, In my group, the major cast members of our last play in life will go off in a corner to study the individual scenes we played after it has ended and before rehearsals begin for the next play to come. I often hear my subjects laugh about being offered a certain part in the next play, which is their current life, and the debates that took place before final casting decisions were made as to who would play what part in the future. Our guides become stage directors who go over past life scenes with us, frame by frame, of both good and bad times. Errors in judgment are presented in small bites. All possible outcomes are studied and compared by designing new scripts for these scenes with different sets of choices that could have been made in each circumstance. Behavioral patterns are minutely dissected with each player, followed by a review of all the roles in the script. Souls might then decide to switch roles with each other and replay key scenes all over again to test the results with a different actor from their group or by someone recruited from a nearby group. I encourage my subjects to tell me about these role substitutions. Souls gain perspective from being witnesses to their own past performance through other actors. Recreations of past life alternatives present a psychodrama I find useful as a therapeutic tool in a soul's current life. These stage analogies by soul groups do not trivialize what they go through on earth as simple impersonations. They offer the soul an objective means of comprehension and foster a desire to improve. The system is ingenious. Souls never seem to get bored in these educational exercises, which invite creativity, originality, and a desire to triumph over adversity by acquiring wisdom from human relationships. Always, they want to do better next time. Whatever the format... Spaces of learning provide a fascinating chessboard for souls when they go over all the possible moves for the best solutions after the game is over. Indeed, 
Some of my subjects call the whole process of reincarnation the game. The outcome of one's performance in the play may range from very satisfactory to acceptable to unsatisfactory. I realize some listeners might conclude this sounds suspiciously like educational grading on Earth, but this is not an idea of my origination. I'm told that in soul groups, the evaluation of performance by our peers is not threatening. Rather, it encourages motivation. Most souls appear to me to be driven by a desire to review the last game of life they have played in order to better preview the next one. Like champion athletes, they want to try and improve with each performance. Ultimately, they know at a certain level of development and proficiency, this aspect of the game will end with the closing of the play and their physical incarnations. This is the goal of souls who come to Earth. As I stated at the beginning of this section, instruction in learning centers is not limited to reviewing past lives. Besides all the other activities, energy manipulation is a major part of training. The acquiring of these skills takes many forms in classroom work. I have said before that humor is a hallmark of the spirit world. The student in the next case gives us a sense of the whimsical when she explains how one of her creation classes got a little out of hand. Case 35. Dr. N. You have explained about how your group has gathered into an enclosure resembling a school classroom, but I'm not sure what is going on here. Subject. We have gathered for practice and creation training with our energy. My guide, Trinity, is standing at a chalkboard working on a drawing for us to study. Dr. N. And what are you doing now? Subject. Sitting at my desk with the others, watching Trinity. Dr. N. Give me a picture of this. Are you lined up in a row with the others at a long desk, or what? Subject. No, we have our individual desks. They have tops which open up. Dr. N. Where are you sitting in relation to your friends? Subject. I am off to the left. Kyle, the mischievous one, my subject's brother in her current life, is next to me. Jack, subject's current husband, is just in back of me. Dr. N. What is the mood in this room right now? Subject. Laid back, very relaxed, because this assignment is so easy it's almost boring, watching Trinity drawing. Dr. N. Oh, really? What is Trinity drawing? Subject. He is drawing... Ah, how to make a mouse quickly, from different energy parts. Dr. N. Are you going to break up into groups to combine your energy with others for this assignment? Subject, with a wave of her hand. Oh, no, we are way past that. We will be tested individually. Dr. N. Please explain the test. Subject. We are to rapidly visualize a mouse in our minds, as to the necessary energy parts to create a whole mouse. There is an order of progression with how energy should be arranged in any creation. Dr. N. So the test is the proper steps in creating a mouse. Subject. Hmm, yes. But actually this is a test of speed. The secret of efficiency in creation training is rapid conceptualization knowing which part of the animal to start with first. Then you tackle the amount of energy to be applied. Dr. N. This sounds difficult. Subject, with a big grin. It's easy. Trinity should have picked a more complex creature. Dr. N. Doggedly. Well, it seems to me that Trinity knows what he is doing. I don't see... Cuts me off with gales of laughter, and I ask what is going on. Subject. Kyle has just winked at me and opened his desktop, and I see a white mouse scurrying out. Dr. N. Meaning he is getting ahead of the assignment? Subject. Yes, and showing off. Dr. N. Is Trinity aware of all this? Subject. Still laughing. Of course, he misses nothing. He just stops and says, All right, let's all do this quickly if you are so ready to begin. Dr. N. Then what happens? Subject. There are mice running all over the room. Giggles. 
<laughs> I put larger than normal ears on mine, just for fun to liven things up even more. I will close this section with a more serious case example of group energy usage. It represents a type of lesson I have not reported on before. Case 36 involves an inner circle of three companions who wish to help a fourth member who has just incarnated on Earth. Unlike the higher level of soul capability in the previous case, these souls are part of a learning group that has recently entered Level 2. Case 36 Dr. N As your mind visualizes all the meaningful activities going on in your study group, please take me to a significant exercise and explain what you are doing. Subject, long pause. Oh, you aren't that. Well, my two friends and I are doing our best to help Clade with positive energy after he entered the body of a baby. We want this to work because soon we are all going to follow him into life. Dr. N., let's go slowly here. What exactly are the three of you doing at this moment? Subject takes a deep breath. We are sitting together in a circle. Our teacher is in back of us directing things. We are sending a united beam of energy down into the mind of Clade's child. He has just arrived and, well, mm, I don't want to violate confidences, but he is not having an easy time. Dr. N., I see. Well, perhaps talking about it might clarify things. Don't you think it would be all right to discuss what you are doing a little further? Subject. I... I guess so. I, I don't see the harm. Dr. N. Gently. Tell me what month after conception did Clade join the baby? Subject. In the fourth month. Pauses and then adds. But we started to help Clade in his sixth month. It is such hard work to continue to the ninth month. Dr. N. I can understand that. The necessary concentration and all. Pause. Tell me why Clade needs help from the three of you. Subject. We are trying to send him encouraging energy shaped in such a way to assist Clade in making a better adjustment to the temperament of this child. When you join with a baby, it should be like placing your hand into a glove which is the exact size for you and the child. Cladet's glove is not fitting well this time. Dr. N. Does this knowledge come as a surprise to you and your teacher? Subject. Ah, not really. You see, Cladet is a quiet soul, peaceful, and this baby has a restless, aggressive mind, and... The mesh is difficult for Clade, even though he knew what to expect. Dr. N. Are you saying he wanted a certain kind of challenge before this baby was chosen? Subject. Yes. He knew he needed to learn to cope with this sort of body, because he has had trouble before with not being able to control aggression. Dr. N. Is this child going to be a hostile person? Perhaps one with few inhibitions, emotional conflicts, and so forth? Subject. Laughs. You got it. That's my older brother. Dr. N. In your current life, you mean? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. What roles will the other two souls you are working with at the moment assume in Clade's life, besides yourself? Subject. Zanine is his wife and Mont's his best friend. Dr. N. Sounds like a good support team. Can you explain a bit more why Clade needs this sort of type A personality in a body? Subject. Well, Clade is very thoughtful. He ponders a lot and is tentative. He doesn't jump into situations. It was felt this body would help him expand his capabilities and assist the child, too. Dr. N. Was Clidet's last life a problem? Subject. Shrugs. Problems. Problems. The same sort of body. He was caught up in obsessions and addictions. Little control. He abused Zanine, too. Dr. N. 
Then why? Subject breaking in. We really studied that last life, reviewing everything over and over. Claude wanted another chance in the same kind of body. He asked Zanine if she would be his wife again, and she agreed. Subject begins laughing. Dr. N. What amuses you? Subject. Only this time I'm going along as his younger brother to help keep him in line with a very strong body. Dr. N. Let's finish with your current energy beam exercise. Explain how you and your two companions use your energy in helping Clade. Subject. Long pause. The alignments of Clade's energy and that of the baby are scattered. Dr. N. The baby has scattered emotional energy, and Clade is having trouble melding with that? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. Does this involve the patterns of electrical impulses from the brain, or what? Subject. Pause. Yes, the thought processes. From nerve endings, stops and then continues. We are trying to help Clide in tracking this. Dr. N. Is the baby resisting Clide as an intruder? Subject. Ah, no, I don't think so. Laughs. But Clide thinks he got another primitive brain in some respects. Dr. N. Where in the baby's body is your combined energy beam going? Subject. We are being directed to work up from the base of the skull, starting in the back of the neck. Dr. N. I bring client into the past tense. Were you successful in this exercise? Subject. I think we did help Clade especially in the beginning. Laughs again. But my brother is still a headstrong person in this life. Additional illustrations of soul group interaction will be cited in later chapters. In Chapter 9, under the section describing the body-soul partnership, I will go into more detail about the physiological aspects of our struggle with the primitive side of the human mind mentioned in the last case. The next chapter is devoted to the higher spiritual assistance we receive as an adjunct to soul study groups. The psychological ramifications of future life choices actually start with our first orientation upon returning to the spirit world. Ideas involving past performance and future expectations are brought into sharper focus with a soul's first council meeting.